Chapters 1 and 2 of Napoleon and Josephine, The Rise of the Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Napoleon and Josephine, The Rise of the Empire by Walter Gere. Recorded by Céline Major. 1. 1763 to 1779. Early Years of Josephine on the outer rim of the caribbean sea in the middle of the chain of the lesser antilles between the british possessions of dominica and st lucia lies martinique the birthplace of josephine the island is only forty miles long by twenty wide and its area of less than four hundred square miles makes it about a third the size of the smallest state in the union a cluster of volcanic mountains in the north a similar group in the south and a line of lower heights between them form the backbone of the island the deep ravines and precipitous escarpments culminating on the north in the massif of montpellier are reduced in appearance to gentle undulations by the drapery of the forests the few miles of country between the watershed and the sea are traversed by numerous streams of which nearly fourscore are of considerable size and in the rainy season become raging torrents at the southerly end a lateral range branching from the backbone of the island forms a blunt peninsula bounding on the south the beautiful low-shored bay of fort de france on which is located the city of the same name formerly known as fort royal the capital of the island on this peninsula directly across the bay from the capital is the little hamlet of trois Îles, where josephine was born by some authorities martinique is said to have been discovered by columbus in fourteen ninety three the year of his second voyage but it was not until sixteen thirty five that possession was taken by the french compagnie des îles d'amerique during the next hundred years martinique had a full share of wars it experienced several revolutions of different kinds and was attacked on numerous occasions by the british and the dutch but always without success it was finally captured however by rodney in seventeen sixty two and was only returned to france by the treaty of paris in the following year a few days before the birth of josephine like napoleon therefore she had a narrow escape from not being born under the french flag in seventeen twenty six there landed in martinique a noble of blois named gaspard joseph taché de la pagerie who like many others came to seek his fortune he belonged to an old family which could trace its origin back at least to the middle of the fifteenth century his great-grandfather had established himself in blois in sixteen fifty after having sold his seigneurie of la pagerie of which however his descendants continued to use the name his grandfather retired with the grade of captain of cavalry exhausted his last resources in sixteen seventy four in recruiting a squadron of the noblesse of blois he left only one son gaspard who in spite of his good marriages did not succeed in restoring the family fortunes gaspard left two sons of whom the younger rose to considerable prominence in the church the elder named gaspard joseph after his grandfather was a mauvais sujet to escape a life of genteel poverty at home he decided to try his fortunes in the new world little is known of the early years of his life in martinique but four years after his arrival he presented to the council a request to have his titles registered in order to preserve his rights and privileges as a member of the noblesse on account of the many formalities and the delays in hearing from france this matter dragged along over a period of fifteen years in the meantime in seventeen thirty four he married a young woman of good if not noble family who brought him a considerable dot he was not at all successful in his business ventures however and was finally obliged to take a clerical position by his marriage he had five children two sons and three daughters but we are only interested in the elder son joseph gaspard and the eldest daughter Desiree. in seventeen fifty two joseph gaspard who was then seventeen years of age left martinique to take a position as page in the household of the dauphine marie joseph of saxony the mother of the future king louis the sixteenth this place had been secured for him by the abbe de taché after passing three years in france he returned to martinique with a brevet commission as sous-lieutenant in the navy at this time thirty years after the arrival of gaspard joseph on the island the family was living in a state of abject misery without money or social position 
in april seventeen fifty five in a period of entire peace between the two nations an english fleet of ten vessels under the command of admiral boscoen captured two french battleships near the south coast of newfoundland it soon became evident that plans had been laid by the british government to attack all the french colonies in this emergency the king louis the fifteenth had need in the islands of an officer of force and intelligence and on the first of november seventeen fifty six he appointed francois de beauharnais as governor and lieutenant-general of all the french possessions in the west indies the new governor although only forty-two years of age had a record of twenty-seven years of distinguished service in the navy notwithstanding the fact that most of this period was passed at rochefort his native place and that he had seen no active service he was very highly esteemed for the efficiency with which he had always discharged the duties of his various positions m de beauharnais who was not made a marquis until eight years later belonged to a family of the noblesse de la robe rather than of the sword he was the eldest son of a naval captain claude and of a mademoiselle Arduino, whose mother had married for her second husband the then marquis de beauharnais as nephew of one and grandson of the other he was later to bear the title and to succeed to the hotel in the rue Thévenot in paris where the marquis died in seventeen forty nine when francois de beauharnais landed in martinique as governor in may seventeen fifty seven he was accompanied by his young wife whom he had married six years before she was his cousin and had brought him a large dot he also had a small income of his own which he had inherited from a bachelor uncle they had had two sons of whom only one was then living francois born the previous year what possible point of contact could there be between this grand seigneur arriving as master in martinique rich with his income of one hundred thousand and his salary of one hundred and fifty thousand livres and these tachets living in misery in a corner of the island as above stated gaspard joseph had three daughters and in some unknown way he was successful in obtaining for the eldest Désiré, a position in the household of the governor as an upper servant or demoiselle de compagnie once installed in the mansion it did not take her long to secure a dominating influence over the governor and his wife and her favour was in no way diminished by her marriage to an ordnance officer of m de beauharnais alexis renaudin a young man of good family and connections but it required all of the authority of the governor to arrange the matter as the renaudin objected strongly to the match not so much on account of the lack of dot as because of the general discredit of the taché finally m renaudin père died and the mother gave a reluctant consent after her marriage the power of the young madame renaudin seemed to increase from day to day a good husband was found for one of her younger sisters a command in the militia for her father and a place on the governor's staff for her brother the administration of m de beauharnais proved a failure charges of such gravity were made against him in france that he was recalled from his government and only saved from disgrace by the influence of powerful friends at home by this time his infatuation for madame renaudin was so great that he was reluctant to leave martinique and the interesting condition of his wife served as an excuse on the twenty eighth of may seventeen sixty another son was born who received the name of alexandre still m de beauharnais lingered on the island and it was not until the month of april in the following year that he and his wife finally sailed for france with the inseparable madame renaudin in their suite in order not to expose the young alexandre to the hazards of the voyage he was left behind in charge of madame taché mère before the departure of m de beauharnais he arranged yet another marriage for the taché family and on the ninth of november seventeen sixty one joseph gaspard the former page of the dauphine led to the altar mademoiselle rose claire de verger de sanois she was descended from the old noblesse of brie and belonged to one of the most highly considered families in the colony rose claire who was born in august seventeen thirty six had already passed her twenty-fifth birthday and was very glad to find a husband the marriage which was celebrated before the curé of trois Ilets, was not honoured by the presence of any of the dignitaries of the colony even the father of the groom was not present for some unknown reason from this marriage there was born on the twenty third of june seventeen sixty three a daughter who five weeks later received in baptism the names of marie joseph rose this was josephine
during the three following years madame de la pagerie had two more daughters desire born the eleventh of december seventeen sixty four who died at the age of thirteen and françoise born the third of september seventeen sixty six who died at the age of twenty five at this point we find a confusion in the records which is not easy to explain under the date of the fifth of september seventeen ninety one there is an entry of the burial of marie joseph rose there is also in existence a document of questionable authenticity from which it would appear that a demoiselle taché gave birth the seventeenth of march seventeen eighty six to a daughter who was adopted by madame de la pagerie and was given a dot of sixty thousand francs by the emperor napoleon twenty-two years later on the occasion of her marriage in the certificate of baptism of this child the mother may have borrowed the name of her sister josephine who was certainly in france at that date and the same name quite naturally might be used in her burial certificate in any case there is no possible doubt as to the personality of marie joseph rose nor as to the date of her birth but this confusion of names and dates enabled josephine when she wished to appear younger at the time of her second marriage to claim that she was born in seventeen sixty six the treaty of paris which ended the struggle between england and france was signed on the tenth of february seventeen sixty three but the news did not reach martinique until the end of the following month the french fleet charged with taking possession of the island arrived the middle of june and the white banner of the bourbons was hoisted once more just a week before the birth of josephine in the meantime in france m de Beauharnais, through the support of powerful friends at court had succeeded not only in having suppressed the record of his unsuccessful administration but in securing a pension of twelve thousand livres the rank of chef d'escadre and the title of marquis at the same time he also obtained a small pension for m de la pagerie madame renaudin after passing a short time in a convent openly took up her residence with the marquis both in the city and the country and his wife who seems for a long time to have been blind to their relationship left paris to live near her mother at blois from time to time she made short visits to the city and it was on one of these occasions that she died in october seventeen sixty seven madame renaudin was now in full control of the situation and to consolidate her power she began to lay plans for the future the pension of four hundred fifty livres which m de la pagerie had obtained from the court proved very useful when he was practically ruined by the great storm of august seventeen sixty six which combined with an earthquake devastated martinique throwing down houses and destroying plantations on the taché estate nothing was left standing except the sugar refinery to which the family fled for shelter in this building altered so as to make it habitable the family continued to live for the next twenty-five years Obna visited the place in the middle of the last century when it was not much changed since the days of josephine's childhood the village trois then contained about fifty frame houses and a small church in which was the family vault of the taché the plantation was located about a mile beyond the town and the description of Obna is interesting the homestead is situated on a slight eminence surrounded by larger hills only a few steps from the sea although it is out of sight and even out of hearing from the extent of the buildings still standing and the ruins which the eye can make out it is possible to judge the former importance of the estate one of the largest in this once flourishing quarter of the island the dwelling-house originally constructed on a large scale has become since the storm of seventeen sixty six a simple wooden structure next comes the sugar-mill with its circle of heavy pillars and its huge roof of red tiles of native manufacture a few paces from the mill is the refinery a large building over forty yards long by twenty wide on looking at the monumental solidity of this structure it is possible to understand how it withstood the terrible storm during the years which followed the building was adapted to shelter the taché family a low gallery was added on the southern side and rooms were fitted up in the upper part until a new dwelling-house could be erected built on the slope of the hill were the huts of the negroes and round about were the sheds and other buildings used in the manufacture of the sugar amid such surroundings the future empress and queen passed the years of her childhood with no society except that of the slaves and no culture intellectual or moral when she was ten years of age she was sent to the school of the dame de la providence at fort royal where she remained four years her education was then thought to be complete 
and she returned to trois -Ilets. In fact, she had received a little more than a primary school training, with a few lessons in music and dancing. At this time Josephine was far from being the finished coquette that she became later on. She had a good complexion, fine eyes, pretty hands and feet. But her face was full, without marked traits, her nose relevé and ordinary, her figure heavy and ungraceful. Her mind was hardly cultivated, but to the convent she owed at least quite an elegant penmanship, with an orthography not much worse than that of most of her contemporaries. She had a slender voice and sang to the accompaniment of a guitar. In character she was very sweet, submissive to authority, very amiable, always ready to do any one a favor, and such she remained all her life. While Josephine was passing her childhood at trois -Ilets, the boy Alexandre de Beauharnais was living at Fort Royal with the elder Madame Taché. It was not until two years after the death of his mother, towards the end of the year 1769, that his father arranged to have him brought back to France. At that time he was nine years of age. There is a record of his baptism under date of 15th of January 1770 on the parish registers of the Church of Saint-Sulpice at Paris his godmother was the haute et puissante dame marie euphémie désirée taché de la pagerie épouse de m renaudin écuyer ancien major de l'île de sainte lucie in order to complete his education which had been much neglected alexandre was placed with his brother in the collège du plessis founded by the great cardinal richelieu which at that time was the rival of louis le grand at paris Later, the boys were sent for two years with their tutor, Patricol, to the University of Heidelberg to learn the German language. In 1774, François entered the army, and Patricol was engaged by the Duc de la Rochefoucauld as preceptor for the two sons of his sister, Rouen Chabot, and he took Alexandre with him. It thus happened that the most impressionable years of the boy's life were passed in the ducal chateau of Roche-Guyon during all these years madame renaudin never lost sight of him she made every effort to secure over the son the same influence which she exercised over the father in the plans which she had formed for the future alexandre held the principal role the resources of the marquis were very limited and the expenses of the household were paid largely from the income of the fortune which the boy had inherited from his mother this money madame renaudin intended if possible to keep in the family Two, seventeen seventy nine to seventeen ninety, marriage and separation. When Alexandre de Beauharnais was sixteen years of age, in December seventeen seventy six, he received through the favor of the Duc de La Rochefoucauld a commission as sous lieutenant in his regiment of the Sarre Infanterie. At this time, he abandoned the courtesy title of chevalier, then given to the younger sons of noble families, and assumed that of vicomte, to which he had no valid claim dressed in his handsome new uniform of white cloth with facings of silver grey the young vicomte proceeded to rouen where his regiment had just arrived in garrison here he went through his military exercises and perfected himself in mathematics and horsemanship at this time he was far from thinking of marriage but he did not know the plans of that high and mighty dame his godmother when he returned home to pass a six months leave of absence madame renaudin played her cards so well that alexandre readily assented to her ideas in order more quickly to enjoy his fortune on the twenty third of october seventeen seventy seven the marquis wrote the following letter to m de la pagerie each of my children has at present an income of forty thousand livres it is in your power to give me one of your daughters to share the fortune of my chevalier the respect and attachment which he has for madame de renaudin make him ardently desire to be united to one of her nieces i assure you that i only acquiesced in his wishes in asking you for the second whose age is the most suitable for him i deeply regret that your eldest daughter is not a few years younger she certainly would have had the preference for i have formed an equally favourable opinion of her but i must admit that my son who is only seventeen and a half years old thinks that a young lady of fifteen is too nearly of his own age there are occasions when sensible parents are forced to yield to circumstances as alexandre besides the income of forty thousand livres from the estate of his mother had expectations of twenty-five thousand more the marquis did not request m de la pagerie to furnish any dot he only asked that the father make haste to bring his daughter to france 
or if he could not come himself to send her with a trustworthy companion by a commercial vessel as she would have a more comfortable and agreeable voyage when this letter of the marquis reached martinique the second daughter of monsieur de la pagerie desire was dead of a malignant fever at the age of thirteen and the youngest daughter Françoise, was not yet twelve years old in january the father writes that in default of the second daughter he is willing to offer the third but that it would be better to accept the first he says that she josephine has a very fine complexion and very beautiful arms and that she is very anxious to go to paris madame renaudin's plan was that alexandre should marry one of her nieces she did not care whether it was the youngest or the oldest therefore without wasting time and vain regrets over the death of desire she wrote her brother in march seventeen seventy eight come with one of your girls or two whatever you do will be agreeable to us we must have one of your children in reply to this letter m de la pagerie wrote the last of june that his youngest daughter had been ill for three months and was in no condition to travel and that he would bring josephine when received in september this information was communicated to alexandre who was then stationed with his regiment near brest and he accepted the substitution with good grace though with little enthusiasm before m de la pagerie could sail however france and england were again at war and his departure was delayed for more than a year finally in october seventeen seventy nine madame renaudin received a letter from her brother announcing that he and his daughter had arrived at brest after a terrible voyage and that he was detained there by illness she at once set out with alexandre to join them this was the first encounter between alexandre and josephine since their childhood days as she was only six years old when he left martinique to judge by his letters to his father at this time he was far from enthusiastic over his creole fiancee he said that she was not as pretty as his father might expect but that the sweetness of her character surpassed anything that had been said of her the party of four travelled slowly to paris where they arrived the middle of november and joined the marquis in his hotel rue Thévenot, where he was just installed the bands had already been published three times in martinique in april and they were now published again in paris madame renaudet at once occupied herself with ordering the trousseau for which she expended the large sum of twenty thousand livres on the tenth of december the contract was signed at the hotel of the marquis in the presence of all the male members of the family no ladies being present of the family of the bride there was present aside from m de la pagerie and his sister only a very distant cousin as alexandre had so large an income the marquis did not make any settlement on him at the time of the marriage the dot of the bride was furnished by her aunt besides the trousseau already mentioned madame renaudin gave her a house at noisy le grand in the vicinity of paris which she had purchased in october seventeen seventy six for the sum of thirty three thousand livres and had furnished at a further cost of about thirty thousand livres to use the expression commonly employed by ladies in those days and perhaps since when they did not care to state from what source their money was derived these funds were doubtless the proceeds of her diamonds three days after the signing of the contract on the thirteenth of december seventeen seventy nine the marriage was celebrated in the church at noisy in the presence of nearly the same persons who witnessed the signing of the contract no woman signed the register immediately after the marriage the young couple took up their residence in the sombre hotel of the marquis in paris for the young creole it was a sad change from the brilliant sunshine the entire liberty and the dolce far niente of the antilles the beauharnais had few friends in paris and josephine had not even an acquaintance in the spring alexandre returned to his regiment at brest and josephine remained in paris with her father-in-law her aunt and her father who was still ill returning to paris when his regiment was ordered to verdun alexandre made no effort to introduce his wife in society he thought her awkward and ignorant even worse she seemed to him plain devoid of grace and tournure with ridiculous ideas of conjugal love tenderness and jealousy he had married to be free to enjoy his fortune and he had no intention of being tied down to his wife it was difficult enough to secure entry to the court for himself alone and he owed his position there mainly to the fact that he was a fine dancer he could never hope to introduce a wife who had neither money nor friends nor social position 
in fact despite the legends to the contrary josephine was never presented at the court of marie antoinette while alexandre visited from chateau to chateau his wife continued to lead the same quiet uneventful life at noisy or at paris on the third of september seventeen eighty one she gave birth in the hotel rue Thévenot to a son who the following day was baptized in the church of st sauveur and received the name of eugène the first of november alexandre left paris for a trip to italy from which he did not return until the end of july for a short time after his return he was more attentive to his wife but the improvement in their relations did not last long one who knew him well has said that he was d'une grande coquetterie avec les femmes and such he remained until the end of his life josephine was naturally of a jealous temperament and she certainly had reason enough to faire des scènes alexandre was hardly back a month in paris before he was thinking of leaving again at that time m de bouilly the governor of the windward islands was in france with the object of persuading the government to authorize an expedition against the english warmly supported by his old patron m de la rochefoucauld alexandre tried but in vain to secure the position of aide-de-camp to bouilly he was so determined to leave however that on the twenty sixth september seventeen eighty two he sailed for martinique as a simple volunteer having obtained an indefinite leave of absence from the minister of war he arrived at the island in the month of november but found no chance to distinguish himself as the war was drawing to a close the preliminaries of peace were signed the twentieth of january seventeen eighty three and all hostilities ceased in the antilles as soon as the news was received on the tenth of april seventeen eighty three a daughter was born to josephine in the new hotel of the marquis rue st charles and was baptized the following day as hortense eugenie in the certificate the father is described as vicomte de beauharnais baron de beauville capitaine au regiment de la sarre actuellement en amérique pour le service du roi at that time it took at least two months for a letter to go from paris to martinique and alexandre did not receive the news before the middle of june after waiting three weeks he wrote to josephine as follows if i had written you in the first moment of my anger my pen would have burnt the paper but for more than three weeks i know at least in part what i wish you to understand in spite then of the despair of my soul the rage which suffocates me i shall know how to restrain myself i shall know how to tell you coldly that you are in my eyes the vilest of human beings that my stay here has enabled me to learn of the abominable life you led here that i know in the fullest particulars your intrigue with m de b officer of the regiment de la martinique also that with m dash i know finally the contents of your letters and i will bring with me one of the presents you made i do not ask you for repentance you are incapable of it a person who while making her preparations to depart could receive her lover in her arms when she knows that she is destined for another has no soul she is lower than all the coquines on earth what can i think of this last child born more than eight months after my return from italy i am forced to accept it but i swear by the heaven which enlightens me that it belongs to another that it is the blood of a stranger which flows in its veins make your own arrangements accordingly never never will i put myself in a position to be abused again and as you are a woman to impose on the public if we live under the same roof have the goodness to retire to a convent as soon as you receive my letter it is my last word and nothing on earth can make me change it i will go to see you on my arrival in paris once only i wish to have a talk with you and to give you something it is impossible to read this letter without feeling that alexandre at the time sincerely believed that he had been wronged by josephine both before and after their union during his stay in martinique he had begun as usual to courir les femmes and had formed a liaison with a young woman who was an enemy of the taché jealous of the fine marriage which madame renaudin had arranged for her niece and ready to employ all means to disturb the peace of the family it was from her that alexandre obtained the information as to josephine's early love affairs after arranging to meet his mistress in paris alexandre sailed the middle of august and arrived in france six weeks later he found awaiting him at the port letters from his father and madame renaudin attempting to bring about a reconciliation 
en route for paris he wrote josephine that he was surprised to learn that she was not yet in a convent and that his decision was unalterable on receiving this letter at noisy josephine rushed to paris to meet her husband on his arrival but alexandre did not go to his father's house every possible effort was made by the marquis and madame renaudin to effect a reconciliation but the vicomte remained inflexible after a month of fruitless attempts josephine retired with her aunt to the abbaye de pantimont rue de grenelle and early in december began a formal action for separation in her complaint she sets forth in the greatest detail the existence which she has led the indifference of her husband who in nearly three years of married life has passed less than ten months with her in conclusion she states the formal refusal of her husband to resume their life in common and files a copy of the letter quoted above which constitutes her principal grievance against him it is certain that if alexandre had any proofs of the misconduct of josephine subsequent to their marriage he would not have hesitated at this time to bring them forward the allegation regarding hortense is disproved by a simple examination of the dates as for the other charges fifteen months later he voluntarily and explicitly withdrew them in march seventeen eighty five he met josephine in the office of his notary and consented formally to a separation all the provisions of this act are greatly to the honour of josephine and prove conclusively that there was no basis for the grave charges alexandre had made when under the spell of an ignoble woman josephine was to live where she pleased to receive from her husband an allowance of five thousand livres a year to have the custody of eugene until he was five years old to keep hortense for whose maintenance her father was to pay one thousand livres quarterly in advance until she was seven years old and fifteen hundred livres after that age alexandre further agreed to pay all the legal expenses of the suit such was the end of this famous action from which josephine carried off all the honours of war the sojourn of josephine at pantemont was of great advantage to her in every way the abbaye was like an immense furnished hotel of the highest respectability open only to women of la première distinction and there josephine for the first time had an opportunity of meeting women of her own social rank she was received as the vicomtesse de beauharnais an unfortunate irreproachable young woman the victim of a cruel husband for a woman of the world josephine already possessed two of the essential requisites she was a coquette and she knew how to lie in these two respects her husband undoubtedly had a grievance against her and to these two qualities josephine adds by the faculty of assimilation which is one of her strongest traits that physical education which in a new society is to place her in a class by herself little by little a transformation is effected in her personality which changes the heavy and awkward creole into a being delicate and souple a being desirable above all who knows how to attract and to hold from every point of view this retreat of fifteen months was profitable to her on leaving the pantemont early in seventeen eighty six josephine at twenty-three years of age found herself free with an income of nine thousand livres for the support of hortense and herself at this time she sold the estate at noisy and with the proceeds she bought at fontainebleau a little house where she went to live with her aunt and the marquis they had a few friends in that locality and in their society the days passed pleasantly at that time the court was obliged to practise the strictest economy and for two years the royal hunt was abandoned in september seventeen eighty six under the terms of the act of separation eugene was sent to his father who placed him at school hortense was brought home from chelles where she had been for two years with a nurse and was at once inoculated by orders of the marquis who was a great believer in all innovations abandoned at twenty-three years by her husband whose liaisons with other women were open and notorious attractive passionate extremely coquette is it probable that josephine did not have a lover several names have been mentioned in this connection but we have no proofs all we know is that in june seventeen eighty eight josephine suddenly sailed for martinique taking hortense with her none of her biographers has ever been able to find a satisfactory explanation of this voyage it has been surmised that it was either for the purpose of concealing the results of her imprudence or else was on account of the pressing need of money 
but if the latter was it not easier to await at fontainebleau the remittances of her father who acted as agent of the marquis than to go three thousand miles in search of them in default of any documents we are reduced to conjectures and with our knowledge of josephine can only imagine one of two reasons debts or love the biographers friendly to josephine attribute her journey to the former cause but it is rather strange that her enemies have not seized on the fact that de Cray, writing by napoleon's orders in eighteen hundred seven spoke of the demoiselle of eighteen years whom madame de la pagerie has adopted had this girl known as marie benaquette taché de la pagerie been really only eighteen years of age at that time she must have been born early in seventeen eighty nine that is to say during this visit of josephine and not in march seventeen eighty six as stated in the document of doubtful authenticity already mentioned therefore on the ground of date alone there was no reason why marie joseph rose as stated in the certificate could not have been the mother instead of marie Françoise. turcan who is always unfriendly to josephine does not hesitate to insinuate that josephine had a daughter during this visit to martinique in seventeen eighty nine six years after her separation from her husband and gives as his authority a study of m frédéric masson upon josephine avant bonaparte published in the revue de paris this girl marie benaquette was married in march eighteen hundred eight to the private secretary of the captain-general of martinique a m blanchet and her dot of sixty thousand francs was provided by the emperor doubtless at the request of josephine the whole episode is a curious one to say the least whatever her motive may have been josephine was in great haste to leave france at the earliest possible moment finding on her arrival at havre that the government vessel which she had expected to take could not sail for two weeks she engaged passage for hortense and herself on a private ship and sailed at once the voyage was pleasant and rapid arrived at martinique josephine went directly to trois where she remained nearly two years we have no record of this visit but her life must have been very dull the family was very poor and both her father and her sister françoise were ill her father died in november seventeen ninety two months after josephine's departure and her sister a year later End of chapters one and two Chapters three and four of Napoleon and Josephine: The Rise of the Empire by Walter Geer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Three, seventeen eighty nine to seventeen ninety four, the Revolution. On the fifth of May, seventeen eighty nine, the States General assembled at Versailles, and Alexandre de Beauharnais was one of the members. He had presented himself to the noblesse of Blois as a candidate for the place of one of the two deputies to be elected by that bailiwick, and was chosen almost unanimously through the influence of Lavoisier. This was the fermier général Lavoisier, member of the Academy of Sciences. Established only twenty years at Blois, he had acquired by his liberality a great popularity. He was the real head of the electoral assembly, of which he was chosen secretary, and it was he who drafted the Cahier des Doléances. This memorandum of grievances which Alexandre was charged to support was wholly inspired by the doctrines of Rousseau, and was the most revolutionary of any presented to the king. Beauharnais was faithful to his mandate, and on his arrival at Versailles he ranged himself with the minority of the noblesse, the forty-seven, beside Aiguillon, Lafayette, Lalite Landal, La Rochefoucauld, and the Duc d'Orléans. On the night of the 4th of August, when feudal rights were abolished and every man generously gave away what he did not own, Alexandre took a leading part. In recognition of his attitude on this occasion, on the 23rd of November, after the assembly had moved to Paris, Beauharnais was chosen one of the three secretaries with Aiguillon as president while alexandre was thus playing one of the principal roles in the constituent assembly the island of martinique was in a state of turmoil there was open war between the whites and the blacks taché the uncle of josephine who was commandant of the port of fort royal was elected mayor there was a collision at st pierre between the two parties and fifteen blacks were killed the garrison of fort bourbon revolted and taché was made prisoner by the rebels the governor was compelled to evacuate not only the capital but also the forts which defended it 
complete anarchy reigned on the island josephine was advised by her friends to leave and she sailed for france on the fourth of september seventeen ninety on the frigate sensible her departure was so hasty that she sailed almost without any changes of clothing and during the voyage was thrown upon the charity of the officers of the ship for toilet necessities for herself and hortense she landed in france early in november and went directly to paris where she lodged at the hotel des asturies rue d'anjou at this time josephine seems to have made another effort to bring about a reconciliation with her husband but without success alexandre continued to live at the hotel of the duc de la rochefoucauld and josephine took an apartment in the rue saint dominique the summer of seventeen ninety one josephine and her children were with the marquis and madame renaudet at fontainebleau here she learned of the election of her husband as president of the assembly on the eighteenth of june two days later occurred the flight of the royal family to varennes the announcement was made by beauharnais in opening the session of tuesday the twenty first of june and the assembly remained in permanent session until the afternoon of the following sunday during this period alexandre by force of circumstances was the personage the most en vue in france the head of all authority the king was suspended and the president of the national assembly for the moment was sovereign when his son eugene was seen in the streets of fontainebleau the people cried voilà le dauphin it was a strange turn of the wheel of fortune which thus brought face to face the marquis de bouilly the distinguished soldier of the antilles the last royal governor who arranged the flight to varennes and this beauharnais who a few years before had vainly solicited the favour of being his aide-de-camp one had been a valiant soldier whose life had been devoted to his king and country the other had never seen any act of service and his brief existence up to the present time had been a mixture of scandal and futility in this encounter by the irony of fate it was the veteran who lost and the carpet knight who won the last of september the constituent assembly came to an end as the retiring deputies by an act of rare and imbecile disinterestedness had declared themselves ineligible for election to the new legislative assembly they were all forced to retire to private life alexandre set out at once for loire et cher where he was named member of the administration of the department at this time he bought some national property in the vicinity of ferté beauharnais of which he seemed to consider himself the sole owner since the emigration of his brother but the exercise of his new civil duties was brief since the twenty fifth of august he had been on the rolls of the general's staff with the rank of lieutenant-colonel and early in december he received an order to join the twenty-first division to which he was attached the former president of the assembly certainly took his time about entering upon his military duties for he remained in the country until the last of january and then came to paris where he devoted another month to arranging his affairs at this time he was successful in securing a pension of ten thousand livres for his aged father finally he set out for the headquarters at valenciennes when hostilities began in april he was attached to the third corps commanded by marechal de rochambeau in person he took part in the first operations and personally sent to the military committee of the assembly an account of the rout at mons for such distinguished services alexandre was promoted the last of may and assigned to the army of the north under marechal Luckner. he continued to correspond with the assembly to describe the smallest skirmishes and to give his impressions of events he was one of the first to accept the revolution of the tenth of august and was rewarded on the seventh of september by being promoted to major-general and named chief of staff of the new army in course of formation at strasbourg the year seventeen ninety two came to an end without the army of the rhine making any forward movement during the first months of the following year beauharnais was still in strasbourg or that vicinity his name occurs in no reports the eighth of march he was promoted to be lieutenant-general and on the thirteenth of may when custine was made commander of the army of the north beauharnais succeeded him as general-in-chief of the army of the rhine in june after the fall of the girondins alexandre was summoned to paris to succeed bouchotte as minister of war this nomination displeased the all-powerful commune of paris which denounced beauharnais as an aristocrat and he wisely declined the appointment by this time the public was beginning to realize that general beauharnais was more fond of writing than of acting 
Mayence was besieged, and the commander of the army of the Rhine had something more important to do than to compose addresses. The last of June he finally set his sixty thousand men in motion, and advanced on the enemy. As usual, he reported in the greatest detail the slightest skirmishes, but did nothing to affect the relief of Mayence, which after a brave defense was forced to capitulate on the 23rd of July. He then insulted the heroic defenders of the city by a proclamation to his army in which he said, No one could expect a surrender so long as the Republicans had any ammunition or bread. At the same time, he wrote the Jacobin of Strasbourg that the club ought to demand of the convention the heads of the traitors of Mayence and send them to the king of Prussia. He then ordered his army to retreat to the lines of Vissembourg and sent in his resignation on the ground that, as a member of a proscribed caste, it was his duty to remove any subject of disquietude from the minds of his fellow citizens. Without any authorization, he left his army and went to Strasbourg. It was a grave error thus to abandon his post in the face of the enemy, at a moment when Custine was on trial, Dillon under arrest, and all the generals of noble birth subject to suspicion. On the 21st of August his resignation was accepted, in terms which for all time must cover his name with opprobrium. He was ordered to retire at once to a distance of fifty miles from the frontier to a place of residence of which he would inform the convention. So ended the inglorious military career of Alexandre de Beauharnais. From October 1791 to September 1793, except for visits to her aunt at Fontainebleau, Josephine passed all her time in her Paris apartment. Then, on account of the new law regarding suspects, she found it desirable to have a domicile outside the city in order to obtain a certificate of civisme, good citizenship. For some unknown reason, instead of using Fontainebleau, she decided upon Croissy, a village on the Seine about ten miles from Versailles. Here she subleased a house from Madame Ostan, a Creole friend from St. Lucie, who lived at Paris in the same hôtel Rue Saint-Dominique. She had a daughter of about the same age as Hortense, and the mothers had become intimate friends. The 26th of September, 1793, the citoyenne Beauharnais presented herself at the municipality of Croissy to make her declaration, and two days later she was joined by her son Eugène, who came from his school at Strasbourg. In her declaration there is no mention of Hortense, but this was probably an oversight. Mademoiselle de Vergennes, who passed this summer of 1793 at Croissy, states that it was then that she made the acquaintance of Hortense, who was three or four years younger than herself. At this time, Josephine, to prove her civisme, placed Hortense with her old nurse Marie Lanois at Paris as an apprentice to learn dressmaking, and Eugène was articled to one Cochard, a carpenter, who was the national agent of the commune of Croissy. This attack of civic fever, however, did not prevent Josephine from seeking society and extending her acquaintance among the residents of Croissy. Among the friends she made at this time were Chanorier, through whom she afterwards bought Malmaison, Mademoiselle de Vergennes, who, as Madame de Rimusa, was to be her dame du palais, and Réal, who was to become councillor of state, commandant of the Légion d'honneur, count of the empire. During the month of January 1794, armed with her certificate of civisme, Josephine returned to her apartment in Paris. Leaving Strasbourg so precipitately that he had not time to take with him his carriages and horses, Alexandre proceeded directly to his home at Ferté. From there, he made haste to write the Jacobin Club of Blois to announce his early visit. On his first appearance, however, he was greeted with insults. He made a spirited reply, and thought that he had saved the situation. Reassured, he leased a small house in the city, and endeavored to gain the goodwill of his neighbors. At the same time, he opened correspondence with his wife. In the face of their common peril, a kind of intimacy was established between them. In the meanwhile, he was elected mayor of the little commune of Ferté. But Alexandre was not to enjoy very long his quiet life in the country. On the 2nd of March, 1794, by order of the Committee of General Security, he was arrested and conducted to Paris, where on the 14th of March he was confined in the Carme. On the 19th of April, by order of the same committee, Josephine was also arrested at Croissy, taken to Paris and placed in the same prison. The old convent of the church of Saint-Joseph-des-Carmes, 
its walls still stained with the blood of the september massacres is standing to-day in the rue vaugirard close by the luxembourg and the odeon at that time it was one of the most insanitary prisons of paris it was cold damp dirty infested with vermin poorly ventilated and badly lighted however the society was excellent although rather mixed grand seigneur and grande dame were mingled promiscuously with domestics and artisans there josephine was thrown again with her husband and there seems to have been a good understanding between them but nothing more alexandre conceived a great passion for delphine de custine while josephine engaged in a violent flirtation with general hoche who entered the calm at about the same time every possible effort was made by alexandre and josephine to secure their liberty through eugene and hortense who were allowed to visit their mother communication was kept up with the outside world josephine's surly pug-dog fortuné which was not noticed in the crowd carried letters placed under her collar the case against alexandre however was too strong for him to hope for acquittal his military career his neglect to relieve mayence his desertion of his post made a record hard to defend on the twenty second of july he was taken to the conciergerie realizing that it was the end as he passed madame de custine he handed her as a farewell present an arab talisman mounted in a ring which he always wore on his finger alexandre faced death bravely in those days if few knew how to live all knew how to die without trial without testimony without pleadings without verdict he was hurried to the guillotine in a batch of fifty-five victims it was the fifth termidor four days more four seventeen ninety four to seventeen ninety five after the terror no words can depict the conditions in paris during the great terror which began in march seventeen ninety four and ended with the fall of robespierre on the twenty seventh of july the law of suspects kept the prisons packed the guillotine was constantly employed the whole nation appeared doomed to the scaffold the final seven weeks between the twenty third prairial eleventh of june and the nine termidor were horrible it was nothing more nor less than a massacre in the course of these forty-five days one thousand three hundred seventy-six heads fell in paris fear was on every side drawing-rooms were empty wine-shops were deserted the very courtesans ceased to go to the palais royal where virtue now reigned supreme the convention was well-nigh deserted the deputies had given up sleeping at home when the head of robespierre fell under the guillotine a mighty shout of joy went up from the one hundred thousand beings massed in the place de la revolution in the popular estimation robespierre had been the incarnation of the terror therefore his own downfall meant the end of the terror no such thought had been in the minds of barras and tallien when they struck down the dictator but they were not slow to take advantage of this reaction in public opinion the joy of the populace however was nothing in comparison with the delight of the reprieved prisoners who had been hopelessly awaiting death the daily roll-call had ceased it was never to be heard again while the tumbrils conveyed to the scaffold the dreaded instruments of the terror fouquier and the judges and jurymen the former captives were daily set free at the same time a hundred thousand suspects issued from their hiding-places their joy was beyond words it was as if they had risen from the tomb or been born into life again josephine was one of the first of the prisoners to gain her liberty ten days after the fall of robespierre on the nineteen termidor sixth of august she left the carme one of her companions in misfortune has drawn a sketch of her behaviour in prison which is not wholly flattering she was pusillanimous in the highest degree she passed her time in telling her fortune with cards and weeping in public to the great scandal of her companions but she was naturally affable and does not this trait make us oblivious to many qualities which are lacking her tournure her manners her voice above all had a particular charm but it must be admitted that she was neither magnanimous nor frank the other prisoners pitied her for her lack of courage nevertheless josephine was very popular when the prisoners heard her name pronounced they applauded furiously with that grace which never left her she made her adieu to each one and left amidst the good wishes and blessings of all 
it has been stated that she owed her prompt liberation to madame de fontenoy the future madame tallien her companion in prison but theresia was confined in la force and not at the carme josephine had other friends however who were not less powerful hoche who left his prison on the fourth of august réal barère tallien to mention only a few of the names tallien himself always claimed the honour and to him eugene gave the credit at a later date but very little is known of the life of josephine during the twelve months following her release from prison as the seals were still attached to her apartment in the rue saint dominique she probably passed the autumn of seventeen ninety four in her house at croissy barras states in his memoirs that on leaving the carme she became the mistress of hoche if so the liaison must have been very brief hoche was transferred to the conciergerie the middle of may and was set free only two days before josephine twelve days later he was appointed general-in-chief of the army of the Côte de cherbourg and left paris to take up his new command not later than the first of september at this time he seems to have been very much in love with his young wife from whom he had been separated almost immediately after their marriage in february by being ordered to the army of italy and later by his imprisonment admitting that he carried on a lively flirtation with josephine during the few weeks that they were thrown together in the carme it seems much more probable that hoche passed with his bride the short period that he was in paris at this time furthermore it is absurd to attempt to draw any conclusions as to this liaison from the fact that hoche gave eugene a position on his staff the general had been in close relations with alexandre in the army and these ties had been drawn closer by their confinement in the same prison what then could be more natural than the wish of hoche to relieve the burden of his friend's widow by assuming the responsibility of her son this also is his own explanation of the matter in a letter written to the marquis two years later after the second marriage of josephine there is no doubt however that during these twelve months josephine was in great financial difficulties she had on her hands the lease both of her paris apartment and the house at croissy her father had left his affairs in great confusion and the difficulty of getting money for martinique was further increased by the war with england in february seventeen ninety four the english had taken possession of the island and the tache estate was in the hands of the enemy in france the property of her husband had been confiscated by the government the expenses of josephine's household at this time were quite heavy she had three domestics the nurse marie lanois the maid agathe rible and the valet officieux gontier she not only paid them no wages however but even borrowed their little savings her principal resource was a monsieur emery a banker at dunkerque who for many years had had business relations with the tache this emery had been colonel of the national guard deputy to the legislative assembly and mayor of dunkerque during the terror he was imprisoned and only a serious illness saved him from the guillotine in the year three seventeen ninety four to ninety five he was again elected mayor and resumed his commerce with the antilles for a period of three years he had advanced to josephine the funds of which she had need on the first of january seventeen ninety five josephine writes to her mother that without the aid of her friend emery she does not know what would have become of her she urges madame tache to remit to her either through london or hambourg all the funds at her disposal not merely the income but also the capital sum her mother seems to have done her best but the remittance was only moderate in amount josephine then drew on her mother a sight draft for one thousand pounds sterling writing her at the same time how important it was for her to meet the draft as the money was due to friends who had already advanced it to her in the meantime she succeeded in having the seals removed from her apartment and recovered possession of her effects she also managed to have turned over to her the silver and books left by alexandre in his country house and was paid by the government the sum of ten thousand livres on account of the furniture which had been sold from these few details it is possible to judge how precarious was the life of josephine during the greater part of this year but with the small remittances she received from martinique with money she borrowed on every side with bills which she contracted everywhere she somehow managed to exist and her life was far from being devoid of luxury she was not a woman to walk and must have a carriage which she hired by the month 
she had not yet worked out the combination by which she obtained in june seventeen ninety five from the committee of public safety a carriage and two horses in exchange for the horses and equipages which alexandre had left with the army of the rhine she was fond of flowers and could not live without them her toilettes which were quite modest included such items as a piece of muslin at five hundred livres two pairs of silk stockings at seven hundred livres and a shawl at twelve hundred livres but let not the reader be amazed at these figures a thousand livres assignat then represented only about fifty-three livres in gold at this time josephine was on very intimate terms with madame tallien the most beautiful woman of her day theresia was the daughter of francis cabarus a famous banker and finance minister of spain in seventeen eighty eight at the age of fourteen she was married to the elderly comte de fontenoy a councillor of the parlement of bordeaux during the early days of the revolution her wit and beauty made her a favourite in the salons of paris later she attempted with her husband to join her father in spain but they were arrested at bordeaux as suspects at that time tallien was exercising all the rigours of the terror in the department of the gironde he thus met theresia fell in love with her and released fontenoy on condition that he should apply for a divorce she then became at first the mistress and later the wife of the proconsul after the reign of terror and the dictatorship of robespierre the woman-hater the new regime found its incarnation in this woman of easy morals it is a curious fact that after her divorce by tallien in eighteen hundred two she married prince de chimay and became the mother of a son who espoused emilie the daughter of napoleon and the lovely madame palapra she was so far as known the only daughter of the emperor there were many points of resemblance between josephine and theresia both had the same tastes the same desires the same love of luxury neither of them had any moral scruples and they were both looking for some one rich enough to satisfy their caprices husband or lover it mattered little which theresia who was only twenty years of age at this time had the advantage over josephine both of youth and beauty but in grace and charm she could not be compared with the fascinating creole theresia was not a woman to be satisfied long with a man like tallien she soon found their chaumière in the allée des veuves too small a theatre for her talents nothing would satisfy her but the rarest flowers the most exquisite wines and toilettes which did not cost less from the fact that they were most diaphanous from tallien she passed to barras who soon turned her over to the rich banker ouvrard tout en conservant les privautés qui lui conviennent in august seventeen ninety five when her affairs were still in the same precarious condition josephine leased from julie carreau the wife of the actor talma from whom she was separated a little hotel entre cour et jardin at number six rue chantereine this was a short street recently laid out from the faubourg montmartre to the chaussee d'antin it was lined with the residences of filles entretenues the lease was for three years with privilege of two renewals and the rent was ten thousand francs in assignat the entrance to the hotel was by a porte cochere through a long corridor at the end of which was a little garden with two small pavilions which contained the stable and carriage house in the middle was the house consisting only of a rez-de-chaussee with an attic above and cellar below there were five rooms an antechamber a bedroom a salon which also served as a dining-room another small salon used as a boudoir and a wardrobe the servants quarters were in the attic although small the house demanded quite a staff of servants a porter a coachman a chef and a femme de chambre josephine at this time set up her carriage with two horses the same which she had obtained from the government before taking possession of her new home josephine had spent a very considerable amount in repairing and adding to the furniture of her apartment in rue saint dominique nothing however was very luxurious the salon was furnished only with a round mahogany table and four chairs covered with black horsehair on the walls were hung a few prints framed in dark wood it is interesting to note in passing that this short street or rather the locality where it was afterwards laid out was originally known under the name of la victoire later the place was called chantraine on account of the frogs which chanted there after the campaign of italy it was again called rue de la victoire in honour of napoleon and is still known by that name to-day 
at this time the nurse marie lanois was no longer with josephine as she had placed hortense in the new school which madame campan had just founded at st germain she also sent for eugene whom hoche would have been only too glad to keep on his staff and placed him in quite an expensive institution which had just been opened at st germain under the name of the collège irlandais the overthrow of robespierre on the nine termidor was due largely to barras and for the next two years he was perhaps the most prominent man in france for power in itself he cared but little but he greatly enjoyed the advantages derived from it the money the luxury and above all the women paul barras was born in provence in seventeen fifty five of a good family in his youth he served as a lieutenant against the british in india in seventeen eighty nine he was chosen a member of the states general and took an active part in the storming of the bastille and the tuileries the siege of toulon owed its success largely to his activity and energy after the nine termidor as president of the convention he acted with decision both against the intrigues of the royalists and the excesses of the jacobins he was brave he was a gentleman and with much reason he despised the rabble by whom he was surrounded as lefebvre said of talleyrand he was a mess of filth in a silk stocking but unlike talleyrand he had courage and when occasion demanded did not hesitate to draw the sword and throw away the scabbard it was a curious side of the nature of barras that while he associated with the commonest of men he wished to have around him only women of the ancien regime he must have in his intimate relations grace elegance and distinction he could not expect to find ladies of the highest rank they had all immigrated or died on the scaffold but he sought those who to save their heads or their fortunes had compromised themselves with the leaders of the popular party and who with the return of luxury were ready to do anything to satisfy their caprices he had not money enough to meet their demands from his own resources but he put them in contact with bankers and contractors whom he exploited himself and whom he permitted them to exploit in turn among this galaxy of pretty women of loose morals the bright particular stars were theresia and josephine some one must have paid for the new luxury of josephine and there is little doubt that barras was at this time her lover he is ungallant enough to say so in his memoir and for once he seems to have told the truth as president of the convention member of the committee of general security general-in-chief of the army of the interior barras was really more powerful then than later as a member of the directory in july seventeen ninety five he returned from a mission to the north on the thirteen vendemiaire fifth of october he commanded the troops of the convention on the first of november he became a director and on the fourth he installed himself at the luxembourg there is a remarkable coincidence between these dates and the events in the life of josephine on the seventeenth of august she signed her lease for the hotel chantraine the following month she sent her children to school the second of october she moved into her new home and the sixth she gave the orders to furnish luxuriously her chambre à coucher by midsummer the liaison was already well established and during the autumn they met frequently at croissy we had madame de beauharnais for a neighbour writes pasquier her house adjoined our own she only came there occasionally once a week to meet barras with the many persons who followed in his suite as is not rare with creoles the house of madame de beauharnais had an air of luxury while the most essential things were lacking chicken game rare fruits filled the kitchen while they came to our humble abode to borrow the kitchen utensils plates and glasses which they lacked on the fourth of november seventeen ninety five the newly elected directors took possession of the luxembourg which had been assigned them as an official residence the palace had been used as a prison during the revolution and all of the furniture had mysteriously disappeared there was no one to receive them except the concierge who loaned them for their first meeting a dilapidated table and some cane-bottomed chairs as soon as the salons were refurnished and barras began to hold his court josephine and theresia were among the first to appear this court was made up of women of the old noblesse and there reigned in spite of assertions to the contrary a very good tone a certain cold reserve rather than the abandon of bad taste the ladies were nearly all widows and very few husbands were to be seen besides the luxembourg and her house at croissy 
Josephine also met Barras at a house which he owned or leased at Chaillot, as is shown by a letter still in existence. The citoyenne Beauharnais invites the citoyen Réal to give her the pleasure of his company for dinner, chez elle, at her home, tomorrow the 25th. The citoyen Barras and Tallien are to be present. This letter is dated the 24 Pluviose, en 4, 13 February, 1796, and is written from the residence of Barras at Chaillot. End of chapters 3 and 4《ラッシュ・ー・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・ラッシュ・by which the members of the convention had sought to secure the election of two-thirds of their number to the new call législatif. Barras was placed in command of the troops of the convention, and he appointed as his aide-de-camp or chief of staff a young artillery officer named Napoleon Bonaparte, who had distinguished himself at the siege of Toulon. Bonaparte easily put down the uprising, and the convention showed its gratitude. He was named General en second of the Army of the Interior, 8th of October promoted general of division, 16th of October, and succeeded Barras as general-in-chief of the Army of the Interior on the 26th of October. The day of the insurrection, the 13 Vendémières, 5th of October, and the following day, Josephine was at Fontainebleau, where she had gone to select some furniture to be sent to her new house in Paris. A week after her return, she was notified of the order of the Committee of Public Safety that all citizens of Paris must surrender the arms in their possession. This seems to have been a matter of indifference to her, but Eugène, who was at home, protested warmly against giving up his father's sword. The commissioner consented to let him keep it if he secured the authorization of the general-in-chief. Eugène immediately went to the headquarters of General Bonaparte in the Rue des Capucines to make his request. The profound emotion which he displayed, his name, his pleasant face and manners, the warmth with which he made his plea, all touched the general who gave him permission to keep the sabre. Naturally, the mother of Eugène came to express her thanks as was only polite. Thus chance brought together General Bonaparte and the former Vicomtesse de Beauharnais. With Napoleon it was a case of love at first sight. His heart, his mind, his imagination, all were taken by storm. She was a lady, a grande dame, a ci-devant Vicomtesse, the widow of a president of the Constituent Assembly, of a general chief of the Army of the Rhine. All this meant much to Bonaparte. The title, the social position, the noble air with which she expressed her gratitude. For the first time, the young Corsican found himself in the presence of a real lady of high society. He was invited to call on her some evening when he was free, and the next night he rung at the porte cochere of the little hotel in the Rue Chantereine. When Josephine met Napoleon about the middle of October 1795, she was already more than thirty-two years old, a mature age for a creole. Her hair, which was not thick, but fine in quality, was of a dark chestnut color. Her complexion was brunette. Her skin was already wrinkled, but so covered with powder and rouge that the fact was not apparent under a subdued light. Her teeth were bad, but no one ever saw them. Her very small mouth was never more than slightly opened, in a sweet smile which accorded perfectly with the infinite softness of her eyes with their long eyelashes, with the tender expression of her features, with the touching quality of her voice. And with that, un petit nez frigant, léger, mobile, aux narines perpétuellement battantes, un nez un peu relevé du bout, engageant et fripon qui provoque le désir. Her head, however, could not be mentioned in comparison with her form, so free and so svelte, without a sign of embonpoint. She wore no corset, not even a brassière, to sustain her breast, which was low and flat. Lucien writes in his Mémoire that she had very little wit, and no trace of what could be called beauty, but there were certain creole characteristics in the pliant undulations of her figure, which was rather below the average height. Arnaud, in his souvenir, says that she had a charm which transcended the dazzling beauty of her two rivals, Mesdames Tallien and Ricamier. 
Madame de Rémusat describes her friend in these words. Without being precisely beautiful, her whole person was possessed of a peculiar charm. Her figure was perfect, every outline well-rounded and graceful, every motion easy and elegant. Her taste in dress was excellent. Her education had been rather neglected, but she knew wherein she was wanting and never betrayed her ignorance. Naturally tactful, she found it easy to say agreeable things. With all these qualities, the femme attracted Napoleon at their first meeting, while the dame impressed him by her air of dignity, as he put it. Ce maintien calme et noble de l'ancienne société française. The first call was quickly followed by another, and soon Bonaparte was a daily visitor at the little hotel. Events moved rapidly in those days, and two weeks after the first visit, Napoleon and Josephine were already on most intimate terms. On the 28th of October, she writes him, You no longer come to see a friend who loves you. You have entirely neglected her. You are very wrong, for she is tenderly attached to you. Come to breakfast with me tomorrow. I must see you and talk with you about your interests. Good night, my friend. I embrace you. Veuve Beauharnais. Henceforth, Napoleon follows Josephine everywhere. He accompanies her to, or meets her at, the houses that she frequents. He makes the acquaintance of Madame Tallien. As soon as the receptions begin at the Luxembourg, he joins her there. It is at this time that he writes her one of the first of his glowing love letters. I awake full of thoughts of thee. Thy image and the intoxicating evening of yesterday have left no repose to my senses. Sweet and incomparable Josephine, what strange effect do you have upon my heart? If thou art displeased, or sad, or uneasy, my soul is overcome with grief, and there is no rest for thy friend. But it is entirely different when yielding to the profound sentiment which masters me. I draw from thy lips, thy heart, a scorching flame. I shall see thee in three hours. In the meantime, my dear love, meo dolce amor, a million kisses, but do not give me any, for they set my blood on fire. On the 21st of January, anniversary of the execution of the last king of the French, Barras gives a large dinner. Among those present are Josephine and Theresia. Bonaparte's conversation is very animated, and he appears to interest the ladies greatly. After dinner they retire to one of the private salons, and the general sits on a sofa between Theresia and Josephine. The liaison seems to be generally recognized. It is impossible to state at what date Napoleon conceived the idea of transforming en mariage said bonne fortune, but it was probably when his appointment to Italy was practically decided upon, and he knew that they soon must be separated. For her part, Josephine hesitated for some weeks. In a letter to a friend, she admits that she does not love Napoleon, but adds that her feeling towards him is one of indifference rather than of dislike. She admires the general's courage, the vivacity of his mind, which enables him to grasp the thoughts of others almost before they have been expressed, but she is afraid of his domineering nature. She is also frightened by the force of his passion, which he expresses with an energy which leaves no room for doubt of his sincerity. Can she, a woman whose youth is past, hope to hold for any length of time this violent love which resembles a fit of delirium? Will he not later regret having failed to make a more advantageous marriage and reproach her with what he has done for her? Josephine consulted all of her society friends. They told her that Bonaparte had genius and would go far, that it was no secret that Carnot intended to give him the command of the army of Italy. Still, she hesitated. She was nearly thirty-three years of age, almost an old woman. But what else could she do? She knew how uncertain was the attachment of Barras, how little trust she could place in him. She was tempted to accept this chance, perhaps the last she would ever have, and link her fortune to that of this brilliant youth, so ardent and so passionate in his vows of eternal devotion. This unexpected opportunity— this union with Bonaparte, who was to make true for her all and more than all that she could ever have dreamed, Josephine was far from grasping at first. It was to be months and years before she fully realized her good fortune. Even after she understood what Napoleon meant to her, she never really appreciated the man. It was beyond her intelligence. 
she was fond of her position as the wife of the head of the state but did she ever love napoleon for himself on the twenty fourth february josephine finally made up her mind only eleven days before she had done the honours of the little house of barras at chaillot nevertheless she had precautions to take above all to conceal her age for she did not wish to admit the facts to this boy of twenty-six she placed the matter in the hands of her man of confidence calmelet who appeared before a notary and certified that he knew marie joseph taché widow of the citizen beauharnais that she was a native of the island of martinique in the windward islands and that at this moment it was impossible for him to procure her birth certificate on account of the actual occupation of the island by the british armed with this declaration josephine was able to state to the civil officer who performed the marriage that she was born on the twenty third of june seventeen sixty six while she was really born three years before the marriage contract was one of the most remarkable ever drawn up in france no details of the bride's property were given all that she possessed was to belong to the communauté which existed between her and the late monsieur de beauharnais for his part bonaparte did not hesitate to admit his lack of fortune he stated that he had nothing except his wardrobe and his war equipment upon which he placed a merely nominal value the contract was signed the eighth of march seventeen ninety six and the marriage took place the following day before a civil officer who graciously gave the groom twenty-eight years instead of twenty-six and the bride twenty-nine in place of thirty-two this mayor remarks a commentator had a mania for egalite the witnesses were le marois an aide-de-camp of the general who was a minor the inevitable calmelet tellien and barras no mention was made of the consent of the parents they had not been consulted two days later bonaparte was on his way to italy leaving his bride alone in the hotel chantraine heureusement on avait pris des avances sur la lune de miel six seventeen ninety six the victory festivals from this time on the life of josephine is so closely associated with that of napoleon that it is impossible to speak of her without mentioning him leaving paris on the eleventh of march seventeen ninety six forty-eight hours after his marriage bonaparte set out for italy accompanied only by his aide de camp berthier duroc junot marmont and murat and his paymaster general chauvet who carried with him forty-eight thousand francs in gold a small sum for the succor of an army which had long been destitute of everything en route napoleon stopped a night with the father of marmont at chatillon sur seine here he wrote josephine enclosing a power of attorney to enable her to collect some money which was due him on the fourteenth of march at six o'clock in the evening from the relay station at chanceau he dispatched his first long letter he wrote every moment carries me further away from you my dearest love and every instant finds me with less force to endure my separation from you you are the constant object of my thoughts and my imagination is exhausted in trying to conceive what you are doing if i think that you are sad my heart is torn and my grief intensified if you are gay playful with your friends i reproach you for having so soon forgotten the painful separation of three days as you see i am not easy to satisfy but my dear love it is very different if i fear that your health is altered or that you have reasons for grief then i regret the speed which carries me away from my heart if i am asked if i have slept well before replying i must have a courier to let me know that you have had a good night may my good angel who has always protected me in the midst of the greatest dangers surround and cover you and leave me exposed write me my dearest love and at length and receive the thousand and one kisses of the most devoted and most faithful of lovers at this time josephine was very far from reciprocating the love of her husband he adored her while she was only moderately touched by his passion his strange violent character inspired her with astonishment rather than with sympathy she was in her element in this brilliant but bizarre society of the directory which tried to imitate the former splendours of versailles she enjoyed the opening of the few salons where her grace and amiability caused her to be generally admired she gave but few thoughts to this young republican general to whom destiny had united her who seemed to her more of an eccentric than a genius 
napoleon turned from his route to pass two days with his mother at marseilles and hand her a letter from josephine his mother was not yet reconciled to his marriage and it was only after a hard struggle and a family council of war that madame letitia was finally persuaded to write a very formal and stilted letter of congratulation to her new daughter-in-law a week later the twenty ninth of march bonaparte arrived at nice and took command of the army of italy during the opening days of this marvellous campaign which was to render his name immortal napoleon was not so carried away with ambition as to be forgetful of his love before the first battle he wrote josephine from paul maurice on the third of april i have received all your letters but none of them has made such an impression on me as the last what can be your idea my adorable love to write me in such terms the sentiments that you express are like fire they consume my poor heart do you not think that my position is already critical enough without increasing my regrets and upsetting my spirit my only josephine away from you there is no joy far from you the world is a desert where i am alone you have taken away from me more than my soul you are the one thought of my life if i am weary with the burden of affairs if i fear the outcome if i am disgusted with men if i am ready to curse life i place my hand upon my heart your portrait beats there i regard it and love is for me absolute happiness all is gay except the space that i am separated from my love his whole soul in a state of ecstasy over the receipt of a few tender lines traced by the adored hand he continues by what art have you been able to captivate all my faculties to concentrate in yourself my moral existence to live for josephine is the whole aim of my life i strive to be near you i die to approach you fool i did not realize that i was separating myself from you how many lands how many countries lie between us how many days before you read these lines which are but feeble expressions of a troubled heart where you reign unfortunately the sunshine of love is never long without its clouds and bonaparte who was then in the seventh heaven of joy and confidence was soon to become suspicious and jealous although he did not as yet doubt either the love or the fidelity of his wife at times he was overcome with melancholy but this feeling was not of long duration the lover soon was lost in the man of action victory followed victory with amazing rapidity from the heights of monte zemolo the army suddenly saw at its feet the fertile plains of italy the promised land with its splendid cities its broad rivers its cultivated fields a shout of joy broke from the ranks the young general pointing to the scene of his coming triumphs cried hannibal scaled the alps we have turned them after the armistice of carrasco on the twenty eighth of april bonaparte thus summed up in a few ringing words the achievements of his army soldiers in two weeks you have gained six victories captured twenty-one flags fifty cannon several strong places and have conquered the richest part of piedmont you have made fifteen thousand prisoners and killed or wounded ten thousand men destitute of all you have supplied everything you have gained battles without cannon crossed rivers without bridges made forced marches without shoes often bivouacked without bread only republican phalanxes are capable of deeds so extraordinary thanks to you soldiers on the twenty fourth of april bonaparte sent his brother joseph and his aide-de-camp junot to paris joseph was the bearer of a letter to josephine in which her husband strongly urged her to rejoin him in italy junot carried the flags captured from the enemy to be presented to the directory in his memoir joseph tells the story of their journey they left in the same post chaise and reached paris in five days after their departure from nice en route they were everywhere received with the greatest enthusiasm at paris the directors expressed their satisfaction with the army and its commander murat who had been sent directly from carrasco with the papers of the armistice reached paris before joseph and junot josephine received from the three envoys the most circumstantial details of the success of her husband like napoleon she had passed in a few days from obscurity to glory for the first time she began to realize that she had not made a mistake in marrying the young hero of vendemiaire 
the moniteur of the tenth of may seventeen ninety six contains a report of the formal presentation of the flags to the directory by junot the future duc d'abrantes in her interesting memoir madame d'abrantes speaks of the impression created on this occasion by madame bonaparte and madame tallien who were present at that time she says madame bonaparte was still charming while madame tallien was in the full flower of her beauty she continues one may well believe that junot was not a little proud to escort these two charming women when they left at the end of the reception he offered his arm to madame bonaparte who as the wife of his general had the right to the first place especially on this occasion the other arm he gave to madame tallien and so descended with them the staircase of the luxembourg there was an immense crowd outside the palace and the people pushed and crowded to obtain a better view there were cheers for general bonaparte and for his charming wife who was acclaimed as notre dame des victoires the poet arnaud in his souvenir d'un sexagénaire recalls the profound impression made upon him so many years before by the loveliness of josephine on this occasion he compares her with her two competitors for the sceptre of venus madame tallien and madame Ricamier. beside these two rivals he says although she was not so brilliant or so fresh as they thanks to the regularity of her features the elegant souplesse of her figure the sweet expression of her countenance she also was beautiful i can still see them on this perfect may day as they entered the salon where the directors were to receive the flags each of them was attired in the toilette the best fitted to show off her particular advantages their heads were crowned with the most beautiful flowers one would have said that the three months of springtime had been reunited to fate the victory the same day that the flags were presented the tenth of may bonaparte gained the spectacular victory of lodi which made so vivid an impression on the popular imagination carrying a banner in his hand at the head of his grenadiers the young general led the charge across the long and narrow bridge upon which the fire of the enemy was concentrated from that time forth his soldiers believed him infallible and irresistible five days later he made his triumphal entry into milan the day after the battle of lodi salicetti the commissioner with the army wrote the directory citizen directors immortal glory to the army of italy gratitude to the wisely audacious chief who directs it the date of yesterday will be celebrated in the annals of history and of war when the republican column was formed general bonaparte rushed along the ranks his presence filled the soldiers with enthusiasm he was received with cries a thousand times repeated of vive la république he ordered the drums to beat the charge and the troops with the rapidity of lightning rushed upon the bridge to celebrate the new triumphs the directory organized a fete half patriotic half mythological which was celebrated on the champ de mars the twenty ninth of may at ten o'clock in the morning a salvo of artillery announced the beginning of the ceremonies the national guard of paris was present under arms carnot the president of the directory delivered the oration which was in the nature of a martial rhapsody he ended his discourse with a glowing tribute to the armies of the republic and their valiant chiefs after the fete the people danced on the champ de mars until nightfall and a grand dinner was given in the evening seven seventeen ninety six to seventeen ninety seven josephine in italy on sunday the fifteenth of may seventeen ninety six bonaparte made his entry into milan through streets lined by the national guard commanded by the duc de serbaloni when the general arrived at the porta romana the soldiers presented arms preceded by a large detachment of infantry and surrounded by his guard of cavalry he proceeded to the archducal palace where he took up his residence in the evening there was a large dinner given in his honour followed by a brilliant ball but in the midst of his triumphs bonaparte was far from happy his adored wife failed to respond to his letters praying her to join him in italy and he had just received news of the proposal of the directory to divide his forces giving the northern army to kellerman while he was to be sent with the balance of the troops to conquer the southern part of the peninsula he immediately wrote to the directory that he considered it most unwise to divide the army of italy into two parts and against the best interests of the republic to have two different generals the majority of the directory accepted his view of the situation and the order was at once cancelled 
bonaparte found it more difficult however to overcome the resistance of his wife josephine was more interested in enjoying at paris the triumphs of her husband than in going to join him at milan she was perfectly happy in her life at home and had no desire to leave her children and her friends she loved the theatres the manners of the ancien regime which were beginning to reappear and the receptions at the luxembourg where she was treated like a queen it certainly was not customary since the beginning of the wars of the republic to see the wives of the generals accompany the armies and it was too much to demand of the creole nature of josephine that she should rush to italy at the first call of her husband and expose herself to the fatigues and dangers of a great war but napoleon could not understand her hesitation he wrote her letter after letter each one more burning and more pressing than the one before murat who carried to paris the papers of the armistice was also the bearer of a letter to josephine urging her to rejoin him this letter which she did not hesitate to show to her friends was characterized by the most violent passion not entirely free from jealousy arnaud writes i can still hear her reading a passage in which her husband cries what are you doing why do you not come to me if it is a lover who detains you beware of the poignard of othello and josephine smiling with amusement at his exalted sentiments says with her funny creole accent il est drôle bonaparte in his life of napoleon sir walter scott writes that the correspondence of bonaparte with josephine reveals the curious character of a man as ardent in love as in war the language of the conqueror who disposed of states according to his good pleasure and beat the most celebrated generals of his time is as enthusiastic as that of an arcadian shepherd the statements of the great english writer are certainly borne out by the tone of the long passionate and eloquent letter which napoleon wrote josephine on the fifteenth of june seventeen ninety six from tortona it was dispatched by a special courier who had orders to remain only four hours in paris and to bring back her answer josephine could not resist this final touching appeal and she decided although with great regret to leave for italy her friend arnaud in his interesting memoirs gives us a curious insight of the feelings of josephine at this time he says that the love which she inspired in a man so extraordinary as bonaparte evidently flattered her although she took the matter much less seriously than he she was proud to see that he loved her almost as much as his glory she enjoyed this fame which increased from day to day but she wished to enjoy it at paris in the midst of the acclamations which hailed her appearance on the receipt of each new bulletin from the army of italy her chagrin was great when she saw that there was no chance for further hesitation she would not have exchanged her little hotel in the rue chantraine for the palace prepared for her reception at milan in fact for all the palaces in the world it was from the luxembourg that she finally set out for italy after having supped there with a few friends poor woman says arnaud she broke out in tears and sobbed as if she were going to the scaffold she was going to reign josephine arrived at milan the ninth of july seventeen ninety six escorted by her brother-in-law joseph by napoleon's aide-de-camp junot and by a young officer on the staff of general leclerc named hippolyte charles whom we shall encounter later on in close connection with josephine bonaparte who had not expected so prompt a response to his last appeal was absent on a tour of the principal cities of northern italy the first day of july he paid a visit to the grand duke ferdinand at florence from there he went to bologna and verona and did not reach milan until the middle of the month what a change in the situation of bonaparte in the four short months since he parted from josephine at paris in order not to excite the jealousy of the directory he had abandoned the archducal palace but was lodged in almost regal state in the serboloni palace on the corso venezia a few squares behind the cathedral the serboloni is far handsomer than the royal palace and perhaps the most beautiful of all the palaces of milan since the opening of the campaign in april his troops had overrun nearly all of northern italy piedmont delivered from the yoke of austria had made peace with france and the remainder of the imperial army was blockaded at mantua he had treated as an equal with the king of sardinia the pope the duke of modena and the grand duke of tuscany all of whom owed to his generosity their political existence genoa and venice rome and naples had all withdrawn from the coalition the great cities of northern italy had surrendered their most celebrated works of art to enrich the collections of the louvre 
millions of francs had been levied on the different states part of which had supplied his army while the balance had been transmitted to paris to fill the empty coffers of the directory what wonder that the name of bonaparte was everywhere acclaimed josephine passed the summer at milan except for a short visit to headquarters before the battle of castiglione having resumed the siege of mantua after his victory napoleon went to milan where he spent only twenty-four hours with his wife before rejoining his troops while bonaparte was gaining his victories josephine was bored to death in italy the feeling of sadness which oppressed her is shown in a letter which she wrote at this time to her aunt madame renaudin who had finally married her old lover the marquis de beauharnais the duc de serbelloni who was going to paris was charged with the delivery of this epistle which ran as follows m serbelloni will tell you my dear aunt of the manner in which i have been received in italy all the princes have given me fete even the grand duke of tuscany the brother of the emperor well i prefer to be a simple private individual in france i do not care for the honours of this country i am much bored it is true that my health contributes much to make me sad i am often indisposed if good fortune could assure good health i ought to be well i have the most amiable husband that a woman could hope for i have no chance to desire anything my wishes are his all day long he is in a position of adoration before me as if i were a divinity i could not have a better husband he often writes my children of whom he is very fond he is sending hortense by m serbelloni a beautiful enamelled repeating watch to a jeanne a handsome gold watch comparatively few of the letters of josephine have been preserved for us and this one is particularly interesting because it displays more appreciation of her husband's devotion than we should expect to find ten days after the battle of arcoli on the twenty seventh of november napoleon returned to milan where he expected to find josephine great was his surprise and disappointment to learn that she had accepted an invitation from genoa to pay a visit to the city there she was given a magnificent reception by the citizens who were favourable to the french on learning of napoleon's arrival josephine returned at once to milan where they spent the month of december together at the serbelloni palace it was really their lune de miel the first time that they had been united for more than a few hours since their marriage nine months before la valette who had then just been appointed one of bonaparte's aides de camp gives us in his memoirs an interesting picture of this kind of military court he says the general-in-chief was then in all the intoxication of his marriage madame bonaparte was charming and all the cares of his command all the tasks of the government of italy did not prevent her husband from fully enjoying his domestic happiness it was during this short sojourn at milan that the young painter gros made the first portrait that we have of the general he represents him upon the bridge of lodi at the moment that he sees the flag and called upon the troops to follow him the artist could not obtain time for a sitting so madame bonaparte took her husband upon her knees after dejeuner and kept him there for several minutes i was present at three of these sittings the age of the young couple the modesty of the painter and his enthusiasm for the hero excuse this familiarity with the beginning of the new year austria resumed hostilities and bonaparte left milan to take command of his army on the fourteenth of january he won the brilliant victory of rivoli and two days later that of la favorita which settled the fate of mantua without waiting to receive the surrender of the fortress he proceeded to tolentino where on the nineteenth of february he concluded a treaty with the pope two months later at leoben he signed the preliminary articles of peace with austria which marked the end of the great campaign of italy during his absence from josephine napoleon as usual wrote her nearly every day madame de rimusat who is always reluctant to admit that napoleon was ever more controlled by his heart than by his head is nevertheless struck by the passion revealed in every line of this correspondence in her memoirs she says i have seen the letters of napoleon to madame bonaparte at the time of the first campaign of italy these letters are very singular a writing almost illegible a faulty spelling a style bizarre and confused but withal a tone so passionate sentiment so strong expression so animated and at the same time so poetic a love so apart from all other loves that there is no woman who would not prize having received such letters 
as milan is one of the hottest places in italy during his second summer napoleon resided at the magnificent chateau of montebello or mombello which is situated on the old como road a few miles from the city it was then a great country villa sitting far back from the high road in a large park with cool shady avenues pretty fountains and all the exquisite loveliness of an italian retreat from the broad high terrace that ran around the front and the sides of the chateau the alps could be seen on one side and the beautiful spires of the milan cathedral on the other here most of the bonaparte family were reunited for the first time since they left corsica four years before madame bonaparte came to secure napoleon's approval of the marriage of his eldest sister elisa to felix bacchiocci which had been celebrated at marseilles the first of may and to persuade him to furnish a dot napoleon finally yielded to his mother's wishes and at the same time informed her of a marriage which he had arranged between general leclerc and his sister pauline the marriage was celebrated on the fourteenth of june with both civil and religious forms by the express orders of napoleon and the civil union of bacchiocci and elisa was blessed by the church at the same time this family meeting was not prolonged after a visit of two weeks madame letitia left for corsica accompanied by elisa and her husband at the same time joseph set out for rome where he had just made minister taking with him his wife and his youngest sister caroline jerome was sent back to college at paris and pauline remained in italy with leclerc who had been named chief of staff in the army the three months which napoleon and josephine passed at montebello were perhaps the happiest of their lives the conqueror of italy lived in regal style surrounded by his military court the attention of europe was more drawn to this chateau than to all the palaces of the emperors and kings at milan as later at paris josephine admirably served the interests of her husband by her antecedents her relations her character she formed a connecting link between him and the old aristocracy without her by his own admission made later on he never could have had any natural rapport with the old regime the salon of the former vicomtesse de beauharnais recalled the traditions of the most brilliant circles of the faubourg st germain josephine received the noble families of milan with an exquisite grace and there reigned a kind of etiquette which contrasted in a singular manner with the democratic air affected by the general on the eighteenth of august napoleon and josephine made a short excursion to lake maggiore accompanied by berti and Mio. immediately upon their return they set out for udine where napoleon was to meet the austrian plenipotentiaries on the twenty seventh of august they arrived at passeriano where they took up their residence in a chateau still in existence which had formerly belonged to a doge of venice it was a fine country residence situated upon the left bank of the tagliamento about ten miles from udine the peace negotiations had dragged along through the summer and far into the autumn of seventeen ninety seven mainly owing to the hope of the emperor that events in france might turn to his advantage the coup d'etat of the eighteen fructidor fourth of september had destroyed the last hope of the royalists and bonaparte's victorious army was still in venetia ready to march on vienna so nothing remained except to conclude peace the final treaty was signed on the seventeenth of october it bore the name of the peace of campo formio from a village situated halfway between passeriano and udine on the second day of november napoleon and josephine were again back at milan leaving his wife there bonaparte started two weeks later for rastatt travelling by way of geneva where he stopped for a day he was accompanied by his aide-de-camp duroc lavalette and marmont his secretary bourrienne and his physician Ivan on the twenty fifth of november bonaparte reached rastadt where he remained only long enough to exchange with the austrian plenipotentiaries the ratification of the treaty of campo formio and then left for paris he arrived home on the fifth of december and took up his residence in the little hotel in the rue chantraine from which he had set out twenty-one months before an obscure man to which he returned as a celebrity on the twenty ninth of december by decree of the department of the seine the rue chantraine was changed in his honor to rue de la victoire end of chapters five through seven chapters eight nine and ten of napoleon and josephine 
the rise of the empire by walter gear this librivox recording is in the public domain eight seventeen ninety eight to seventeen ninety nine the purchase of malmaison josephine finally reached paris upon the second day of january she took nearly six weeks for the journey and did not seem to be in as great haste as she claimed in her letters to leave that tiresome italy and see her beloved daughter again after a visit to turin she crossed Montseny in terrible weather and stopped several days at lyon the fete to bonaparte planned by talleyrand had to be put off from day to day as the general wished his wife to be present aside from the necessary calls on the directors and ministers during the month after his return napoleon made only a few appearances in public on the tenth december he attended the fete given in his honour by the directors of the luxembourg another evening he was present during one act of a play at the francais the rest of the time he deliberately stayed at home and refused to receive the applause of the people which greeted him on every appearance the day after the arrival of josephine it was necessary for him to issue from his retirement to attend the fete arranged by talleyrand the minister of foreign affairs then occupied the luxurious hotel galifet in the rue du bac which had been splendidly decorated for the occasion at half-past ten bonaparte appeared in civilian costume accompanied by his wife who wore a greek tunic with cameos in her hair somewhat embarrassed by the ovation he received napoleon took the arm of arnaud and made the tour of the salons it was during this promenade that madame de stal forced herself upon his attention and received in answer to her impertinent questions the celebrated reply which was to make of her his lifelong enemy general she said as soon as she had met him what woman do you love best my wife naturally but whom do you esteem most that one who is the best housekeeper very true but who do you think is the first among women madame the one who bears the most children there is little wonder that the conceited madame de stal did not love napoleon after this brief passage at arms during the supper bonaparte was seated beside his wife to whom he was most attentive at one o'clock they left the ball on her return from italy josephine had settled again in her little hotel of the rue de la victoire upon which she had ordered extensive alterations made at a cost of over one hundred thousand francs although at the time she still had only a lease however on the last day of march bonaparte purchased the property for the sum of fifty two thousand francs the house was soon full to overflowing with the many rare paintings and objets d'art which josephine had shipped from italy this was the beginning of the immense collection which later entirely filled her chateau of malmaison in october before his return from italy bonaparte had been appointed general-in-chief of the army of england on february fourth he left paris for a twelve days tour of inspection of the channel ports from calais to astende on his return he reported to the directory that the proposed invasion of england was a most dangerous and difficult undertaking and as an alternative plan suggested an eastern expedition which would menace the british trade with the indies he had little difficulty in obtaining the consent of the directory to the new plan and on the fourth of march the government formally approved of the expedition to egypt all the familiars of josephine stood in the greatest awe of napoleon but the moment he was absent the house was filled with the friends of the mistress of the mansion as soon as bonaparte left for his tour of the channel ports josephine seems to have renewed her intimacy with Paras. there is certainly ground for suspicion in the note that she hastily scribbled to the secretary of the director on the unexpected return of her husband bonaparte arrived to-night i beg you my dear Botteau, to assure Barras of my regret that i cannot go to dinner with him tell him not to forget me you know better than any one my position it was a notorious fact that most of the generals of the republic had not returned to paris with empty hands but bonaparte pretended that he was different from the others later at st helena he claimed that on his return from italy his fortune did not exceed three hundred thousand francs but it seems probable that he had nearer three millions in addition he had his salary of forty thousand francs as general-in-chief and seven thousand francs a month while head of the french legation at rastadt during his absence in the east he left his funds in the hands of joseph as a common purse for the family and it is well known that the bonapartes did not suffer for lack of money while he was away 
it is very possible that in his recollections napoleon omitted a zero from his calculations on the third may seventeen ninety eight napoleon and josephine after dining informally with barras at the luxembourg went to the théâtre francais to see talma in macbeth that evening the conqueror of italy was greeted with the same enthusiasm as during the first days of his return after the play they went home and at midnight set out for toulon besides josephine napoleon had in the carriage with him his secretary bourrienne and his aide-de-camp eugene duroc and la valette to escape the vigilance of the english spies napoleon had kept his plans entirely secret and even forbade josephine to go to st germain to say adieu to hortense upon their arrival at toulon bonaparte informed josephine for the first time that he did not intend to take her with him as he did not wish to expose her to the dangers and fatigues of the voyage and the severity of the climate in vain she pleaded that the voyage had no terrors for her after three trips across the atlantic and that the heat of egypt could not affect a creole to console her bonaparte finally promised that as soon as he was well established in egypt at the end of two months he would send for her the frigate pomone under the convoy of which she had made her first voyage from martinique to france bonaparte knew that there was no time to be lost in setting sail but the expedition was detained ten days by contrary winds although he was not then aware of the fact on the second day of may nelson had been detached from the fleet that was blockading cadiz to go in search of information regarding the preparations at toulon he arrived off that port on the seventeenth may but was driven back by an adverse wind and was not able to return until ten days after the departure of the french expedition never was fortune more favourable to napoleon if the french fleet had encountered nelson at any time during the long voyage of six weeks it had not more than one chance in a hundred of escaping absolute destruction the adieux of bonaparte and josephine were very tender the signal for departure was given and before a strong northwest wind the fleet moved out of the port bonaparte was on the orient a vessel of one hundred and twenty guns and from a balcony josephine with a glass followed her husband as long as the ship was in sight after the departure of the expedition josephine did not return directly to paris but went to plombieres in the vosges to take the waters while there she met with a serious accident a wooden balcony upon which she was standing with several friends gave way under them and she fell fourteen feet to the pavement below fortunately no bones were broken but she was painfully bruised hortense was sent for at the school of madame campan and nursed her mother during the convalescence no sovereign was ever better cared for barras received the bulletins of her health drawn up by the resident physicians all the authorities of the department called musicians brought from epinal gave her serenades her rooms were filled with rare flowers at plombieres she received the first news of the expedition from the capture of malta to the occupation of cairo she also learned from bonaparte's letters that she must give up the idea of sailing to rejoin him the fleet of nelson was in full command of the mediterranean and all the french ports were closed the frigate upon which she was to have sailed had been captured by an english cruiser in leaving toulon the last of august josephine was back in paris at this time she arranged to purchase the estate of malmaison the price is generally stated to have been one hundred sixty thousand francs paid in part with her dot and in part with the resources of her husband as a matter of fact the deed which was passed before a notary of paris the twenty first of april seventeen ninety nine shows that the price agreed upon was two hundred twenty five thousand francs with thirty seven thousand five hundred francs additional for the furniture and over nine thousand francs for the recording fee josephine only paid down in cash the amount of the furniture thirty seven thousand five hundred francs with the avails of diamonds and jewellery belonging to her the balance was left unsettled from the funds deposited by napoleon with joseph was drawn the money to pay for the princely estates bought about the same time by other members of the family in italy lucien purchased of a roman princess an estate bringing in a revenue of four thousand francs a year at paris a hotel corner of the rue du mont blanc and de la victoire near villers cotteret a fine chateau which with the farm of souci brought in over seventeen thousand francs a year joseph also acquired at paris a new hotel which cost him at the outset over one hundred thousand francs 
and near saint lys the magnificent estate of mortefontaine with a vast park and one of the finest english gardens in europe for which he paid two hundred fifty eight thousand francs as the place had been much neglected during the revolution he was obliged to spend in its restoration another quarter of a million the first year truly the modest three hundred thousand francs brought back from italy by napoleon went a long way at the same time josephine had much difficulty in obtaining from joseph the payment of the small allowance of forty thousand francs fixed by napoleon and was very indignant over the way in which he disbursed her husband's money with her magnificent jewels her priceless paintings and objets d'art she was actually short of money to meet her current bills in acting as he did joseph may have gone beyond his brother's orders but the conduct of josephine since her return from plombieres had been anything but exemplary she was again on very intimate terms with Paras, and her liaison with hippolyte charles which had begun at milan was a matter of public notoriety at malmaison this young officer ruled almost as lord and master did josephine think like many others that bonaparte would never return from the orient or did she imagine that egypt was so far away that he would never hear of her conduct if so she was mistaken in both suppositions he was to return to give her a very mauvais quart d'heure and the reports were to reach him in egypt through an indiscretion on the part of junot both bourrienne and madame junot have given us a vivid picture of napoleon's rage and despair on this occasion he cried i would give all the world to know that junot's tale is false so much do i love josephine but if she is really guilty a divorce must separate us for ever i will not submit to be the laughing-stock of all the imbeciles of paris i will write joseph to have the divorce declared it is absurd to claim as many historians have done that napoleon at the time of his marriage was ignorant of josephine's past life he certainly must have known of her relations with Paras, at least but the past did not concern him all that he asked was for fidelity in the future the nobleness of his character and his understanding of the situation are clearly shown in the letter he wrote her from milan eleventh of june seventeen ninety six everything pleased me even the remembrance of your errors and of the afflicting scene which took place two weeks before our marriage his rights over her heart and mind only date from the hour that she accepted his love and freely gave him her hand the past no longer counts but from that moment she belongs to him and if she deceives him all is over if josephine had been true to him without doubt napoleon would have remained faithful in egypt as he had been in italy at cairo the favorite rendezvous of the officers was a garden modelled upon the tivoli at paris which was kept by an old school friend of bonaparte at brienne here napoleon met a very pretty young woman with blonde hair a dazzling complexion and beautiful teeth her name was marguerite pauline belle and she was an apprentice to a modiste at carcassonne when she married a young lieutenant in the chasseur a cheval named Fourez in the midst of their honeymoon came the command to embark for egypt with stringent orders that no wives were to accompany the expedition like several other devoted wives the young woman donned one of her husband's uniforms and sailed on the same ship with him either from virtue or calculation madame forez did not yield to the first attack it required declarations letters handsome presents finally all was arranged in the middle of december forez received orders to leave for france this time alone as bearer of letters to the directory a mansion was hastily furnished near the general's palace and the young lady installed there unfortunately for the peace of the new menage the vessel upon which forez took passage was captured by the english who were well informed regarding events at cairo and were malicious enough to send him back to egypt he rushed to cairo and made a scene with his wife who promptly secured a divorce napoleon seems to have become very much in love with the little belle or bellilotte as she became known and went so far as to offer to marry her after divorcing josephine provided she gave him a child mais quoi le petit sot n'en sait pas avoir he said with humour when he returned to france he arranged to have her follow him but she in turn was captured by the english when she finally reached paris it was too late napoleon was reconciled with josephine 
and the coup d'etat of the eighteen brumaires had made him master of france the consul refused to see her but made her a handsome allowance she was afterwards married again separated from her husband and lived to the good old age of ninety-two years dying in march eighteen sixty nine during the last year of the second empire nine seventeen ninety nine the return of bonaparte at midnight on thursday the twenty second august seventeen ninety nine bonaparte embarked at alexandria on the frigate muron which with three other smaller ships set sail at five o'clock in the morning he was accompanied by murat and lannes both recently wounded as well as by berthier bessieres duroc lavalette and marmont he also took with him eugene de beauharnais and his secretary bourrienne he had the same good fortune as on his outward voyage the english fleet had gone to cyprus for repairs and he slipped out unmolested contrary winds forced the little fleet to hug the african coast and they only made three hundred miles in twenty days the english ships cruising between sicily and cap bon were eluded then the wind changed and better progress was made after a voyage of forty days bonaparte entered the port of ajaccio on the first of october here he was detained for a week by adverse winds finally on the seventh october he sailed for france it was his last visit to his native island at noon on the ninth of october napoleon landed at Fréjus and at six o'clock started for paris his journey was one long ovation at every city through which he passed he was received with transports of enthusiasm after a stop of half a day at lyon where he attended the theatre at midnight he again set out travelling in a post-chaise at great speed not stopping by night or day he reached paris at six o'clock in the morning of the sixteenth of october and went directly to his hotel in the rue de la victoire where as upon his return from italy he found no one to receive him josephine was dining at the luxembourg with goyer the president of the directory when the news was received of the unexpected landing of bonaparte at Fréjus. she had almost forgotten that he existed and seemed to think that he would never return but there was no time now for hesitation she immediately set out to meet her husband and tell her story before he had a chance to see his brothers she naturally took the usual route by dijon and macon but napoleon was travelling by way of the bourbonnais and she did not meet him on her return to paris a few days later bonaparte locked his door and refused to see her his brothers had taken advantage of her absence to tell napoleon the story of her conduct and he was fully resolved upon a divorce for a whole day she knocked in vain and cried and sobbed before the closed door finally at the suggestion of her maid she sent for eugene and hortense who joined their supplications to those of their mother the door at last was unlocked and bonaparte appeared with open arms his eyes wet with tears his face convulsed with the long and terrible struggle which he had had with his heart when his brothers appeared the next morning they found that all had been forgiven and forgotten notwithstanding all of josephine's indiscretions napoleon was wise to abandon the idea of a divorce which would have interfered seriously with his plans he did well to disregard the advice of his family who had always disapproved of his marriage and done their best to bring about a rupture during his absence in spite of his orders to josephine not to mingle in public affairs she had manoeuvred like a skilled diplomatist and had well prepared the way for his return although her relations with barras had now ceased she was on very cordial terms with her former admirer as well as with goyer the new president of the directory her salon was also frequented by talleyrand fouché cambacérès and many others whose support was essential to the success of his plans it is possible that without the assistance of josephine napoleon might never have become emperor when napoleon pardoned josephine it was in no half-hearted way it was a pardon generous and complete an entire wiping out of all her errors he had the remarkable faculty when his confidence was renewed of no longer remembering of suppressing in his marvellous memory all recollections of faults which he did not wish to punish not only did he forgive his wife but a virtue even rarer he disdained to punish her guilty accomplices and never stood in the way of their advancement in life 
he was equally generous in the payment of the enormous debts contracted by Josephine during his absence. He gave her the money to complete the purchase of Malmaison, and settled with the decorators their account of over a million francs, which, after careful scrutiny of the bills, he reduced by one half for overcharges and articles not actually furnished. On the 12th November, he also paid over a million francs for the national property in the department of the Dial, which she had contracted to purchase. Five years later, this estate was to furnish the dot for Adèle, the natural daughter of Alexandre de Beauharnais, when Josephine arranged her marriage with a captain, Le Comte. A husband willing to pardon his wife's infidelity, and at the same time pay over two millions of her debts, is one not often found, and if Josephine was incapable of fully appreciating such generosity, she, at any rate, up to the time of her divorce, gave no further grounds for public scandal. In her own words, she was too much afraid of losing her position. During the weeks of preparation for the coup d'état of the 18 Brumaire, 9th November, Josephine played an important role. In spite of all the precautions that were taken, it was impossible to prevent rumors from reaching the ears of the three directors who were not in the plot. Barras received warnings, also Goyer and Moulin, but they all ignored the reports. In order to keep Goyer out of the way on the critical day, Bonaparte took advantage of his admiration for Josephine to have his wife invite the director to déjeuner. At midnight on the 17 Brumaire, she wrote a short note and sent it by Eugène to the Luxembourg. Will not you and your wife, my dear Goyer, come to breakfast with me tomorrow morning at eight o'clock? Do not fail, for there are some very interesting matters which I would like to talk over with you. Adieu, my dear Goyer. Believe me always, your sincere friend, La Pagerie Bonaparte. But Goyer was alarmed over an invitation for so early an hour in the morning, and remained home sending his wife in his place. While the stirring events of the morning were taking place, Josephine used all of her charm to keep Madame Goyer at her house. The wife of the director finally succeeded in making her escape, and with some difficulty reached the Luxembourg through the streets thronged with spectators and encumbered by the movements of the troops. As a profound secret, Josephine had informed her visitor of the intention of Talleyrand to see Barras and demand his resignation. This information led Goyer to think that only Barras was to be eliminated, and from that moment he made no further efforts to oppose the plans of the conspirators. So this little plot did not entirely fail. Late in the evening Bonaparte returned from the Tuileries to the Rue de la Victoire and gave Josephine a full account of the events of the day. The night passed quietly. Lannes guarded the Tuileries and Moreau the Luxembourg. The troops occupied all the strategic points of the capital. The theatres were crowded, as usual. Without, the rain fell in torrents and the streets were practically deserted. On Sunday morning, the 19 Brumaire, the air was clear and cool after the storm of the night before. At dawn, the troops began their march from Paris to Saint-Cloud, where the councils were to meet at midday. The Army of Generals gathered at Bonaparte's house to receive his final orders. He soon appeared upon the steps of the hotel in his uniform of general, wearing the little hat which was already legendary. Entering his carriage with his aide-de-camp, he set out for Saint-Cloud, escorted by a small detachment of cavalry. The day was long and tiresome, and for many hours the result was in doubt. It finally ended in the dissolution of the directory and the appointment of three temporary consuls, Bonaparte, Sieyès, and Ducot. It was after midnight before all the legislative work was finished and the new consuls took their oath of office. At three in the morning, writes Bourrienne, I accompanied Bonaparte in his carriage to Paris. Extremely fatigued after so many trials and absorbed in his reflections, he did not utter a single word during the journey. Back in the little house in the Rue de la Victoire, he kissed Josephine, who was in bed, and told her all the incidents of the day. Then he rested for a few hours and woke up in the morning the master of Paris and of France. The day following the 19 Brumaire, the 11th November by our calendar, was a décadie, or Republican day of rest. At ten o'clock in the morning, Bonaparte, dressed in civilian costume, left his house and, in a carriage escorted only by six dragoons, proceeded to the Luxembourg to join his two colleagues and set the new government in operation. 
during the course of the day josephine also left the little hotel in the rue de la victoire and moved across the seine in all but name the little creole was now sovereign of france ten eighteen hundred the consular court at the petit luxembourg napoleon occupied the former apartment of moulin on the ground floor on the right as you enter from the rue vaugirard his cabinet was near a private staircase which led to the first floor where josephine was installed in the old quarters of goyer the dinner was served at five o'clock and the table was always set for twenty persons josephine did the honours with her usual grace if bonaparte was tired or absorbed and refused to talk no one felt neglected since the rude shock which she had received on the return of bonaparte josephine had conducted herself with so much tact that she had entirely regained her former place in his esteem she was no longer loved with the same blind devotion but she had become a very important element in the new consular court by nature and by experience she was admirably adapted to serve her husband's interests in rallying all parties and all factions to the support of the new government the nobles of the old regime who had frequented the hotel in the rue chantraine such as coulincourt just de noailles and ségur began to encounter in her salon at the luxembourg men of the revolution like monge réal and cambacérès no one was received except upon a written invitation and formal notice was served by bonaparte that the dress or rather undress of the ladies who frequented the court of the directory would no longer be tolerated in the moniteur appeared a report worded as follows during the month of december past there was a large assembly at the luxembourg when every one was in the reception room bonaparte ordered the servants to make a large fire he even repeated this order two or three times when some one made the remark that it was impossible to put more wood in the fireplace he said that will do i wanted a good fire because the cold is excessive and these ladies are nearly nude advice to readers decency is the order of the day and decency in dress would bring in its train decency in morals for their trips to malmaison as for every other function in life josephine has the rare faculty of being always ready and ever submissive to her husband's orders her hours of rest of meals of every kind are arranged so as not to interfere with his work as soon as his task is finished josephine is always ready at any hour of day or night to eat to go out to start on a journey without previous notice in a costume which becomes her and is suitable for the occasion she has constantly on her lips the same smile which always seems natural and never forced her voice is ever soft and soothing with her pretty creole accent which pleases the ear and is like the caressing touch of a loving hand to this man of thirty years who has never known a home who has always lived in an inn or a tent she gives the delightful experience of a well-ordered and luxurious household a touch of domestic life at this time josephine has no official role to play she has no recognized place in the state she is present on occasions of ceremony only as a distinguished guest who looks on from window or balcony she makes a point of seeming to exercise no influence over her husband except in deeds of good will this is the real secret of her power and she knows it the day that she even attempted to direct his actions her power would be lost bonaparte would tolerate no pompadour no marie antoinette at his side as for the rest he cares little she can have all the money she wants to pay for her toilettes and her jewels to settle her old debts but political influence never her indirect power in the form of charity and social duties receives his entire approbation as it is directed to the same object which he himself is striving to attain in all her sentiments josephine is a royalist both from natural inclination and from reasons purely personal to herself she has the most tender attachment to the name of the king and the ancien regime the reason is not hard to find if bonaparte plays the role of monk and recalls the bourbons he will have at least the title of duke and peer the dignity of marshal or constable of france a great position at court and she will have the assurance of sharing his fortune and of never being repudiated indeed remarks one of her historians how in seventeen ninety nine only seven years after the fall of the throne could josephine have any other ideas what was there greater in ancient france after the king 
and no one then thought that he could become king because one does not become king what was there greater than duke and peer marechal de france what was there higher than these dignities to which in the most dizzy dream of ambition a private individual could aspire she does not suspect she cannot imagine that this new society demands a new form of government that the man who is to accomplish this task has appeared on the scene and that that man is her husband bonaparte is by no means displeased with the royalist sympathies of his wife he wishes to gain time in his negotiations with the rebels in the vendee to endeavour to rally them to his cause and enlist them in his armies for this reason he does not wish to break too abruptly with the pretender who has already made advances to him he knows that the emigres are only too anxious to return to france and recover at least a part of their property josephine is practically the retained advocate of the royalists and the emigres and the favours which she solicits and is accorded one by one are not calculated to excite the alarm of the purchasers of the national property or arouse the wrath of the jacobins little by little this immense social force lost for the france of the revolution will flow back from every part of europe towards the france of the consulate and bring back with the habits of courtesy and elegance administrators for the departments magistrates for the superior courts diplomats for the legations officers for the troops causeurs for the salons personages for the court bonaparte feels that the glory of the past represented by illustrious names is necessary to the splendour of the future and to create a france worthy of the destiny which he prepares for her he has need of all her children without in the least suspecting the fact josephine thus played a most important role in that policy of fusion which was one of the greatest principles of napoleon's administration and one which specially characterized it on the twentieth january eighteen hundred at mortefontaine was celebrated the marriage by civil forms only of caroline bonaparte and joachim murat according to madame recamier caroline although not so beautiful as her sister pauline was very attractive she strongly possessed the napoleonic type of countenance and had much intelligence and a strong will murat who at that time was only a general of division was the most striking cavalier in the french army young handsome full of life with his brilliant uniforms on the field of battle or in a review he attracted universal attention napoleon at first was very much opposed to the match when murat was sent to paris after the armistice of carrasco he was too attentive to the wife of his general-in-chief and boasted rather indiscreetly of his bonne fortune later he fell in love with caroline during her visit to milan and was accepted by her to secure the consent of napoleon they solicited the good offices of josephine what better means of convincing bonaparte that if josephine had ever favoured murat's suit all was now over josephine warmly espoused his cause with the double object of putting an end to napoleon's suspicions and of securing in murat a strong ally in her constant struggle against the enmity of the bonapartes on the occasion of her marriage caroline received from her brothers a dot of forty thousand francs the same amount that they had given to pauline in addition she had a trousseau and presents of the value of twelve thousand francs nearly all the members of the family were present at the ceremony but no mention can be found of the first consul and his wife the young couple took up their residence in the hotel de brionne near the tuileries and continued to be on the warmest terms of intimacy with josephine after living for three months at the luxembourg on the nineteenth of february eighteen hundred napoleon moved to the tuileries which became his principal place of residence during the consulate and the empire he occupied the suite of louis the fourteenth on the first floor facing on the gardens while josephine lived below him on the ground floor in the former apartment of marie antoinette as at the luxembourg life at the tuileries at first was very simple it was too soon for the appointment of chamberlains and ladies of the palace on the day of the formal entrance of the first consul to the tuileries josephine who had preceded him in a private carriage was modestly placed in a window of the pavillon de flore to view the ceremony but two days later when bonaparte received the diplomatic corps she had all of the members presented to her and held a court which recalled that of the queen's during the early days it was not easy to constitute a new society at the tuileries bonaparte himself had had no experience in the world 
having passed all his time in the army he had but few acquaintances at paris and found it necessary constantly to call upon his colleague lebrun for information regarding persons and things there would also have been a great outcry from the republicans if he had immediately received the personages of the ancien regime the royalists and the emigres these persons at first affected to draw a line between the first consul and his wife while they did not mount the steps to the apartment of bonaparte on the first floor they filled the rooms of the former vicomtesse de beauharnais on the floor below each decade the first consul gave in the galerie de diane a grand dinner with two hundred couverts as the russian princesse dolgoruki wrote at this time it was not exactly a court but it was no longer a camp as often as he could lay down the cares of office generally three or four times a month bonaparte went to malmaison for a day's rest this estate purchased by josephine during his absence in egypt had become his favorite place of recreation the chateau was situated in a fine location near the village of Rey on the left bank of the seine about nine miles from paris the building which has recently been restored and presented to the state as a museum of napoleonic souvenirs consisted then as now of three stories with a plain facade and a tile roof on the ground floor at the left of the large vestibule were the dining-room the council chamber and the library in the other wing the billiard-room the boudoir the salon of josephine and the gallery from the library there was access to the garden by a little bridge thrown across the moat which runs along this side of the chateau from the billiard-room there was a staircase to the first floor here at the right an antechamber opened into josephine's bedroom which was oval in form and hung in red for many years this was their common chamber and here josephine drew her last breath while napoleon was in exile at elba two other adjoining rooms and a bathroom completed the private suite in the other wing were the rooms occupied by hortense after her marriage in the middle there was a long corridor from which opened several small rooms occupied by the aide-de-camp on duty or invited guests malmaison was for josephine what the petit trianon had been for marie antoinette in her time the grounds extended as far as the village of reuil and were beautifully decorated with exotic trees rare plants exquisite flowers and small lakes with their white and black swans at malmaison napoleon always appeared at his best the great man relaxed and threw off his cares he was amiable familiar indulgent he took part in the games with the ardour of a youth he joked he told stories with a spirit which astonished everybody he was an admirable host affable spiritual putting all his guests at their ease at that time he had not yet abandoned his republican simplicity and adopted the tiresome and chilling etiquette of the imperial court End of chapters eight through ten chapters eleven and twelve of napoleon and josephine the rise of the empire by walter Gere this librivox recording is in the public domain eleven eighteen hundred the question of heredity the winter season of eighteen hundred in paris was very brilliant on the twenty sixth january the new minister of the interior lucien bonaparte gave a grand ball in honour of his sister caroline and her husband at the magnificent hotel brissac rue de grenelle which he occupied at the time dinners and balls which recalled the fete of the fermiers généraux under the monarchy were also given by the great bankers of the day all classes of society took part in the social world and the dance was never so popular for a period of ten years the parisians had been deprived of the popular masked balls of the opera and their reopening was one of the features of the carnival but while paris danced and played the first consul was occupied with very serious problems the internal affairs of france were in very bad shape the treasury was empty civil war still raged in the vendee the soldiers were ill-fed and ill-clad and the armies were demoralized from frequent defeats the foreign situation was equally discouraging the english government had declined his pacific overtures and with austria it was clear that there was no chance of peace except through victory 
during the winter the energy and activity of bonaparte were everywhere in evidence and the sudden resurrection of france at this time is one of the most remarkable events in modern history instantly as if by enchantment writes the english historian allison everything was changed order reappeared out of chaos talent emerged from obscurity vigor arose out of the elements of weakness the arsenals were filled the veterans crowded to their eagles the conscripts joyfully repaired to the frontier la vendee was pacified the exchequer began to overflow in little more than six months after napoleon's accession the austrians were forced to seek refuge under the cannon of ulm italy was regained unanimity and enthusiasm prevailed among the people and the revived energy of the nation was launched into a career of conquest on the sixth of may bonaparte left paris for italy two weeks later he crossed the grand st bernard on the second day of june he entered milan on the fourteenth he decisively defeated the austrians at marengo and at one stroke regained nearly all of the territory in northern italy which had been lost during his absence in egypt on his return to france napoleon received a perfect ovation at every stage of his journey when he entered paris the night of the second of july after an absence of less than two months the enthusiasm was indescribable an innumerable crowd gathered in the tuileries gardens to cheer him and he expressed his pleasure to bourrienne by saying the noise of these acclamations is as sweet to me as the sound of the voice of josephine twenty years later on the rock of st helena he spoke of this as one of the happiest days of his life during napoleon's absence occurred the so-called conspiracy of marengo the details of which are little known while he was still engaged in putting down the civil war at home and repelling the foreign invaders from the frontiers of france his brothers joseph and lucien had already begun the struggle for the supreme power in the event of his death the question of heredity which was to be the source of his greatest troubles and one of the causes of his final downfall had already been raised before his supreme power was even definitely established as early as the month of february lucien was exchanging views with bernadotte who during the consulate and the empire never lived a day without plotting to overthrow napoleon a month before the departure of the first consul for italy in his cabinet at the tuileries fouché regarding lucien with his terrible eyes exclaimed i will have the minister of the interior himself arrested if i learn that he is conspiring a contemporary who endeavours to find excuses for lucien and to defend him from the charge of conspiracy is forced to admit that the political immorality the civil dishonesty of his administration the disgraceful peculations the insatiable cupidity of the agents by whom he was surrounded did much to injure his brother's government joseph for his part acted much more discreetly but he let his brother know that he wished to be designated as his successor nothing in the new constitution gave this power to the first consul who had been elected for ten years and was re-eligible with his childish vanity joseph could see no reason why he should not be as acceptable to the french nation as the conqueror of italy and egypt and thought that it only needed a word from napoleon to amend in his favour a constitution adopted by the practically unanimous vote of three million citizens in a conversation with the first consul the day before his departure for italy joseph seems to have raised for the first time the question of the consular heredity and he showed his hand more clearly in a letter written on the twenty fourth of may in all corsicans there is a strong sentiment of the clan from which napoleon himself was not exempt joseph felt that as the eldest he was the chief of the clan the head of the family therefore it was not a favour which he solicited it was a right which he claimed but he did not rely entirely upon the support of napoleon to gain his point upon the suggestion of his friend millot a council was held at auteuil at which were present nearly all the leading members of the former assemblies the possibility of the death of bonaparte and the question of his successor were discussed but the name of joseph was not even mentioned after wavering between lafayette and carnot they decided in favour of the organizer of victory whom napoleon had recalled from exile and made minister of war at this same time an alliance was formed between talleyrand and fouché which was to bear its full fruit fourteen years later when these two arch-conspirators and underhanded enemies of napoleon were to precipitate his fall and bring back the bourbons 
at this time however their plans only contemplated the formation of a triumvirate consisting of themselves and one accommodating colleague lucien was not involved in any of these later schemes on the fourteenth may he lost his wife and for at least ten years he retired to his country estate abandoning entirely the direction of his department in the meantime joseph was so anxious to obtain an immediate response from his brother that he could not remain quietly at paris and set out for italy when he arrived at milan the victory of marengo had settled the whole question napoleon was now the absolute master of france and the decision of the matter was entirely in his own hands he was fully informed of the plots and counterplots but chose to ignore them all the only outcome was that carnot lost his portfolio leaving for italy in the costume of the institute on his return napoleon presides over the council of state in the uniform of general it is only after marengo that he feels his place secure as head of state it was not until the seventh of september that he finally and definitely replied to the proposals of the pretender i have received sir your letter i thank you for the polite things you say to me you cannot hope to return to france it would be necessary for you to march over five hundred thousand dead bodies sacrifice your interests to the repose and happiness of france history will give you credit for your action the conspiracy of marengo is interesting because it marks the first grouping of factions which on several occasions were again to come to the front during the empire and because it reveals the principal weakness of napoleon's personal regime these plots convinced him of the necessity of providing for the consular succession the new constitution perhaps intentionally had left the matter in very vague shape for the first time napoleon now fully realized the necessity of facing this question of heredity so important to himself to his brothers and above all to josephine napoleon at the age of thirty-one could not abandon the hope of an heir hence the constant menace of divorce for josephine who after four years of marriage could hardly expect to bear another child her hope of a restoration of the bourbons had now been extinguished by the action of her husband in this dilemma she naturally sought the support of such former jacobins as fouché and réal who were opposed to the extension of the powers of the first consul and above all to the designation of his successor as for napoleon's brothers they felt that there could be no question of their rights to the succession one would think as napoleon once expressed it that he as the younger brother had usurped the place and the rights of joseph as successor to their father the late king they were also so convinced that it was impossible for napoleon himself to have any children that they could not conceive of his repudiating josephine and marrying a younger woman in the hope of having an heir lucien apparently recognized the rights of joseph as the elder and was willing to await his turn as heir presumptive especially as his brother had no children the two brothers therefore sought each in his own way to secure the adoption of the principle of designation after which each one hoped to be chosen with the death of his charming wife catherine boyer who notwithstanding her common origin had finished by gaining the love of all the family as well as the general esteem of society lucien had more and more neglected his official duties and plunged into all kinds of dissipation napoleon was obliged to call him to account and there were several unpleasant scenes between the brothers matters were finally brought to a head by the publication of the famous parallel one morning towards the end of october fouché entered the cabinet of the first consul and handed him a little pamphlet entitled parallel entre césar cromwell et bonaparte two paragraphs were specially marked which suggested the idea of heredity and pushed the candidacy of the brothers of the consul this brochure written by lucien although he denied it and widely distributed under the frank of the minister of the interior had caused a great sensation in all the departments lucien is summoned from his country place plessis and there is a violent scene between him and fouché in the presence of the first consul napoleon remains a passive spectator of the discussion josephine enters the room and takes part she seats herself upon napoleon's knees and runs her fingers gently through his hair and over his face i beg you bonaparte she says do not make yourself a king it is this wretch lucien who urges you to it do not listen to him 
with much regret napoleon asked for lucien's resignation and to cover his disgrace sent him as ambassador to madrid with an enormous salary this exile in disguise of lucien is not all that josephine gains from the publication of the parallel and the opportune intervention of fouché napoleon is now fully convinced of the necessity of adopting the principle of the right of designation but the choice of the individual presents many difficulties he puts aside joseph a most worthy man but with no application and no capacity for public affairs lucien is now out of the question for a moment he thinks of eugene de beauharnais who would have been the best choice of all but decides that he is too young and inexperienced the next day he makes his decision it is not necessary he says to cudgel our brains to find a successor i have found one it is louis he has all of the good qualities and none of the faults of his brothers josephine was delighted when napoleon informed her of his choice in which unconsciously he may have been influenced by his wife louis has an excellent heart a very superior mind she said he loves bonaparte as a lover loves his mistress from that moment her plan was settled louis must marry hortense twelve eighteen hundred to eighteen hundred two marriage of hortense louis bonaparte who was born on the second of september seventeen seventy eight was nine years younger than napoleon who regarded him very much in the light of an adopted son in february seventeen ninety one when napoleon returned from his home in corsica to his regiment at Oxon, after an absence of nearly seventeen months he brought with him his favourite younger brother on his meagre pay of one hundred francs a month he had undertaken this care in order to relieve to some extent the financial difficulties of his widowed mother in his shabby little room with its sparse furniture there was no place for louis and he slept on a mattress in an adjoining cabinet napoleon himself prepared their frugal meals he gave his brother lessons in mathematics and generally supervised his education at a later date he complained of his brother's ingratitude and reminded him that for his sake he had deprived himself even of the necessaries of life the blindness of napoleon to the faults of his brothers and sisters is almost the only weak point in his character as it also reveals one of the most attractive sides of his heart he never could do too much for his family who almost without exception repaid him with the basest ingratitude they all seemed to think that their good fortune was due entirely to their own merits and not at all to the senseless partiality of their great brother in seventeen ninety five napoleon procured for louis admission to the military school at chalon at this time he wrote in the warmest terms of his brother's fine qualities of heart and mind the following year louis who was then only eighteen years of age was one of napoleon's aides de camp in italy he was his messmate his private secretary his man of confidence at this time louis was splendid company always full of life and spirits at milan he contracted a disease which in a short time not only affected his health but seemed to change his moral character for the rest of his life he was a regular hypochondriac constantly worrying about his health and persuaded that he was doomed to an early death during the egyptian expedition louis again acted as aide-de-camp to his brother but was sent back to france with dispatches some time before the return of napoleon in january eighteen hundred when only twenty-two years of age he was appointed chief of brigade he then took up his residence in paris where he associated with men of letters and occupied himself with everything except his military career he took no part in the marengo campaign during which he remained at paris occupied with his literary pursuits none of his friends seemed to understand the radical change in his character napoleon thought that a journey might rouse him from his melancholy and proposed a trip to germany which louis eagerly accepted to escape he said later the solicitations for his marriage with hortense it is impossible however for us to believe that hortense was so disagreeable or the plans of josephine so objectionable to him at this time as he tries to make out in his reflections upon the government of holland drawn up twenty years later even if josephine as early as august eighteen hundred had formed in her secret heart the project which she carried out a year later she certainly had not made any moves which could arouse in louis the apprehension that she had designs upon his independence at that time hortense was only seventeen years of age 
she was not very pretty but was singularly attractive from the beauty of her form and the grace of her movements her nose was large and her mouth ugly with her mother's poor teeth but her blond hair and soft violet eyes gave to her face an expression of exquisite tenderness the tout ensemble was one which attracted and fascinated everybody she had been educated at the fashionable school of madame campan and possessed all the accomplishments of a young lady of good family she sang and danced well she played the harp and the piano she embroidered she excelled in all the little tasks of the salon she was quite literary in her tastes she was a fine equestrian and took a leading part in the sports and pastimes of the chateau life in character she was very sweet and amiable but became very obstinate when she was crossed her finest trait was her lifelong adoration of her mother which it must be confessed josephine had done little to deserve after their return from martinique her mother had placed her at the age of seven in a convent when that was closed during the revolution she was apprenticed to a sempstress later she was practically abandoned for four years by her mother in the school at st germain on the few rare occasions that josephine visited the school she was prodigal in her demonstrations of affection with her kisses which cost her so little for this mother was coquette even with her children hortense regarded her mother as a wonderful being and returned her affection a hundredfold in her innocence she knew nothing of her mother's worldly life of her struggle for existence of the connections she formed either from taste or necessity she knew that her father was the vicomte de beauharnais a handsome cavalier who attended the queen's balls was president of the constituent assembly general-in-chief of the army of the rhine and guillotined under the terror her conception of her father's career was similar to that which we find in many of the histories and equally far from the truth she was proud of her name one of the finest in france and also of her mother whom she considered worthy of her father hortense had therefore been much chagrined when her mother married an obscure republican general of doubtful nobility who had been absolutely unknown before the revolution she had only seen him once before the marriage at a dinner given by barras at the luxembourg in january seventeen ninety six hortense who was then not quite thirteen had been taken from school for the occasion she was jealous of the attentions to her mother of the little general whose name she did not even know she said he talked with great vivacity and seemed only interested in my mother she next saw bonaparte for a few days only on his return from italy and then again at the painful scene in the rue de la victoire when she implored him to pardon her mother without very clearly understanding what her mother had done under all the circumstances would it not be strange if she had any love for her stepfather like most young girls hortense had a very sentimental side to her nature she wished to marry for love and to find love in her marriage it has often been said that duroc the favorite aide-de-camp of napoleon loved her and that she reciprocated his affection the first consul had thought of him for one of his sisters he certainly would have accepted him for his stepdaughter duroc was a gentleman perhaps not of an illustrious family but of better birth certainly than bacciocchi leclerc or murat but duroc was sent on a diplomatic mission to berlin and nothing came of this incipient love affair with her usual selfishness josephine in considering the parti who presented themselves never thought of the happiness of her daughter but only of her personal interests but this was usual in those days her aunt madame renaudin certainly had not thought of josephine's happiness when she married her to alexandre de beauharnais even if josephine had not already made up her mind to bring about the marriage of louis and hortense she would have been decided by the attempt to assassinate the first consul on christmas eve eighteen hundred the conspirators knew that he expected to be present at the opera that evening to hear the new oratorio of the creation by hayden the most popular composer of the day they expected that his carriage would take the usual route by the rue saint nicaise which is no longer in existence this was a long narrow street bordering the carousel and running from the seine to the rue st honore where it ended near the rue richelieu in which the opera was then situated in this street an infernal machine installed in a one-horse cart was placed at a point which bonaparte's carriage would pass and the time that it would take him to come from the tuileries was carefully calculated so that the machine would explode at the right moment 
after dinner napoleon who was fatigued from a hard day's work had fallen asleep on a sofa and was with difficulty aroused and persuaded to start by the ladies of the tuileries josephine caroline and hortense who did not wish to miss the performance at eight o'clock he set out accompanied by lannes bessieres and an aide-de-camp and followed by a small escort of mounted grenadiers the coachman who had already begun his christmas celebration was half drunk and drove at a furious rate this fact alone saved bonaparte's life the carriage passed the infernal machine and had just rounded the corner into the rue richelieu when the explosion occurred lannes and bessieres wished to stop but bonaparte ordered the coachman to proceed a minute later he entered the loge with his usual calm face and demanded a copy of the libretto the life of josephine was also saved by an incident equally trivial she was wearing that evening for the first time a magnificent oriental shawl presented to bonaparte by the sultan rap the aide-de-camp on duty who was to escort the ladies ventured to remark to josephine that she had not arranged the shawl with her usual grace at her request he showed her how the shawl was draped by the egyptian ladies the party then descended the staircase of the pavillon de flore and entered their carriage they traversed the carousel and had just turned into the rue saint nicaise when the machine exploded the windows of the carriage were shattered and the arm of hortense was slightly cut by a piece of glass rap descended to see if the first consul had been injured and the carriage continued its way by another street when the three ladies entered the box napoleon greeted them with a smile as if nothing unusual had happened the news of this dastardly outrage in which over fifteen people lost their lives soon spread through the hall and the oratorio was interrupted while the audience arose and frantically applauded the first consul a few minutes later the party left the opera and returned to the tuileries where bonaparte received the reports of the police and the congratulations of his ministers this attempt on napoleon's life was a terrible shock to josephine it gave new impetus to the public demand for an heir to the first consul as necessary to the security of the state and this for josephine aroused again the dreaded spectre of the divorce this conspiracy following so closely on that of arena only two months before which the police had discovered in time convinced everybody that it was desirable to give the first consul the right to designate his successor and thus assure the heredity of the consulate or at least the continued existence of the government as established by him it was no longer an academic question to be debated and postponed from time to time but an actual urgent public necessity which demanded immediate action josephine realized that the crisis had come and was more determined than ever to carry out her plan for the union of louis and hortense if she herself could not give napoleon an heir he might find one in her grandchild and his nephew the son of his favorite brother although josephine did not live to see her dream come true all of napoleon's plans came to naught and it was the son of louis and hortense who occupied the imperial throne as napoleon the third louis was already tired of his tour of germany and asked permission of his brother to return to paris no sooner was he back than the strange idea possessed him of buying a country place where he went to bury himself in midwinter the house which he purchased was a simple rural mansion in the woods a league from the highway about midway between mortefontaine and plessis the country estates of joseph and lucien he had hardly taken possession of his new home and begun some alterations when he again became uneasy and set out for bordeaux to rejoin his regiment which at his request had been included in the army of observation under the command of leclerc which was going to portugal in july eighteen hundred one josephine who had not yet entirely abandoned all hope went again to plombieres to take the waters which the year before had succeeded so well in the case of madame joseph that after seven years of marriage she was just on the point of presenting her husband with their first child a month later josephine returned to malmaison to await in vain the miraculous effects of her cure at the end of three months louis was tired of his military duties and asked for a leave of absence after spending several weeks at the baths of barege to cure his rheumatism at the end of september he came to malmaison for a visit there he fell in love with hortense and finally decided upon the marriage which he had previously dreaded 
there is absolutely no truth in the statement so often made by louis in after years that the marriage was forced upon him three months elapsed between his return and the ceremony during this period louis showed himself very devoted to hortense while she seemed resigned to her lot on the third of january eighteen hundred two the contract was signed at the tuileries in the presence of the whole family and the following day the civil marriage took place followed the same evening by a religious ceremony at the hotel in the rue de la victoire the nuptial benediction was pronounced by cardinal caprara who was then negotiating the concordat with the french government at the same time caroline and murat who had only been united by a civil bond had their marriage blessed by the church josephine ardently desired the same privilege but napoleon absolutely refused either from reasons of public policy or in order to keep the way open for a divorce if in the future he desired one End of chapters eleven and twelve chapters thirteen and fourteen of napoleon and josephine the rise of the empire by walter gear this librivox recording is in the public domain thirteen eighteen hundred two to eighteen hundred three the consulate for life on the second day of august eighteen hundred two the senate declared napoleon bonaparte consul for life with the power to name his successor the decree conveyed to him in its official terms the expression of the confidence the admiration and the love of the french people in the plebiscite he received the votes of over three and a half million frenchmen with less than nine thousand in the negative at the same time the government gave him as a summer residence the royal chateau of st cloud this palace was built on the edge of a magnificent park on a long terrace overlooking the seine with the city of paris at a distance in the background the main building and the two projecting wings framed the court of honour in the rear was a beautiful french garden bordered on one side by an extension of the palace and on the other by an alley shaded by magnificent trees the property which had previously belonged to private parties was purchased by louis the fourteenth and presented to his brother the duc d'orleans in seventeen eighty five calonne the prodigal controller of the finances bought the chateau for six million francs and the king gave it to marie antoinette she made extensive alterations in the building and frequently resided there before the revolution her last visit was in the summer of seventeen ninety at which time she had her celebrated interview with mirabeau during the revolution all of the furniture and hangings disappeared and the palace had to be refurbished for the first council as soon as the work was completed napoleon moved there on the twentieth of september at st cloud josephine occupied the apartments of marie antoinette in the left wing the suite of the first consul was on the ground floor in the other wing his cabinet was a large room with the walls covered with books from floor to ceiling he usually sat on a small sofa placed near the mantel which was decorated with two bronze busts of scipio and hannibal behind the sofa in the corner of the room was the desk of his secretary Minerval, who had taken the place of bourrienne discharged for dishonesty adjoining the cabinet was a small salon where the first consul received his ministers and gave private audiences in this salon there was a fine portrait of gustavus adolphus the favourite hero of napoleon the only ornament of his bedroom which faced on the garden was an antique bust of caesar from the first a rigid court etiquette was established at st cloud duroc who was appointed governor of the palace had a table for the officers the aide-de-camp and the ladies on duty the first consul took his meals alone with his wife but gave formal dinners twice a week for important officials of the government the military household was composed of the four generals commanding the consular guard lannes bessieres devaux and soult and the seven aides-de-camp among whom were colincourt rapp and savary there were four prefects and the same number of ladies of the palace of whom the best known were m de rimusat and his wife the author of the celebrated memoirs the usages of the court of versailles had been copied so closely that there was even a serious idea of reviving the custom of powdered hair but napoleon could not bring himself to this so hair was worn au naturel for the first time since the revolution religious practices were renewed the first consul insisted that on sunday every one should go to mass and the chapel at st cloud recalled that at versailles 
the last of october napoleon and josephine made a fortnight's trip to normandie the first day they went over the field of battle where henry the fourth gained the victory of ivry then they passed a week at rouen where the first consul visited all of the principal manufactories and held a review of the national guard another week was spent at havre and dieppe inspecting the ports the fortifications and the ships under construction on the evening of the fourteenth november the party was again back at st cloud the following ten weeks were spent at st cloud except one day the first week in december when the first consul went to the tuileries to receive the english ambassador lord whitworth who presented his credentials on the twenty third january eighteen hundred three napoleon and josephine returned to the tuileries for the winter in eighteen hundred three josephine was forty years of age her beauty was somewhat faded but she was so adroit in the use of cosmetics she dressed with so much taste that with her charm of manner and her air of distinction she could still be called a very attractive woman no sovereign was ever more to the manner born she received so well she possessed in so high a degree the art of saying something appropriate and pleasant to every one she had so much tact and so much presence of mind that any one would have thought she was born on the steps of a throne she was popular with all parties and all factions fouché who represented the element of the revolution was her friend and all the personages of the ancien regime regarded her as their ally she had done much good in her life and had never injured anybody even the severest critics of bonaparte had only words of praise for his wife all classes of society united in rendering her homage she was not only popular but she deserved her popularity she was so much loved and admired that even the most rigid moralists had no words of reproach for her past indiscretions no woman ever justified better than josephine the saying that the eyes are the mirror of the soul her own of a deep blue colour were almost always half closed by her long eyelids fringed with the most beautiful eyelashes in the world and her glance was absolutely irresistible another of her great charms was her voice which was soft and musical with the slightest creole accent she read well and loved to read aloud napoleon preferred her to all other readers all who knew josephine united speaking of her kindness madame de rimusat says she had a remarkable evenness of temper much good will and the faculty of forgetting any wrong done her constant the valet de chambre of napoleon bears the same testimony kindness he writes was as inseparable from her character as grace was from her person generous to the point of prodigality she made every one around her happy no woman was ever more loved by those near her or more deserved to be without having great intelligence josephine possessed the most perfect savoir-faire she always found without searching the exact word for the occasion the expression which touched and charmed and this is better than esprit because it comes not from the head but from the heart she was also a good listener a trait both rare and remarkable she never forgot a name or a face and on meeting some one whom she had not seen in years could always recall some pleasant incident connected with him as nearly always happens josephine had the defects of her qualities she was generous and charitable to a fault but she was also prodigal to excess as we shall see later only the revenues of imperial france could have ever sufficed to pay her debts at this time the first consul and his wife made quite a happy household at st cloud they always occupied the same chamber about eight o'clock napoleon arose and went to his cabinet where he breakfasted alone then he began his day's work which generally occupied him until six o'clock when he went for a drive with josephine they dined together and he usually remained for a short chat afterwards then he returned to his cabinet while josephine played cards to finish the evening between ten and eleven a chamberlain came to announce madame the first consul has retired josephine immediately dismissed her company and went to rejoin her husband after their return to the tuileries this year napoleon decided to have his own room separate from his wife in this connection madame de rimusat recounts a scene which constitutes one of the strangest episodes in her interesting but not always trustworthy memoirs that season a new actress named mademoiselle georges had made her debut 
she had very little talent but great beauty and napoleon was seduced by her charms josephine was informed that the young actress on several evenings had been secretly conducted to a quiet apartment in the chateau one night josephine kept madame de rémusat later than usual and talked of her grievances at one o'clock in the morning they were alone in her salon and the most complete silence reigned over the tuileries suddenly josephine exclaimed i cannot keep quiet any longer mademoiselle georges is certainly upstairs and i am going to surprise them follow me we will go up together the lady of the palace protested and tried but in vain to turn josephine from her purpose they silently ascended the private staircase which led to the suite of napoleon on the first floor suddenly they heard a slight noise and stopped in their course it may be roustan who is guarding the door said josephine the wretch is capable of cutting both our throats pale with terror at these words madame de rimusat rushed back to the salon carrying the candle which she held in her hand and leaving josephine in the dark she followed after a few minutes and burst into laughter at the sight of her maid's discomposed countenance after this they abandoned their enterprise before adopting this change in his habitudes napoleon one day asked madame de rimusat if she thought a husband should yield to the caprices of a wife who wished always to share his bed the lady of the palace returned an evasive answer bonaparte began to laugh and pulling her ear a favourite trick of his when in good humour said you are a woman and you are all in league together a recent biographer tells us that there is a pretty picture of josephine at this time as she appeared at the wedding of napoleon's sister pauline with her short sleeves bare arms and her hair enclosed in a gilt net she looked like a greek statue the first consul led her to a mirror that he might see her on all sides at once and kissing her shoulder said ah josephine i shall be jealous why are you so beautiful to-day it is really a pity to destroy so idealistic a picture but as a matter of fact napoleon was not present at his sister's wedding the first day of january eighteen hundred three pauline returned from the disastrous expedition to saint domingue where her husband leclerc had succumbed to the unhealthy climate she herself was suffering from a grave malady from which she never entirely recovered for two months after her return to paris pauline lived with joseph at his townhouse but in april she purchased for four hundred thousand francs the magnificent hôtel charot in the faubourg st honore a few doors from joseph's hôtel marboeuf at this same time there arrived in paris the prince camillo borghese the chief of one of the richest and most illustrious roman families at a house-party at mortefontaine in june he was presented to pauline by this time the young widow who was not yet twenty-three had somewhat recovered from her real grief over the loss of leclerc and was tired of wearing mourning which did not become her style of beauty she was much attracted by the personality of borghese but perhaps even more by the idea of being a real princess and taking the pas over her dear sisters bachocchi and murat as well as her sisters-in-law josephine and hortense a few days after their first meeting she authorized joseph to make overtures to the prince the matter was quickly arranged and on the twenty first june borghese formally announced to joseph his desire to marry pauline he only asked that the proposed alliance should remain a secret until he had time to obtain his mother's consent at the same time pauline wrote to the first consul to ask his approval the mother of the prince was delighted with the alliance and on the first day of august the engagement was announced by the paris journals on the twenty third of august the marriage contract was signed only by pauline and borghese at the hotel charot on the fourteenth of august and again a week later the bans were published at mortefontaine it was generally anticipated that the marriage would take place on the twenty eighth of august but just then a difficulty arose they had forgotten leclerc he had died on the second day of november eighteen hundred two and the social rules re-established and formally promulgated by the first consul himself forbade a widow to remarry during a period of one year and six weeks after the death of her husband in this dilemma madame bonaparte who was as domineering and imperious as her great son took charge of affairs and ordered the marriage to take place on the twenty eighth of august or perhaps four days later the ceremony was performed at mortefontaine by an italian priest who may have been cardinal caprara himself 
the exact date is uncertain as the certificate was never filed this marriage of conscience was known only to the mother and the two brothers of the bride joseph and lucien napoleon was so ignorant of the matter that on the twenty fifth of september he gave pauline a dinner of two hundred couverts at the tuileries and afterwards took her to st cloud to pass several days with him a month later the twenty third of october he gave another large dinner to his sister to which borghese was invited napoleon intended on this occasion to announce formally the date of the marriage he was still ignorant of the fact that a religious ceremony had taken place without a previous civil contract as required by law the official marriage was finally celebrated at mortefontaine on the sixth of november but the first consul was not present he had left for boulogne three days before to inspect the fleet and did not return to st cloud until after the middle of the month this absence was intentional napoleon was enraged at having been thus deceived by his favourite sister by his mother and his brothers in short by everybody at the wedding there were present all the members of the family except napoleon and lucien who ten days before had secretly contracted another alliance which was to disgrace him with his brother the wedding of pauline was announced by only two lines in the official journal madame leclerc has married prince borghese the marriage was celebrated at mortefontaine napoleon pressed the departure of the newly married couple and several days before his return from boulogne they were on their way to italy the marriage of pauline had wounded the heart of napoleon but almost at the same time there occurred two other weddings in the family which brought other cares which disturbed the family harmony and exercised a decisive influence on the fortunes of two of the brothers in may or june eighteen hundred two lucien had met while on a visit in the country a young woman with whom he became desperately enamoured her name was alexandrine de blechamp and at the age of nineteen she had married a certain monsieur joubertou later she had been abandoned at paris almost without resources when her husband sailed for st domingue to try and retrieve his fortunes a few months later she met lucien affairs moved quickly and in august madame joubertou was installed in lucien's mansion at Plessy when he returned to paris she was lodged in a house which communicated by a subterranean passage with lucien's hotel in the rue saint dominique there on the twenty third of may eighteen hundred three was born a child who was declared before the municipality under the name of jules laurence lucien this eldest son of lucien was subsequently legitimized by the marriage of his parents and he was later called charles after his grandfather this ceremony however was not performed until the twenty third of october eighteen hundred three after lucien had finally succeeded in obtaining a certificate of the death of joubertou at port-au-prince the fifteenth of june eighteen hundred two if the affair of lucien was serious in the eyes of napoleon that of his youngest brother was worse in february eighteen hundred two jerome sailed with the french fleet for the west indies born the fifteenth of november seventeen eighty four he was then only seventeen years of age two months later he returned to paris as bearer of dispatches from leclerc promoted to the rank of ensign he sailed again on the eighteenth of september for martinique soon tiring of his naval career jerome decided to return to france by way of new york and sailed for virginia on an american pilot boat he landed at norfolk the twentieth of july eighteen hundred three and a week later he was in washington during his stay there he met at baltimore a very attractive girl of about his own age named elizabeth patterson the daughter of a wealthy merchant and on the twenty fourth of december they were married the charge d'affaires at washington pichon had done everything in his power to prevent the marriage he wrote mr patterson and jerome to point out that any marriage contracted without the consent of madame bonaparte during her lifetime under the french law would be absolutely null and void jerome was too much in love to hesitate and the young lady and her father were willing to take a chance when the news reached france the first consul sent his brother peremptory orders to return but owing to various causes jerome did not reach europe until a year later fourteen eighteen hundred three to eighteen hundred four the royalist plots on the twenty seventh of march eighteen hundred two the long war between england and france had been ended by the treaty of amiens which was very popular in both countries unfortunately the peace was to last only a year 
on the thirteenth of march eighteen hundred three at the tuileries occurred the celebrated scene between bonaparte and the english ambassador which presaged the renewal of the struggle once a month the first consul was accustomed to receive the ambassadors and their wives in josephine's apartment this audience was always a very ceremonious affair the ministers were conducted to a salon and when all were present the first consul and his wife appeared followed by a prefect and a lady of the palace after the formal presentations had been made napoleon and josephine carried on a short conversation and then withdrew on the present occasion madame de rimusat entered josephine's room a few minutes before the hour fixed for the reception she found bonaparte there sitting on the floor and playing gaily with the baby napoleon the child of louis and hortense who was then only five months old at the same time he amused himself by commenting on the toilettes of the two ladies and giving his advice about their dresses he laughed continuously and seemed to be in the best possible humour in a few minutes he was notified that the ambassadors had all arrived getting up his whole expression suddenly changed the laughter left his lips and his features became very severe exclaiming let us go ladies he rushed from the room and entered the salon without saluting any one he walked directly to the english minister and immediately began to complain of the measures of his government his anger seemed to increase from moment to moment and rose to a point which terrified the whole assembly the harshest words the most violent menaces issued from his trembling lips no one dared to make a movement and josephine looked on mute with astonishment the phlegmatic englishman was so disconcerted that he could hardly find a word to reply leaving the dumbfounded ambassador bonaparte spoke to two of the other ministers then returned to lord whitworth and made a few polite personal remarks suddenly his anger seemed to return you are then decided on war he exclaimed we have already had it for ten years you wish to have it for ten years more and you force me into it why these armaments if you arm i shall arm too you can perhaps destroy france but intimidate her never at this moment his face was red with anger and he seemed in a paroxysm of fury two months later lord whitworth demanded his passports and the longest contest was resumed which was only to end on the field of waterloo napoleon immediately began his preparations and as a preliminary to the gigantic struggle decided to visit in state the northern departments and in particular the great port of antwerp that pistol pointed at the heart of england the first consul decided that the journey should be made with the greatest magnificence and that his wife should accompany him in order to make use of her well-known powers of attraction he had the crown jewels taken out of the safe deposits where they were stored and gave them to josephine who we may be sure was not reluctant to employ them two of the ladies of the palace madame de rimusat and talouet were chosen to accompany the party and the first consul gave each of them thirty thousand francs for the expenses of their toilette on the twenty fourth of june eighteen hundred three they left st cloud with a cortege of several carriages two generals of the guard the aide-de-camp du roc and two prefects of the palace of whom m de rimusat was one the first night was passed at the country home of joseph mortefontaine where nearly the whole bonaparte family was reunited here a very unpleasant scene occurred just before dinner joseph notified napoleon that he intended to take in their mother and place her at his right hand with josephine on his left the first consul was offended at this arrangement which put his wife in second place but joseph refused to yield when the dinner was announced napoleon gave his arm to josephine entered unceremoniously before every one and placed her by his side the whole party was so disarranged that poor meek madame joseph found herself at the foot of the table as if she did not belong to the family during the dinner napoleon occupied himself exclusively with his wife and did not address a word to any one else the second night was passed at amiens where the first consul was received with enthusiasm impossible to describe the people detached the horses and drew the carriage themselves josephine was moved to tears by the cries of joy the garlands of flowers which crowned the route the triumphal arches erected in honour of the restorer of france the benedictions which were too general not to have been absolutely spontaneous 
in several of the cities of flanders the mayors in their addresses ventured to suggest that the first consul should replace his precarious title by one more in accord with the high destiny to which he was called bonaparte could hardly conceal his pleasure at these words but interrupted the orator to say in a tone of assumed anger that he could not think of changing the republic like caesar he rejected the crown which nevertheless he was not reluctant to have presented to him after these receptions the first consul usually mounted his horse and showed himself to the people who received him with cheers then he visited the public buildings and the manufactories in his usual hurried manner in the evening he attended the dinner offered him which was the most tiresome part of his day's work for as he expressed it i am not made for pleasure everywhere in old france the party was received with the same enthusiasm but in flanders there was not so much warmth on arriving at antwerp the first consul showed great interest in this important port and gave orders for the great works which were afterwards carried out the entry into brussels was magnificent at the gate of the city the first consul was received by several regiments of troops he mounted his horse and josephine found a superb carriage placed at her disposal the whole city was decorated the artillery fired salutes all the church bells were rung the streets were thronged by the people and the july day was perfect during the week there was a succession of fêtes it was on one of these occasions that talleyrand replied in a manner so adroit and so flattering to a sudden question of bonaparte who demanded how he had made his large fortune so quickly nothing easier replied the minister i bought government securities on the day before the eighteen brumaire and sold them the day after from brussels the party returned by way of liege and sedan to st cloud where they arrived on the eleventh of august after an absence of seven weeks josephine was delighted with this trip during which she left everywhere recollections of her charm and grace which were never to be effaced this triumphal progress of bonaparte through the northern departments excited to the highest degree the rage of the royalists and plots were immediately formed for his removal the heads of this conspiracy were the chouan leader georges cadoudal and the former republican general pichegru moreau the victor of hohenlinden considered by many as the second soldier of france was also gravely implicated not far from dieppe there is a cliff two hundred and fifty feet high this was the point where cadoudal entered france on the night of the twenty second of august eighteen hundred three it was a place well known to smugglers who nightly climbed the rock with the aid of a ship cable hung from the top by the same route pichegru and several other conspirators arrived several weeks later walking by night and hiding by day they all eventually arrived at paris where under different disguises they eluded for a long time the vigilance of the police on a dark night in january pichegru had an interview with moreau on the boulevard de la madeleine the two generals had not met since the days that on the borders of the rhine they were gloriously fighting the battles of france the meeting was not entirely harmonious and the comte d'artois was deceived by false reports when he exclaimed with joy now that our two generals are in accord i shall soon be back in france during this time bonaparte was far more nervous and uneasy than on the field of battle where he always displayed the greatest calm he directed the movements of the secret police and stimulated their zeal in the midst of these hidden perils josephine showed great courage with her usual kindness of heart she urged her irritated husband not to confound the innocent with the guilty and not to hold the whole royalist party responsible for the acts of a few fanatics unfortunately napoleon did not listen to these wise counsels in the state of excitement to which his nerves had been wrought up by the renewal of these infamous attempts on his life he decided on a policy of vengeance which should strike terror to the hearts of his foes at a special meeting of the council on the night of the fourteenth february the only subject discussed was the cadoudal pichegru conspiracy and orders were issued for the immediate arrest of moreau when a great crime is under investigation in france the prosecutor always enjoins upon the agents of justice cherchez la femme the woman in this case was madame moreau without the jealousy and petty vanity of this woman her husband instead of meeting an ignominious death fighting in the ranks of the enemies of his country would have become like davout messina and ney a duke and prince a maréchal de france 
moreau had met bonaparte for the first time after his return from egypt and the two celebrated generals had become quite friendly on the eighteen brumaire moreau had taken an active part in the coup d'etat exactly a year later on the ninth november eighteen hundred he married a mademoiselle hulot who had been a companion of hortense in the school of madame campan josephine had contributed much to bring about this match which she thought would be useful to the interests of the first consul ten days after the wedding moreau left paris to take command of the army of germany and on the third of december eighteen hundred he gained the brilliant victory of Owenlinden, which led to the peace of lunéville two months later shortly after the battle madame moreau rejoined her husband in germany and her pride was increased by the sight of the eclat with which he was everywhere received on their return to paris the amour propre of madame moreau was wounded on several occasions by what she considered to be the incivility or social slights of the first consul like josephine she was the daughter of a creole and her mother who was a sensitive as well as a very vindicative woman told her that she was younger prettier and better educated than madame bonaparte that her husband had commanded as large armies and rendered as brilliant services to the republic as bonaparte and that there was no reason why general and madame moreau should occupy a second place in the state there were only too many persons at paris both republicans and royalists who were interested in fanning the flames the royalists in particular paid very marked attentions to madame moreau and frequented her handsome hotel in the rue d'anjou saint honoré bonaparte was exasperated by the petty social war which was waged against himself and his wife he detested the pinpricks and feared them more than the strokes of a dagger influenced by his wife moreau refused an invitation for dinner at the tuileries and also declined to accompany the first consul to a review this coldness shortly degenerated into declared enmity the city hotel of the general and his handsome country palace gros bois soon became centres of opposition to the consular government when madame de rémusat arrived at the tuileries one february morning she found josephine much troubled napoleon was seated near the fireplace playing with the little napoleon do you know what i have done he said i have just given the order to arrest moreau he continued twenty times have i prevented him from compromising himself i have warned him that they would embroil us and he felt that i was right but he is feeble and proud the women directed him the parties urged him on thus speaking bonaparte arose went to his wife took her by the chin and raised her head everybody has not a good wife like mine you are crying josephine but why are you afraid no replied she but i do not like what they will say then turning to the lady of the palace bonaparte continued i have no hatred no desire for vengeance i have deeply reflected before arresting moreau i could have closed my eyes and given him time to escape but people would have said that i was afraid to put him on trial i can convince them that he is guilty i am the government everything will be easily settled at the trial the evidence against moreau was not conclusive he was condemned to two years in prison but was accorded the permission to retire to america in order to furnish him with funds for his exile napoleon purchased his paris house for eight hundred thousand francs much more than its real value and presented it to bernadotte also his handsome estate of gros bois which he gave to berthier pichegru was finally betrayed by an old companion in arms one of his most intimate friends who came to the police and offered to give him up for a hundred thousand crowns on the last day of february he was arrested in paris and six weeks later was found strangled in prison his death has often been charged to napoleon but without the slightest evidence on the ninth of march cadoudal was taken at seven o'clock in the evening in the place de l'odéon and was executed the last week in june according to the police reports the conspirators had expected the early arrival in france of a prince of the royal house attention was at first directed to the cliff of beville near dieppe where cadoudal and pichegru were known to have entered the country but the watch was in vain then the search was turned to the banks of the rhine it was learned that the young duc d'anguin the son of the duc de bourbon was at ettenheim in the grand duchy of baden just across the river 
as a youth of twenty he had served twelve years before in the army of the emigres organized by his grandfather the prince de conde for the invasion of france in eighteen hundred one after the peace of luneville he had laid down his arms and taken up his residence in the former chateau of cardinal de rohan on the right bank of the rhine ten miles from strasbourg here he lived the life of a private citizen in the company of a young and charming woman who was devoted to him the princesse de rohan an under-officer of the gendarmerie was secretly sent in disguise to ettenheim in search of information the prince at this time had with him an emigre by the name of tumeri which the german servants pronounced tumerier and the spy reported that the french traitor dumouriez was with the duc d'anguet this information reached paris on the tenth of march eighteen hundred four and on the same day a servant of cadoudal deposed that a young man who was treated with the utmost respect on several occasions had been in conference with the conspirators at paris on the strength of these various reports the first consul jumped to the conclusion that the young bourbon prince was deeply implicated in the conspiracy against his life a special meeting of the council was held at the tuileries at ten o'clock in the evening on the tenth of march at which were present the three consuls and all the ministers it was decided to issue orders for the immediate arrest of the duc d'anguin and the supposed general dumouriez Coulincourt was sent with a letter to the Grand Duke of Baden, explaining this violation of German territory. Five days later, thirty dragoons and twenty-five gendarmes under the command of Colonel Ordiner crossed the river at Reno, opposite Ettenheim, and surrounded the chateau just as the day was beginning to break. The prince was taken without any resistance, and was conducted directly to Strasbourg, where he was interned in the citadel at the end of three days he was placed in a postal chaise and transferred to the chateau of vincennes at paris where he arrived late on the afternoon of the twentieth of march let us now see what was taking place at paris during this time on passion sunday the eighteenth of march madame de rimusat took up her duties again as a dame du palais early in the morning she went to the tuileries to be present at the mass which at this time was celebrated with much pomp afterwards josephine held an informal reception in the salons and then descended to her own apartment where she announced that they were going to malmaison to pass the week several hours later they set out bonaparte in one carriage and josephine with madame de rimusat in another josephine seemed sad and preoccupied and had little to say finally she remarked i am going to tell you a great secret this morning bonaparte informed me that he had sent coulincourt to the frontier to seize the duc d'anguin they are going to bring him here ah mon dieu madame cried the lady what do they intend to do why i think they mean to put him on trial josephine went on to say that she had done everything she could to obtain an assurance from the first consul that the prince should not be condemned but she was afraid that bonaparte's mind was made up and that the duc must die before dinner the first consul played chess and appeared as calm and serene as usual after the dinner at which nothing important transpired he retired to his cabinet to work with the police the two following days passed quietly and sadly convinced that the fate of the prince was decided josephine made no further efforts to turn her husband from his purpose tuesday morning josephine said it is all hopeless the duc d'anguin arrives this evening he will be taken to vincennes and tried to-night murat is in full charge he is odious in this matter it is he who is urging bonaparte on bonaparte has forbidden me to say anything more to him on the subject in the afternoon the first consul again played chess and insisted on having the little napoleon at dinner he had the baby placed in the middle of the table and was much amused to see him upset everything around him after dinner bonaparte seated himself on the floor and played with the child noticing the pallor of madame de rimusat he asked why she had forgotten to put on her rouge and added with a laugh that would never happen to you josephine when they came downstairs at eight o'clock the next morning savary was already in the salon josephine said well is it done yes madame he replied he died this morning and i must admit with fine courage he then gave the details which are now well known by many persons the execution of the duc d'anguin is considered the greatest blot on the fame of napoleon 
Talleyrand, with his usual cynicism, said, It is worse than a crime, it is a blunder. Naturally, there was a cry of indignation from the royalists everywhere. It was perfectly legitimate for them to attempt the life of the plebeian usurper, but he must not shed a drop of the blue blood of the Bourbons. Napoleon himself never offered any excuses for his action on this occasion. Upon the threshold of eternity, in his last testament at St. Helena, he wrote with his own hand, I had the Duc d'Anguin arrested and tried because it was necessary for the security, the interest, and the honor of the French people, at a time when the Comte d'Artois, by his own admission, was maintaining sixty assassins at Paris. Under the same circumstances, I would again do the same. End of chapters 13 and 14Chapters 15 and 16 of Napoleon and Josephine, The Rise of the Empire, by Walter Gear. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 15. 1804. Empress of the French. There is no city in the world where things are forgotten so quickly as in Paris, and the impression made by the death of the Duc d'Anguin soon passed away. Even with the royalists the event caused more sorrow than indignation. The first consul decided to appear in public as usual, and soon went with his wife to the opéra, where he was greeted with the customary applause. A week after the execution, the Senate, in an address, formally called on Bonaparte to guarantee the future by rendering his work as immortal as his glory. In the Tribune on the 28th of April, a member suggested a hereditary empire, and five days later the proposition was adopted by the vote of all the members except Carnot. The Senate disputed the initiative of the Tribune in this matter, because six weeks before Fouché had made an appeal to that body to establish hereditary power in the person of Bonaparte as the surest means of preserving the benefits of the Revolution. At the session of the 18th of May the Senate adopted a decree worded as follows. The French people decree the heredity of the imperial dignity in the descent, direct, natural, legitimate, and adopted of Napoleon Bonaparte and in the descent, direct, natural, and legitimate, of Joseph Bonaparte and of Louis Bonaparte. Then the Senate adjourned and proceeded in a body to St. Cloud to hail the new sovereign, Napoleon Ier. Napoleon, in uniform, received them in the magnificent gallery of Apollo, where four and a half years before, in the early hours of a gloomy November morning, he had taken his oath as consul. Now it is a day of splendid May sunshine, and Josephine, radiant with joy, is by the side of her husband, whose triumph she modestly shares. In the name of the Senate, Cambacérès pronounces a solemn discourse, which ends with the expression of the hope that the decree shall immediately be executed, and Napoleon instantly proclaimed as Emperor of the French. There is enthusiastic applause in the gallery which is echoed throughout the chateau, and in the courts and gardens. The cry of Vive l'Empereur! to be heard later on so many fields of battle, for the first time splits the air. Napoleon, arrived at the goal of his ambition, conceals his pride under an air of outward calm. He is so much at ease in his new role of monarch that one would imagine he was born to the purple. It is next the turn of the new empress to receive the homage of the Senate. Cambacérès, in his most flowery manner, conveys to Josephine the expression of the respect and gratitude of the French people, for her never-failing kindness and sympathy in cases of misfortune, the living remembrance of which would teach the world that, to dry the tears, is the surest way to reign over the hearts. Behold, therefore, the modest and gracious Creole elevated to the rank of sovereign. In the chorus of acclamations which echoed from every part of France there was scarcely a discordant note. The people ratified the Napoleonic dynasty by the almost unanimous vote of over three and a half millions, in the affirmative, against twenty-five hundred in the negative, a majority larger than that obtained for the consulate. If supreme power is ever to be based upon the foundation of a nation's will, no ruler in history ever had a clearer title to his throne than Napoleon Bonaparte. In the midst of these scenes of joy, the only persons who appear dissatisfied are the members of the new imperial family, who ought to be the most delighted and the most astonished at their grandeur. Nothing seems sufficiently splendid to meet their extravagant desires. 
when we think of the modest mansion of their father at ayacho it is impossible to suppress a smile at the pretensions of these new princes and princesses of the blood of the four brothers of napoleon two are absent and in disgrace lucien for his marriage with madame joubertou jerome for having wedded miss patterson his mother has espoused the cause of lucien and followed her son into exile at rome joseph and louis are disappointed because their children instead of themselves are designated in the line of succession elisa and caroline are full of chagrin because they are placed in the official scale below their sister-in-law the empress and they are plunged in despair because they do not yet receive the title of princess like the wives of joseph and louis they certainly must have expected that the wife of the emperor would receive an exalted rank but they did not imagine that julie and hortense who were not of the blood could bear titles which they themselves did not have after the reception of the senate at st cloud at which elisa and caroline were present the emperor asked them to remain for dinner as they were about to go to the table duroc announced the titles which should be given to each one and in particular to the wives of the princes mesdames bachocchi and murat appeared astounded at the difference between themselves and their sisters-in-law madame murat especially found it difficult to conceal her chagrin about six o'clock the emperor appeared and began without any appearance of embarrassment to salute each one with his new title the empress showed her usual amiability louis appeared satisfied madame joseph resigned to what was expected of her madame louis equally submissive eugene de beauharnais simple and natural with an air free from all signs of ambition or disappointment it was not the same with the new marshal murat but fear of his brother-in-law forced him to self-restraint and he displayed a thoughtful reticence as for madame murat she was in despair and had so little self-control that when she heard the emperor on several occasions during the dinner address the princesse louis she could not repress her tears she drank in succession several large glasses of water in the endeavour to recover her composure but the tears continued to fall her sister madame bachocchi older and more mistress of herself did not cry but she was brusque and cutting in her manner and treated the dame du palais with marked hauteur after a while the emperor became annoyed and increased the discomfiture of his sisters by teasing them with indirect banter on this occasion there were too many people present for the matter to go further but the following day at the family dinner madame murat broke out in tears and complaints napoleon lost his temper and replied very severely caroline who could endure no more fell on the floor in a dead faint this had an immediate effect on napoleon who calmed down and agreed to do what they wanted the next day the official paper inserted the following note to the french princes and princesses is given the title of imperial highness the sisters of the emperor bear the same title in the midst of all these family disagreements josephine maintained her usual amiable serenity the conduct of his brothers and sisters was in such contrast with that of his wife and her children that napoleon could not help being impressed with the difference except for money from time to time to pay her debts josephine asked nothing for the rest she accepted whatever it pleased her husband to give her but without any appearance of desiring it and without any pretension that it was due her if he gave to others she approved and never displayed any envy her conduct whether calculated or not was so adroit that every one was struck by her disinterestedness and her husband most of all with respect to her children josephine showed exactly the same spirit as napoleon himself stated later she never asked anything for eugene never even thanked him for what he did for her son and never showed any particular appreciation of his favours at the debut of the empire napoleon did nothing for eugene who found himself relegated by his duties and his rank to the waiting-room the most distant from the emperor's apartment eugene seemed to consider this entirely natural and made no complaint when napoleon offered him through josephine the office of grand chamberlain eugene modestly declined saying in excuse that this employment suited neither his tastes nor his character his vocation being entirely military no reply could have better pleased the emperor who at once increased his allowance from thirty thousand to one hundred fifty thousand francs and appointed him colonel-general of the chasseurs a cheval which made him a grand officer of the empire the new empire opened brilliantly 
and no one seemed to give a thought to the republic of which almost the only vestige left was the gold coins that continued for several years to bear the anomalous inscription république française napoleon empereur the first public appearance of the new sovereigns on a formal occasion was at the fete of the fourteenth of july anniversary of the fall of the bastille which this year was to be the occasion of the presentation of the crosses of the légion d'honneur for the first time they traversed in a carriage the grande allée of the tuileries gardens and proceeded with great pomp to the hôtel des invalides the ceremony took place in the church which during the revolution had been made a temple of mars and was now again consecrated for religious uses after the mass and a discourse by the grand chancellor of the order the emperor pronounced the oath and each of the members cried je le jure napoleon then called to him cardinal caprara who had negotiated the concordat and who was soon to be of great service in deciding the pope to come to paris for the coronation detaching from his neck the cordon of the legion the emperor presented it to the venerable prelate on this occasion the empress had a great personal triumph she wore a robe of pink tulle covered with silver stars with a very decolleté corsage as was then the fashion although the ceremony took place in full daylight clusters of diamonds crowned her head radiant with happiness she never appeared to greater advantage four days later the emperor left st cloud for boulogne on a general tour of inspection of the channel ports from calais to ostende he left josephine occupied with the preparation of her toilette for the visit which she was soon to make with him to the banks of the rhine he was to meet her the first of september at aix la chapelle where the empress was to precede him by several weeks for the purpose of taking the waters as was his custom before leaving st cloud napoleon dictated in the minutest details the itinerary of the journey of the empress everything was worked out with the same precision that he would have given to the orders for an army corps to arrive at a certain hour on the field of battle he also dictated the replies that josephine was to make to the addresses of welcome that she would receive at the different cities through which she passed every day before her departure josephine could be seen a large page of manuscript in her hand trying to commit these discourses to memory as a schoolgirl learns her lesson fortunately her replies were brief and she soon knew them by heart josephine's life at aix was very monotonous after the morning toilette the empress went to the thermal establishment for a bath an hour of rest followed and then she dressed for breakfast in the afternoon she usually went out for a drive upon her return she again changed her robe for dinner in the evening unless she went to the theatre she retired at an early hour it will be interesting here to read one of the letters written at this time by napoleon to josephine if only for the purpose of comparing it with the ardent effusions he sent her during the campaign of italy to the empress at aix la chapelle calais six august eighteen hundred four mon ami i am at calais since midnight but expect to leave for dunkerque this evening i am satisfied with my inspection and in quite good health i trust that the waters will do you as much good as the sight of the camp and the sea has done me eugene has left for blois hortense is well louis is at plombieres i long to see you you are ever necessary to my happiness a thousand best wishes napoleon after a visit of nine days at aix when he arrived on the second of september napoleon left with josephine for cologne from there they travelled separately to mayence which they reached on the twentieth of september at mayence the sovereigns received the warmest of welcomes the houses and public buildings were all illuminated in their honour the emperor found himself surrounded by a regular court of german princes performances were given by the second company of the théâtre francais which had been summoned from paris on the twelfth of october the emperor and empress were once more back at st cloud this visit to the banks of the rhine made a great impression on france and indeed on all europe no theatrical manager ever had a greater talent than napoleon for what may be called the art of the mise en scène the stage was now set for the coronation and the curtain was about to rise on one of the grandest spectacles the world has ever seen sixteen eighteen hundred four to eighteen hundred five the coronation 
during his absence from paris the emperor had not lost sight of his plans for the coronation and had sent his uncle cardinal fesch to rome as a special ambassador he was to arrange with the pope to come to paris to crown the new charlemagne in his capital if the holy father consented fesch had full powers to arrange with him all the details of the ceremony after much hesitation the pope finally agreed to yield to the wishes of the emperor and go to paris this unheard-of act of condescension filled the new sovereign with delight the political consequences to him were enormous on the one hand it assured his standing with the large catholic population of france and on the other it legitimized his title in the eyes of the other sovereigns of europe and put an end to the claims of the bourbons the visit of the pope to paris was an event so extraordinary as to seem to every one almost incredible when the report was first spread abroad madame letitia who was now called madame mere was simply astounded at the thought that the pope il santissimo padre should condescend to make the journey to paris to crown her bambino napoleone as emperor of the french the good woman could hardly realize it no one had followed the negotiations with more interest than josephine for her the important question was would she be crowned with the emperor this she thought would mean an assured future with no more worry over the perpetually recurring menace of divorce which empoisoned her entire existence as she had anticipated the bonapartes took this occasion to renew their efforts to persuade napoleon to repudiate his wife and this time they might have gained their end if they had used more tact but they went too far in their attacks on josephine and as usual only succeeded in arousing their brother's wrath in this crisis josephine displayed so much grief and at the same time so much submission to his wishes that napoleon could not bring himself to the point of repudiating her he took josephine in his arms and told her effusively that he would never have the strength to part with her even though public policy demanded it then he promised her that she should be crowned with him and receive at his side from the hands of the pope the divine consecration m thiers in relating this incident adds that he took it from the manuscript of the unpublished memoirs of a reliable person attached to the imperial family who was an eye-witness of the scene the preparations for the coronation were on a grand scale and nothing was left undone to make the spectacle imposing and memorable the costumes were designed by the great painters david and isabey the crown of the emperor modelled upon that of charlemagne was made by foncier the leading jeweller of paris and was a wonderful work of art it can still be seen in the gallery of apollo at the louvre in order to have the ceremony as perfect as possible there were several dress rehearsals held at notre dame david arranged the groups and the scenes were repeated until each one knew his role perfectly the painter profited by these rehearsals to make the sketches for his great painting of the coronation afterwards ordered by the emperor which now hangs in the louvre when some one said later to david that in his painting he had made josephine absurdly young he replied go and tell her so for the coronation two dates had been considered first the fourteenth of july anniversary of the fall of the bastille and a second the ninth november the day of the eighteen brumières when bonaparte overthrew the directory but both of these dates were manifestly inappropriate and the delay of the pope in reaching a decision finally caused the day to be set for the first week in december on the second day of november the pope pius the seventh then sixty-two years of age left rome for his long and tiresome journey to paris at the same time napoleon was hurrying the work on the chateau of fontainebleau so that it should be ready to receive the holy father on his arrival as if by magic in less than three weeks the palace was redecorated and refurnished with all its former splendour the pope was expected to arrive on sunday the twenty fifth of november to avoid all ceremony napoleon dressed in hunting costume left the palace an hour before noon and directed his horse to the part of the forest by which the pope was to arrive as soon as his carriage stopped on meeting the emperor the pope descended and napoleon dismounted the two illustrious sovereigns embraced cordially and then entered the emperor's carriage which had been sent to meet them at the door of the palace the empress and the grand dignitaries of the court were gathered to meet the supreme pontiff 
dressed in a long white soutane which fell around him like the drapery of an antique statue with his face devoid of colour the pope had a most ethereal air his handsome and noble countenance his sweet expression his soft but resonant voice produced a strong impression the two sovereigns dined together and the pope retired at an early hour to rest after the fatigues of so long a journey the following day josephine managed to have a confidential interview with the pope during which she confided to him the fact that she and napoleon were only united by a civil bond she prayed him to use all his influence with the emperor to have him put an end to this situation which was filling her heart with remorse rest in peace my daughter he said on retiring that will be arranged on thursday the pope made his entry into paris where he was received with the same honours accorded the emperor he was lodged at the tuileries in the pavillon de flore which had been prepared specially for his reception he arrived at the palace about eight o'clock in the evening in the same carriage with the emperor josephine who had left fontainebleau in the morning had reached paris a few hours earlier all paris was excited over the approach of the great day the hotels were crowded with strangers who had come from far and near to be present at the ceremony all the shops were working night and day to have the uniforms and the robes ready in time the ladies were to wear ball dresses with trains with a collarette of blonde lace called cherusque which fastened upon the two shoulders and rising quite high behind the head recalled the fashions of the time of catherine de medicis the costumes of the men were also very rich a week before the ceremony the painter isabey received from the emperor an order to make seven sketches representing the number of principal scenes in the spectacle at the cathedral to prepare seven such designs each containing over a hundred figures in the short time at his disposal was manifestly out of the question in this dilemma isabey conceived the ingenious idea of purchasing a hundred dolls and dressing them to represent the various personages these he placed in a plan in relief of the interior of notre dame and took them to the emperor napoleon was much amused and also much pleased at this solution of the problem and the miniature stage with the puppets was used to instruct the actors as to their roles in the spectacle the pope kept his promise to josephine and on the night before the coronation cardinal fesch at an altar erected in the emperor's cabinet performed the religious marriage of napoleon and josephine no witnesses were present but after the ceremony the cardinal gave josephine a formal certificate of her marriage which she always carefully guarded at last the great day arrived the second of december dawned cold and foggy but the bright sun soon dissipated the mists at an early hour the streets were crowded with spectators and windows along the route of the procession rented as high as three hundred francs before the departure for notre dame the ladies of the palace were introduced to the apartment of the empress their costumes were very brilliant but they paled before those of the imperial family josephine resplendent with diamonds her hair dressed in the mode of louis quatorze did not appear over twenty-five she wore a robe and court mantle of silver brocade embroidered with golden bees the imperial emblem she had a headband of diamonds a necklace earrings and a girdle of very great value all of which she wore with her accustomed grace the pope left the tuileries at nine o'clock in a carriage drawn by eight dapple grey horses according to roman usage he was preceded by one of his camerieri mounted upon a mule and bearing a large cross this unaccustomed sight greatly amused the parisians the emperor and empress started over an hour later their carriage which is still preserved in the museum of the grand Trianon at versailles was drawn by eight cream-coloured horses covered with brilliant harnesses it was decorated with allegorical paintings on a gold background and all the panels were of glass so that the sovereigns could be seen from every side they left the tuileries by way of the carousel and followed the rue saint honore as the rue de rivoli was not then completed marshal murat at the head of twenty squadrons of cavalry led the way and eighteen six-horse carriages followed with the principal personages of the court the streets were guarded by a double line of infantry who kept back the crowds arrived at the palace of the archbishop napoleon put on the coronation costume over a narrow robe of white satin he wore a heavy mantle of crimson velvet on his head he placed a crown of golden laurels on his neck 
the collar of the Légion d'honneur in diamonds. At his side, a sword ornamented with the regent diamond. After the high mass, the Pope blessed the imperial ornaments and then returned them to the emperor. The ring which he placed upon his finger, the sword which he replaced in its sheath, the mantle which was attached to his shoulders by the chamberlains, then the scepter and the hand of justice which he gave to the arch-treasurer and the arch-chancellor. The only ornament which remained to be handed to the emperor was the crown. As the Pope was about to proceed with this final act of the ceremony, Napoleon took from his hands the emblem of supreme power and proudly placed it himself upon his head. It had been arranged that the train of the mantle of the Empress should be borne by the five imperial princesses, Julie and Hortense, the wives of Joseph and Louis, and the three sisters of the Emperor, Elisa, Pauline, and Caroline. It was not without violent protest that Napoleon's sisters accepted this servile role. When the moment arrived for Josephine to take her part in the ceremony, she arose and advanced towards the steps of the altar where the Emperor awaited her. All the ladies of the palace arose at the same time, and the princesses who formed her service d'honneur proceeded to perform their duty. The mantle of the empress, of red velvet embroidered with golden bees and lined with ermine, was very heavy, and the role of the princesses was far from being merely honorary. The three sisters entirely neglected their part, and the empress was unable to move forward. The quick eye of Napoleon at once took in the situation, and a few sharp words to his sisters quelled the mutiny. Arrived before the altar, Josephine knelt, joined her hands, and gracefully bowed her form. Napoleon then placed upon her head the small closed crown surmounted by a cross. He even seemed to take a loving pleasure in carefully arranging it upon her hair. Josephine had never been so happy or seemed so charming as on this occasion. Isabe, who had touched up her features with his painter's art, had removed the traces of time, and she looked fifteen years younger than her real age. The head of Josephine in David's well-known painting is a faithful representation of her appearance on this day. Mademoiselle Evrillon writes in her memoir, Never have I seen upon any countenance an expression of joy, of satisfaction, of happiness, which could be compared to that which animated the face of the Empress. She was radiant. The crown placed upon her brow by the hands of her august spouse had assured her future, and seemed for all time to have ended the rumors of divorce with which she had been so often tormented. After the ceremony the procession returned to the Tuileries by way of the boulevards and the present Rue Royale, and entered the palace from the gardens. The day had been long and tiresome, and Napoleon was glad to resume his modest uniform of colonel of the chasseurs de la garde. He dined alone with Josephine, whom he begged to retain the diadem which she wore so gracefully, and which became her so well. He was in excellent humor, and paid his wife a thousand compliments, saying that she was the most charming empress in the world. The coronation was followed by a series of fêtes. On the 5th of December the emperor distributed to the army the imperial eagles. The ceremony took place on the Champ de Mars in the presence of the Empress and all the high dignitaries of the Empire. Unfortunately, the weather was terrible. An icy rain fell in torrents and the field was a sea of mud. Notwithstanding the storm, the streets along the route of the procession were crowded with spectators. In the evening there was a grand banquet served in the Galerie de Diane at the Tuileries. The table of the sovereigns was placed on a magnificent dais. The empress was seated in the centre with the emperor at her right and the pope at her left. Of all the entertainments, the finest was that given by the marshals at the Opéra on the 7th of January, 1805. The hall was transformed into a magnificent ballroom by a floor built over the parquet on a level with the stage. The marshals arrived at eight o'clock, the empress at ten, and the emperor an hour later. After a concert, the ball was opened by Prince Louis, Marshal Murat, Eugène de Beauharnais, and Marshal Berthier, who danced with the four imperial princesses. The emperor twice made the tour of the room and then retired at an early hour. The last of the fête was the baptism on the 24th of March at Saint-Cloud of Napoleon Louis, the second son of Louis and Hortense. The ceremony was performed by the Pope himself a week before his departure for Rome. 
josephine had been the godmother of the older boy but on this occasion madame mere was chosen to fill the role josephine was entirely satisfied as this baptism seemed to seal the reconciliation between the two families and assure her future as well as that of her grandson from this date up to the time of the divorce there were no more solemn baptisms napoleon and josephine indeed promised to give their names to many children but the emperor always put off the ceremony which finally took place at fontainebleau in november eighteen ten but on this occasion there was another marraine and the numerous josephine were presented at the font by a new empress who was called marie louise End of chapters 15 and 16chapter seventeen and eighteen of napoleon and josephine the rise of the empire by walter gear this librivox recording is in the public domain seventeen eighteen hundred four to eighteen hundred nine daily life of the empress abandoning for a moment the chronological sequence of events let us endeavour to depict josephine's mode of life during the time that her career was linked with the empire from the eighteenth of may eighteen hundred four when she was saluted as empress at st cloud to the fifteenth of december eighteen hundred nine when her marriage was dissolved at the tuileries to frederic masson of the academie francaise we owe many interesting details of the existence of the empress at this time during these five years and a half josephine passed less than twelve months in all at the tuileries she lived thirteen months at st cloud eight at malmaison and four at fontainebleau she went twice to plombieres and once to aix-la-chapelle for the baths she lived six months at strasbourg and four at mayence she visited germany italy and belgium the borders of the rhine and all of the centre and south of france to follow her in her journeys to trace her itinerary would be both tedious and unprofitable wherever she lived her surroundings were practically the same and the details of her daily life never varied in the endeavour to emancipate himself from a part of the slavery to which the sovereigns of france had always submitted napoleon divided his existence into two parts one the exterior which belonged to the public the other the interior which was intimate and private the first had for its theatre the state apartments the second was passed in the private rooms but for the empress this division was more apparent than real the two lives were constantly overlapping now that the tuileries have been destroyed for fifty years it is difficult to give any clear idea of the apartments occupied by josephine and especially so as she was continually changing the arrangement of the rooms the appartement d'honneur of the empress was entered from the carousel at the corner of the pavillon de flore the windows in the salons were so high from the floor that a person when seated could not see out but napoleon would allow no alterations made as it would have injured the appearance of the facade of the palace on the other side the private rooms which faced on the gardens were only separated from the public sidewalk by a low terrace and it was possible for any passer-by to see into the windows again the emperor refused to have any change made which would have deprived the parisians of the privilege of passing through the gardens it was not until the days of the people's king louis philippe that the windows were cut down and a part of the gardens was reserved the private apartment of josephine comprised only a library a bedroom a dressing-room and bathroom all these rooms on the ground floor faced on the gardens and were the same that josephine and hortense had occupied when they first came to the tuileries the personal suite of the emperor on the first floor was reached by several private staircases one of which ascended from josephine's bedchamber these stairways were so narrow that two persons could not pass the rooms on the gardens were separated from those on the court by a long dark corridor above a part of josephine's suite there was a mezzanine floor or entresol in which were located her wardrobes the decorations of her apartment made at the beginning of the consulate had never pleased josephine who wished above all to have a handsome bedroom accordingly when she was absent in germany in eighteen hundred six her rooms were entirely redecorated and refurnished by fontaine in a truly imperial style at a cost of one hundred thousand francs but josephine considered the work frightful and a year later gave orders to have it all done over to suit her own taste in the budget of eighteen hundred eight 
the emperor allowed a credit of sixty thousand francs for this work but the final cost exceeded a quarter of a million this time the architects discouraged by so many contradictory orders decided to follow their own ideas when josephine returned from bayonne the work was all finished she was furious because her orders had been disregarded the decorations were heavy and out of style the furniture was too plain and too cheap she went to live at the elysee and with her numerous absences from paris never again occupied the tuileries for more than three months up to the day of her divorce at the time of his second marriage therefore napoleon did not think it necessary to make any great alterations for marie louise in the rooms which josephine had hardly used the arrangement of josephine's rooms at st cloud was very similar to that at the tuileries except that they were located on the first floor and were decorated in a more modern and more feminine style napoleon who liked everything severe but handsome was not pleased with the furniture which he did not consider in accord with the majesty of his person and his reign he said that josephine's apartment was fit only for a fille entretenue most of the visitors did not agree with this opinion they considered the rooms in good taste and much pleasanter than those in the tuileries on the walls were hung many fine paintings taken from the musee napoleon in the salon of the empress there was a handsome portrait of madame mere by gerard but what attracted the most attention was a large mirror in one piece over the mantel this was mounted on a back of solid silver which disappeared when a spring was pressed and furnished a fine perspective of the park with the fountains the vases and statues the chamber of josephine was particularly attractive with the bed in the form of a small boat of mahogany ornamented with gilded bronze and mirrors on all sides the bathroom was entirely in marble with painted antique friezes at st cloud the etiquette was somewhat relaxed and the life more private it was possible to walk in the restricted gardens and to make extended excursions in carriages through the park and in the neighbourhood particularly to malmaison to give an idea of the tastes and occupations of josephine we will trace briefly the routine of one day if the emperor had passed the night in her apartment he rose at eight o'clock and at paris ascended or at st cloud descended to his own rooms only at st cloud there was no private staircase and he was forced to pass through a long corridor to reach the public stairway then the empress's women entered and drew the curtains for her first repast josephine drank in bed a cup of infusion or a lemonade she always wore a nightcap of percale or embroidered muslin trimmed with lace although she had no end of night dresses she usually wore a chemise over which at night she put on a camisole the door was then opened for the entrance of her favourite pug dog fortuné an ugly mongrel cur this was a successor to the dog of the same name under whose collar she concealed her letters at the calme in seventeen ninety four that one had been killed at montebello never later than nine o'clock josephine enters her dressing-room where she always passes at least three hours of her day for she never neglects the mysterious rites of her toilette under the empire josephine had no less than twelve attendants to care for her person and her wardrobe but the two premières femmes were only there for the etiquette and had few functions to perform beyond drawing their salary of six thousand francs the four femmes de chambre were pretty young girls who after the end of eighteen hundred five were called dames d'annonce two of them were in service every other week and their duty was to announce to the empress the persons who called upon her their salary was three thousand francs a year the real attendants of josephine were the garde d'atour madame mallet and the four femmes de garde-robe of whom one was mademoiselle avrion who in her memoir calls herself première femme de chambre de l'impératrice these women were the ones who entered into the familiarity of the empress and were most in her confidence to them josephine entrusted not only her jewels and her robes but also her most secret thoughts to them she made presents of five hundred or a thousand francs at a time gave them dots when they were married and a pension when they retired while guarding her rank josephine always treated these attendants with the greatest kindness and politeness and naturally she was adored by them for josephine the rights of her toilette were long and complicated she always took a bath every day which was rather unusual at that time but the most important act was to faire sa tête to efface the ravages of time 
in those days it was customary for all society women to employ rouge but josephine carried it to excess not content with putting a little on her cheeks she covered her entire face with powder and rouge the eye of napoleon was so accustomed to this excess of colour that he thought any woman who did not show it must be ill go on and put on some rouge madame he said to one you look like a corpse on the other hand napoleon could not endure the scent of any perfume except a little lavender water or eau de cologne the intricate details of her toilette completed josephine dresses for the morning from her five hundred chemises she selects one of muslin percale or batiste embroidered at the bottom and trimmed at the neck and sleeves with maline or valenciennes the plainest ones cost a hundred francs and some of them three times that amount as josephine changes all her linen three times a day the number of the garments is not so extraordinary she almost always wears white silk stockings costing from twenty to seventy francs a pair no garters as the new silk stockings stay in place in the morning she puts on house shoes of taffetas or satin at eight francs the pair of which she orders over five hundred a year she usually wears a light corset of lined percale trimmed with valenciennes for which she pays about forty francs after the corset she puts on a flimsy petticoat of percale trimmed with her favorite lace that is all absolutely all josephine n'a dans sa garde-robe que deux pantalons en soie de couleur chair pour monter à cheval when josephine has put on a peignoir her coiffeur herbeau is introduced he is an important personage in embroidered costume with a sword by his side and receives in salary and gifts eight thousand francs a year but herbeau is only employed on ordinary occasions for days of ceremony there is duplan who is paid twelve thousand francs and later in the time of marie louise receives the magnificent salary of forty-two thousand francs it is impossible to attempt to describe the coiffures employed by josephine for they varied from day to day her hair was of a decidedly auburn shade and in colour and thickness remained the same to the end of her life after these first details which had consumed much time there was a regular council of war as to the robe the hat and the wrap to be selected in summer her dresses were of muslin batiste or percale and she had over two hundred to select from in winter she wore cloth or velvet gowns of which she had no less than six or seven hundred in her wardrobe to wear with these costumes there were endless wraps of every possible material mostly trimmed with the rarest and most expensive furs josephine always wore a hat in the morning and frequently also in the evening her choice was limited to two hundred and fifty all different in form colour and trimming twice a year she went carefully through her wardrobe and gave away a large part of her collection most of the articles some of which she had never used were presented to her femme de chambre but even madame mere and the queens of naples and westphalia did not disdain to accept such gifts in six years josephine spent for her wardrobe the enormous sum of a million and a half and this did not include accounts not settled or costumes for ceremonies like the coronation for which the emperor made her a special allowance in addition during the same period she spent over five million francs for jewellery when napoleon after her divorce paid up all her debts her total expenditures for the six years reached the enormous total of six million six hundred forty seven thousand five hundred eighty francs or an average of more than a million francs a year when we consider that the empress had the use of the finest crown jewels in the world valued at over five millions it is difficult to understand why she made all these purchases for her own private collection her motive does not seem to have been to accumulate a reserve for use in case of necessity but rather a real mania for spending money her collection which she left to hortense was appraised after her death at over four million francs which was probably a third less than the actual value we have at first hand the story of the scene which preceded the first payment of her debts in eighteen hundred six josephine came to the table with tears in her eyes napoleon leaned over and whispered to her well madame you are in debt no reply except a sob you owe a million no sire i swear that i only owe six hundred thousand only that you say does that seem to you only a bagatelle 
he adds a few words of reproach and she begins to sob louder than ever then he whispers again come josephine come my little one do not cry compose yourself and the debts are paid after she was dressed josephine received her physician she had a constitution of iron and was rarely ill but she was a malade imaginaire and was always taking medicine corvisar the chief physician of the emperor generally succeeded in curing her by a prescription made up of bread pills at eleven o'clock precisely for she was punctuality personified josephine entered the salon jaune where were introduced the ladies she had invited for dejeuner the menu which was usually prepared for ten persons comprised a soup two relevés six entrées two roasts six entremets and six dishes of dessert a bottle of bone and two bottles of fine bourgogne were served coffee was taken at the table and a half bottle of liqueur was provided josephine who ate but little did the honours with charming courtesy drawing out her guest to tell her all the latest gossip of the city and the court which the emperor was always interested in hearing repeated napoleon usually took a hasty breakfast on a little table in his cabinet but sometimes he came down and joined his wife's party after breakfast josephine returned to the salon to walk in the gardens was impossible and the only exercise she took at paris was an occasional game of billiards she rarely read anything and never called upon her ladies to read for her but she was fond of conversation and there was always someone with whom to talk at five o'clock josephine went to her rooms to change her toilette for dinner which was served at the early hour of six o'clock she changed completely and selected an evening gown which was always very décolleté in the evening she always wore a great many jewels her toilette finished josephine waits for the préfet du palais to announce that the emperor is ready to go to dinner sometimes absorbed in his work napoleon forgets that he has not dined and she waits one hour two occasionally three or four she is never impatient and never disturbs napoleon at his work she passes the time in conversation with her ladies when the emperor is ready she goes to the room where the dinner is served sometimes in her apartment and sometimes in that of napoleon on the floor above at paris they usually dined alone except sundays when there was a family party after dinner napoleon always went to josephine's salon where she herself served the coffee unless they were going out to the theatre or there was a ball concert or spectacle at the chateau which happened about twice a week the emperor remained for a short time and talked with any dignitaries who had called he then returned to his cabinet and josephine passed the evening in conversation or in a game of backgammon or whist both of which games she played remarkably well quite often the emperor after he had retired for the night sent for her to read to him as he loved the sound of her voice as soon as he was asleep she returned to her salon and resumed her game at midnight all visitors departed and josephine made her toilette for the night which took nearly as long as that of the morning in this also she was elegant said the emperor she was graceful even in going to bed eighteen eighteen hundred five italy and strasbourg on the second of april eighteen hundred five napoleon left fontainebleau for milan where he was to be crowned as king of italy he had not intended to take josephine with him but she pleaded so warmly that he finally yielded the first night was spent at troyes and the following day the emperor went alone to brienne to see the school where he had received his first education he slept at the chateau and the following morning without any escort he visited the old familiar scenes of his boyhood following the usual route via macon the imperial party reached lyon a week later in order not to fatigue the empress napoleon had arranged to stop every night in some city instead of travelling night and day as was his regular habit the sovereigns usually stayed at the prefecture where they found the dinner ready to serve and the lodgings prepared by the servants sent in advance at lyon they descended at the palace of the archbishop cardinal fesch who had recently been appointed to this see the entire journey from fontainebleau had been a triumphal march the villagers had flocked from far and near to line the route and cheer their emperor with an enthusiasm which at that time was as sincere as it was spontaneous it was three hours after noon when the party entered lyons and the entire populace of the second city of france had gathered to acclaim the emperor 
napoleon had done much to increase the prosperity of this large silk manufacturing town and he was extremely popular there after a sojourn of five days they left for turin by way of Monsigny. the fine road over the alps constructed by napoleon was not yet completed and to cross the mountains chaises a porteurs were provided for the women and mules for the men the pope who had left fontainebleau two days after the emperor was still at turin where he had stopped for a short rest on his way to rome as he occupied the palace the emperor deferred for several days his entry into the capital and stopped at an old villa of the king of sardinia a few miles from the city before proceeding to milan the party turned aside to visit alessandria here the fifth of may the emperor held a grand review on the field where five years before he had gained the great victory of marengo he had brought from paris and wore again on this occasion the old and faded uniform the shapeless hat and the heavy sabre which recalled so many glorious memories the manoeuvres were directed by eugene under the orders of the emperor and napoleon expressed to josephine his satisfaction with the manner in which her son had performed his task on the following day napoleon saw jerome for the first time since his brother's marriage jerome had arrived at lisbon with his wife during the month of april he was allowed to land but under orders from the emperor she was forced to re-embark for england jerome was summoned to meet the emperor in italy and travelled there post haste after a decisive interview with napoleon he basely agreed to abandon his wife and her unborn child and was again restored to favour on the eighth of may the emperor entered milan where his welcome was not so spontaneous as in the cities of piedmont napoleon was much disappointed at the lack of real enthusiasm and spoke of it to josephine his coronation as king of italy took place on the twenty sixth may in the cathedral the weather was perfect and the city was crowded with spectators the ceremonies were similar to those at notre dame but on a much smaller scale cardinal caprara the archbishop of milan officiated napoleon himself placed upon his head the celebrated iron crown of the ancient kings of lombardy at the same time using the traditional formula god gave it me woe to him who touches it josephine although she bore the title of queen of italy was not crowned as at paris and was present at the ceremony only as a spectator after our return to the palace writes mademoiselle avrion i was occupied in the room of the empress when the emperor entered he was full of glee he laughed rubbed his hands together and said with great good humour well mademoiselle did you have a good view of the ceremony did you hear what i said in placing the crown upon my head then he repeated in nearly the same tone he had used in the cathedral dieu me l'a donné car à qui y touche i replied that nothing had escaped me he was most amiable to me and i have often remarked that when nothing disturbed the emperor he was very familiar with the persons of his household he spoke to us with a sort of bonhomie of freedom as if he were our equal often he gave us a little tap or pulled our ears it was a favour which he did not accord to everybody and we could judge of the extent of his good humour by the greater or less degree of pain that he caused us very frequently he did the same to the empress when we were dressing her he gave her some taps playfully upon the shoulders it was useless for her to cry fini don fini don bonaparte he continued as long as the play amused him on the tenth of june the emperor announced the appointment of eugene as viceroy of italy this elevation of her son which should have delighted josephine was only a cause of chagrin she shed tears at the thought of being separated from her child one day when the emperor found her very sad he said you weep josephine it is not reasonable do you cry because you are going to be separated from your son if the absence of your children causes you so much grief judge what i myself must endure the attachment to them which you show makes me cruelly feel the misfortune of not having any these words were far from assuaging the grief of the empress they raised once more the dreaded spectre of divorce napoleon certainly had no idea of increasing her grief and josephine could not let him see what an interpretation she put upon his speech the emperor says mademoiselle avrion was one of the best husbands that i have ever known when the empress was indisposed he passed by her side all the time that he could take from his affairs 
he always came to her before retiring and very often when he awoke during the night he came himself or sent his mameluke to have news of her majesty he had for her the most tender regard and it is only true to say that she fully returned it nothing that i say here would seem exaggerated if others like myself could have witnessed the proofs of affection which they both displayed and i am certain that when political reasons forced them to separate all the grief was not on one side on the tenth of june the emperor left milan for a visit to the austrian frontier and the famous quadrilateral the scene of so many of his brilliant victories three days later he held another grand review of his troops on the battlefield of castiglione josephine took advantage of his absence to make with a few attendants the tour of the italian lakes she was happy to be free for a few days from the irksome etiquette which the presence of the emperor always imposed on her return to milan she dismissed most of her suite who were to leave directly for paris and with a few attendants proceeded to bologna where she rejoined the emperor in this city the new sovereigns of italy received a very warm greeting which partially atoned for the coldness of the milanais on the last day of june the party arrived at genoa well named the superb where they had a brilliant reception during the following week there was a succession of magnificent fêtes to celebrate the incorporation of the ancient republic in the french empire later on the sixth of july a special courier from paris brought to the emperor the news of the formation of the third coalition and at ten o'clock that evening he set out for turin where he arrived early on the following morning he then told the empress of his intention to start the next day post haste for paris leaving her to follow him more leisurely josephine begged to accompany him and the emperor finally consented on her promise not to have one of her headaches the party started in three carriages one for the emperor and empress another for the grand officers of the household and a third for the service with a small escort of cavalry but after crossing Montseny, the emperor travelled so rapidly that the other carriages and the escort were left far behind napoleon and josephine reached fontainebleau about ten o'clock on the night of the eleventh of july after an absence of exactly one hundred days four days later the emperor wrote to jeanne i arrived eighty-five hours after my departure from turin nevertheless i lost three hours on Montseny, and i stopped constantly on account of the empress one or two hours to breakfast and one or two hours to dine made me lose eight or ten hours more the express trains via the Montseny tunnel now make the run of about four hundred forty miles in fourteen hours allowing for the delays of which he speaks and the longer distance by road the emperor made the trip in about seventy hours at the rate of nearly seven miles an hour the arrival of the emperor at fontainebleau was so unexpected that there was no one to receive him except the concierge of the palace an old servant named gaillot who had been his cook in egypt come my good fellow said the emperor you must resume your old calling you must get us some supper fortunately gaillot had in his larder some mutton chops and some eggs and napoleon and josephine ate the simple repast with a good appetite a week later the emperor reached st cloud while the thunder of the cannon of the invalides announced his return to the capital the same evening after a call on madame mere the sovereigns attended the opera where they received a warm welcome from the audience on the second day of august the emperor left st cloud for a month's tour of inspection of the grand army which was in cantonments along the channel prepared for a descent on england here ten days later he received news that admiral villeneuve after an indecisive action with the english fleet of ferrol had set sail for cadiz instead of brest as ordered losing no time in vain regrets over the failure of his well-laid plans napoleon called deru to his headquarters at pont de brique at four o'clock in the morning and dictated at one sitting the plan of the austrian campaign as far as vienna in the meantime josephine had gone to her favourite watering-place plombiere to take the baths what a marvellous change in her fortunes since her earlier visit as madame bonaparte after the departure of her husband for egypt then after her accident she was almost alone and hortense was called in haste from st germain to nurse her mother now a company of infantry is sent to escort her majesty from nancy to plombieres there are receptions by authorities civil and military addresses and salutes triumphal arches at the gates of the cities 
at plombieres illuminations and fireworks she is accompanied by a préfet du palais an écuyer d'honneur a dame d'honneur and two dames du palais five femmes de chambre and a score or more of servants the charges for the post going and coming amount to nearly forty thousand francs and the entire expenses of the trip total over one hundred thirty four thousand francs by way of diversion josephine had her portrait painted by a very popular artist named laurent whom she met at plombieres for this small full-length portrait eighteen inches by fifteen she paid six thousand francs except for a few excursions in the neighborhood this was the only occupation of her days at bondy on her return she was greeted by the prefect and all the authorities she survived the addresses and without any escort continued her journey to malmaison which she reached the last of august on the twenty fourth september between four and five o'clock in the morning accompanied by josephine napoleon left st cloud to put himself at the head of the grand army which exactly four weeks before had begun its march from the channel to the rhine the journey of three hundred fifteen miles to strasbourg was made in sixty hours without any stop in accompanying the emperor to strasbourg and taking up her residence there josephine's thought was to escape from the parisian addresses which bored her from the surveillance of her brothers-in-law and from the ennui of the palace of st cloud she was amused with the new entertainment in the ancient capital of alsace josephine lived in the episcopal mansion at the foot of the cathedral it was a real palace completed in seventeen forty one and entirely modern in its appointments built by the first bishop of the house of rohan armand gaston cardinal and grand almoner it had been visited by louis the fifteenth in seventeen forty four and had received marie antoinette on her arrival in france as dauphine in seventeen seventy sold early in the revolution as national property it had been bought by the city and become the seat of the municipal administration after the foundation of the empire the city had offered the palace to the state as one of the four imperial residences to be established at the four principal points of the empire from boulogne the emperor had ordered duroc to send fontaine to strasbourg to put the mansion in order to receive him in less than two weeks the architect cleared out the clerks and the archives cleaned redecorated and refurnished the palace all at a cost not much exceeding two hundred thousand francs furniture was collected from the neighboring cities and chateaux linen glass and silver were sent from paris three days before the emperor's arrival all was ready even to the carriages and horses in the stables the private suite of the emperor facing on the court comprised five rooms while in the rear fronting on the terrace of the ill were the state apartments seven magnificent salons on the first floor on the first and second floors there were fourteen small rooms at the disposal of the empress the quarters were not very commodious but she was satisfied the emperor remained only four days at strasbourg and then proceeded to the headquarters of the army the life of josephine after his departure was one continual round of dinners balls concerts and spectacles in two months bosset the prefect of the palace paid out over two hundred thousand francs for the running expenses of the household as the success of the emperor became known there were visits from all of the south german princes josephine received the homage rendered her she missed no ceremony she remained until the end of all the balls she gave and had a smile and a polite word for every one not content with enjoying all the pleasures of the city josephine indulged to the limit her mania for spending everything that was offered she bought pictures porcelains plants living animals all of which went to swell her collection at malmaison with the expenses of the palace she left over a million francs behind her in strasbourg the story of the campaign of eighteen hundred five is told in the letters which napoleon wrote almost daily from every bivouac from every field of battle came one of his letters not burning and delirious as nine years before but full of tenderness and loving thought to the empress at strasbourg etlingen two october eighteen hundred five i am still here and in good health the grand manoeuvres have begun the army of wurtemberg and baden is now united with mine i am in a good position and i love thee napoleon Ludwigsburg, 
fourth october i leave to-night there is nothing new the bavarians have united with my army i am well in a few days i hope to have something interesting to tell you take care of yourself and believe me ever yours napoleon ludwigsburg fifth october i leave at once to continue my march you will be five or six days without news of me do not be anxious for that is due to the operations which are about to take place all goes well and as i expected adieu mon ami i love and embrace thee napoleon on the sixth of october the emperor surveyed the passage of the danube at donaworth and passed the night at nodlingen where on the following day he issued the first of the famous bulletins of the grand army he remained in this vicinity for four days directing the passage of the river by the troops of murat and the operations which followed he reached augsburg on the night of the tenth and lodged with the former elector of treves to the empress at strasbourg augsburg ten october i have been on the move for a week the campaign has opened favourably i am very well although it has rained nearly every day events have moved rapidly i am sending to france four thousand prisoners and eight flags and have fourteen cannon taken from the enemy adieu mon ami i embrace thee napoleon two days later the french army entered munich in triumph and the emperor continued his correspondence to the empress at strasbourg augsburg twelfth october the enemy is lost everything presages the most fortunate campaign the shortest and most brilliant that i have ever made i leave in an hour for burgo i am well although the weather is frightful i change my clothes twice a day i love and embrace thee napoleon on the eve of the capitulation of ulm from his headquarters napoleon sent the good news to josephine to the empress at strasbourg erschingen eighteen october i have accomplished my purpose i have destroyed the austrian army by simple marches i have made sixty thousand prisoners taken one hundred twenty cannon more than ninety flags and more than thirty generals i am going to move on the russians they are lost i am content with my army i have lost only fifteen hundred men of whom two-thirds are but slightly wounded adieu my josephine a thousand good wishes for everybody napoleon elshingen twenty one october i am quite well my bon ami i am just starting for augsburg here thirty-three thousand men have laid down their arms i have from sixty to seventy thousand prisoners more than ninety flags and two hundred cannon never such a catastrophe in the annals of war take care of thyself i am rather tired out the weather for three days has been fine napoleon augsburg twenty three october the last two nights have rested me and i leave to-morrow for munich i long to see thee but do not count upon my sending for thee unless there is an armistice or we go into winter quarters adieu mon ami a thousand kisses napoleon munich twenty seven october i have your letter and see with regret that you were over anxious i have received reports which show all the tenderness you feel for me but you must have more strength and confidence my health is quite good you must not think of crossing the rhine under two or three weeks you must be gay enjoy yourself and hope that we shall see each other before the end of the month brumaire adieu ma bonne amie a thousand best wishes for hortense eugene and the two napoleons napoleon Haig, near Vels. three november i am in the midst of a long march the weather is very cold the earth covered with a foot of snow which is rather severe fortunately we are still in the midst of the forest and there is plenty of wood i am quite well and would like to hear from you and know that you are not anxious napoleon linz five november the weather is fine we are twenty-eight leagues from vienna i long to see you my health is good i embrace you napoleon the emperor of austria obliged to flee from his capital had taken refuge at brun where he joined the czar and his army on the thirteenth of november napoleon entered vienna and took up his residence at schonbrunn 
to the empress at strasbourg vienna fifteen november i have been here for two days and am a little fatigued i have not yet seen the city by day but have been through it at night nearly all my troops are across the danube in pursuit of the russians adieu my josephine i will send for you as soon as possible a thousand best wishes napoleon the following day the emperor sent josephine the welcome message that he had made all the arrangements for her to proceed to munich End of chapters seventeen and eighteen Chapter Nineteen of Napoleon and Josephine: The Rise of the Empire by Walter Geer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Nineteen, eighteen hundred five to eighteen hundred six, marriage of Eugène. The letter which Napoleon wrote to Josephine from Vienna on the sixteenth of November, eighteen hundred five, is interesting as showing how, in the midst of an arduous campaign, he thought of the smallest details of his wife's comfort and pleasure to the empress at strasbourg vienna sixteen november eighteen hundred five i am writing monsieur d'harville that you are to set out for munich stopping at baden and stuttgart at stuttgart you will give the wedding present to the princess paul fifteen or twenty thousand francs will be enough to pay with the balance you can make presents at munich to the daughters of the elector of bavaria be kind but receive all the homages they owe you everything but you owe them only kindness the electress of wurtemberg is a daughter of the king of england she is a good woman and you should treat her well but without affection i shall be very glad to see you the moment my affairs permit i am leaving for the front the weather is frightful it snows all the time for the rest all goes well adieu ma bonne amie napoleon as soon as she received the permission of the emperor josephine made haste to start at an early hour on the twenty eighth of november with her suite she left strasbourg amidst the cheers of the populace and the thunders of the cannon of the fortress on her arrival at Karlsruhe the same evening she was received with salvos of artillery the chateau was illuminated and the margrave was at the door to welcome her with his entire court that evening there was a banquet followed by a ball two days later she left for stuttgart where she was received with the same honours on the third december she continued her journey to munich all along the route she passed under triumphal arches and was welcomed with salutes at ulm marshal augereau who was in command had arranged a parade and a splendid fete for the evening but the empress had overtaxed her strength and was obliged to retire with a headache passing through augsburg she finally reached munich where she found awaiting her at the gates of the city the court carriages celebrated as chef dœuvre of painting and sculpture from the date of her arrival on the fifth of december until the last day of the month she was alone the time passed quickly in a succession of entertainments of every kind and josephine had scarcely a moment to herself while the empress was on her way to munich napoleon had won the great victory of austerlitz and finished his most brilliant campaign his affectionate interest in josephine is displayed in the three letters which he sent her from the field of battle to the empress at munich austerlitz three december eighteen hundred five i have beaten the russian and austrian armies commanded by the two emperors i am somewhat fatigued i have bivouacked to weaken the open air and the nights have been quite cold to-night i sleep in the chateau of prince kaunitz the russian army is not only defeated but destroyed i embrace thee napoleon austerlitz five december i have concluded a truce the russians are going back the battle of austerlitz is the finest that i have ever fought forty-five flags more than one hundred fifty cannon the standards of the russian guard twenty generals thirty thousand prisoners more than twenty thousand killed a horrible sight the emperor alexander is in despair and has set out for russia i met the emperor of germany yesterday at my bivouac and talked with him for two hours we have agreed to make peace quickly i am looking forward with great pleasure to the moment that i can join thee adieu ma bonne amie i am quite well and i long to embrace thee napoleon austerlitz seven december i have concluded an armistice in a week peace will be made 
I am anxious to know if you reached Munich in good health. Adieu, mon ami. I long to see thee again. Napoleon. But Josephine was no more prompt in answering his letters than during the campaign of Italy, and a few days later Napoleon wrote again. To the Empress at Munich. Brun, 10 December. It is a long time since I have received any news of thee. Have the fine fate of Baden, Stuttgart, and Munich made thee forget the poor soldiers covered with mud, drenched with rain and blood? I leave soon for Vienna. We are working to conclude peace. I long to be near thee. Adieu, mon ami. Napoleon. The silence of Josephine still continued, and Napoleon addressed her once more in a tone of wounded pleasantry. Vienna, 19 December. Great Empress, not a letter from you since your departure from Strasbourg. You have visited Baden, Stuttgart, and Munich without writing us a word. That is neither kind nor affectionate. Deign from the height of your grandeurs to bestow a thought upon your slaves. Napoleon. The profound egoisme of Josephine and the affectionate kindness of Napoleon were never displayed more clearly than during this separation of three months. While the emperor was risking his life and his fortunes on the snow-bound plains of Moravia, Josephine was amusing herself like a debutante at the brilliant courts of the South German princes, without a thought for anyone but herself. By her indifference and her infidelities, she had long since killed the early passionate devotion of her husband, and the day was not far distant when reasons of state would force him to stifle the feelings of tender affection which still bound him to Josephine and reluctantly decide upon a divorce. Finally, Josephine finds time to write and pleads illness as the reason for her silence. Napoleon immediately replies in a tone of tender solicitude. To the Empress at Munich. Schoenbrunn, Vienna, 20th December. I have just received your letter of the 25 Frimaire, 16 December. I am worried to learn that you are indisposed. It is not well to travel a hundred leagues at this season. I do not know what I shall do. It all depends on events. I have no volition. I await the issue. Remain at Munich. Have a good time. It is not difficult amidst such society and in so fine a country. I am myself quite busy. In several days I shall have reached a decision. Adieu, mon ami. A thousand loving thoughts. Napoleon on the last day of December at one forty five in the morning, Napoleon entered Munich under a triumphal arch. The following day the elector was proclaimed King of Bavaria. The Treaty of Presburg, signed on the twenty sixth December, gave to Bavaria, Württemberg, and Baden considerable increases of territory, also to the two electors the title of King and Napoleon had determined that these aggrandizements should be paid for by three marriages, that of his stepson Eugène with the Princess Augusta of Bavaria, that of Prince Charles of Baden with Josephine's cousin, Stéphanie de Beauharnais, and finally that of his brother Jérôme with the Princess Catherine of Württemberg. Augusta was the only daughter of Maximilian, the new king of Bavaria, by his first wife. After her death, he had married Caroline, the sister of Charles of Baden, to whom Augusta was now betrothed. The Wittelsbach family, one of the oldest and most distinguished in Europe, had ruled in Bavaria for eight centuries. But Maximilian had become elector only a few years before, upon the extinction of the senior ruling lines of the family. Belonging to the cadet branch and having no fortune in his youth before the revolution, he had served in the French army and commanded the regiment of Alsace. The happiest days of his life had been passed in France, and he was very French in his sympathies. During the Austrian War, his troops had fought with the Grand Army, and the Emperor now repaid his loyalty by raising him to the royal dignity. The Margrave of Baden, then seventy-seven years of age, had lost his only son, and his heir was his grandson Charles, a youth of twenty-two. One of the sisters of this young prince had married Alexander, the Tsar of Russia, with whom Napoleon was still at war. Another was the second wife of Maximilian, of whose daughter Augusta, Prince Charles was himself the fiancé. Here, indeed, was a matrimonial tangle which had required all of the skill of Napoleon to unravel. For some time past, the emperor had begun to lay plans for alliances with the reigning houses of Europe. 
with no children of his own three of his brothers already married and jerome for the moment unavailable he had been obliged to fall back on the family of josephine as early as the month of july eighteen hundred four he had charged his minister in bavaria to make inquiries about the young daughter of the elector and let him know if there were any projects for her marriage at that time napoleon's plans were all in the air but a year later they were definitely fixed at boulogne in september eighteen hundred five he gave instructions to monsieur de Thiard, one of his chamberlains to proceed to munich and open negotiations at the very outset Thiard encountered the obstacles already mentioned the elector with all his french sympathies could not undertake lightly to offend so many powerful dames among whom the emperor had few friends to break alliances already projected in order to conclude one with the corsican adventurer was a difficult proposition another serious obstacle was the attachment which the young princess augusta had formed for her fiance talleyrand tired of seeing the negotiations drag along and realizing the powerful effect of the emperor's victories now ordered tia to go directly to the elector and officially demand the alliance the emperor he wrote has no prince of his name available young beauharnais is free brother-in-law of an imperial prince uncle of the one who will probably be called to the succession stepson of the reigning emperor only son of the empress there is dignity for you then he drives home his argument with the words it is not necessary for me to analyze the consequences and to apply them in order to be understood by the elector of bavaria it was not necessary however for Thiel to use these instructions as the elector had already reached a decision and sent his minister to see the emperor at linz where all the arrangements were made on the fifth of november but napoleon was well aware that it was one thing to convince men and quite another to win women to his cause for this he counted on josephine ten days later he sent the empress instructions to leave her brilliant court at strasbourg and proceed to munich when josephine reached munich the first week in december she found the young princess far from ready to carry out the agreements which her father had made for her at linz a month before in spite of all the charms of josephine she continued to refuse to break her engagement to charles affairs were in this state when duroc arrived from vienna on the twenty first december to present the official demand in his letter to the elector the emperor insisted that the arrangements made at linz should be carried out and expressed his wish to see the marriage celebrated at the same moment as the conclusion of the general peace which will certainly be signed within a fortnight on christmas day the eve of the conclusion of the treaty at pressburg the elector to avoid a painful explanation writes his daughter if there were a glimmer of hope my dear augusta that you could ever wed charles i should not beg you on my knees to give him up still less should i insist that you give your hand to the future king of italy if this crown were not to be guaranteed by the powers at the conclusion of the peace and if i were not convinced of all the good qualities of prince eugene who has everything to render you happy reflect dear augusta that a refusal will make the emperor as much our enemy as he has been until now the friend of our house my very dear and tender father augusta replied i am forced to break the pledge which i have given to prince charles of baden i consent as much as that costs me if the repose of a dear father and happiness of a people depend upon it but i am not willing to give my hand to prince eugene if peace is not concluded and if he is not recognized as king of italy the emperor had not yet informed the viceroy of his plans but eugene had no doubt been notified by his mother and had raised no objections the day after his arrival at munich napoleon had a long talk with augusta and flattered himself that she was reconciled to the marriage he therefore wrote eugene that the matter was all arranged affairs of state urgently demanded the presence of the emperor at paris and he wanted to set out as soon as the contract was signed leaving josephine to represent him at the wedding but three days passed and nothing was done about the contract on the night of the third the emperor called duroc and told him that the contract must be signed at noon the next day and that it must provide for the marriage on the fifteenth accordingly the papers were signed at the same time the emperor wrote eugene to make haste to arrive as soon as possible so as to be certain to find him at munich 
napoleon had learned that the queen of bavaria was trying to delay matters with the idea of breaking off the marriage as soon as he left for paris augusta was doing her part by pretending a sudden indisposition but was quickly cured when the emperor sent his personal physician to see her napoleon made up his mind that it was necessary for him to remain at munich until after the ceremony in the meantime he left nothing undone to remove the petty obstacles to the marriage he ordered from paris as a wedding present magnificent jewels costing over two hundred thousand francs and directed each of his brothers and sisters to send gifts to the value of at least fifteen or twenty thousand francs the opposition of the queen was the most difficult thing to overcome for she had two special grievances the execution of the duc d'anguin and the breaking of the engagement with prince charles napoleon was assiduous in his attentions to the queen and was so devoted that he even aroused the jealousy of josephine the queen was not over thirty she had beautiful eyes a countenance full of life and a fine figure what woman could resist the attentions of a man as fascinating as napoleon when he wished to please meanwhile eugene had made haste leaving padua on the sixth the day he received the emperor's letter he crossed the mountains on the eighth and reached munich two days later at this time eugene was twenty-four years of age without being in any way remarkable his face was pleasing he was well built with a good figure of medium height he excelled in all physical exercises and like his father was a beautiful dancer kind frank simple in his manners without hauteur he was affable with everybody he had a sunny disposition and was always gay napoleon was very fond of him and treated him like a son as soon as he saw eugene the emperor ordered him to shave off his moustache which might displease the princess at the time of her marriage augusta was only seventeen she was tall well formed with a sylph-like figure and a countenance in which kindness was mingled with dignity she had received an excellent education and had a good head for affairs as plainly appears in her letter to her father eugene showed all of his mother's savoir-faire in his attentions to his future wife and courted her as warmly as if their marriage were not already arranged the fears of the young princess soon turned to joy and what was to have been a mariage de convenance became a real love-match the contract was signed on the thirteenth january in the grand gallery of the royal palace the exact terms never became public as the contract was not read as usual and the copy which napoleon sent joseph for deposit in the archives of the empire was afterwards withdrawn by order of the emperor it is known however that napoleon refused absolutely to appoint eugene king of italy or even to name him as heir to the throne except in case of failure of his own children natural and legitimate eugene henceforth was termed by the emperor mon fils instead of mon cousin he had the qualification of imperial and royal highness he passed the first after the emperor before joseph and louis in the imperial almanac he was called the adopted son of the emperor after the contract was signed marais the secretary of state performed the civil marriage which he really was not legally qualified to do the following day the fourteenth of january eighteen hundred six the religious ceremony was celebrated in the royal chapel thus napoleon has forced his entrance into the family of european sovereigns by an alliance with the ancient house of wittelsbach which claims charlemagne for its founder and so through his adopted son becomes related to most of the reigning families this first attempt of napoleon as a matchmaker was a great success eugene and augusta lived very happily together and after the fall of the empire she resisted all the entreaties of her family to abandon her husband their six children all made distinguished marriages eugene the eldest son married the queen of portugal and his brother max espoused the daughter of the czar of russia of the four daughters josephine married the crown prince of sweden eugenie a hohenzollern prince amelie the first emperor of brazil dom pedro and the youngest daughter the count of wurtemberg a week after the wedding prince eugene and his wife left munich for milan napoleon and josephine were already on their way to paris where they arrived on the night of the twenty sixth of january at paris the news of the victory of austerlitz had been received with transports of joy even madame de rimusat so severe so implacable for napoleon 
in her memoir composed after the restoration wrote her husband on the eighteenth december eighteen hundred five you cannot imagine how every head is turned every one sings the praises of the emperor i was so wrought up that i think if the emperor had appeared at that moment i should have thrown myself upon his neck ready afterwards to beg pardon at his feet the prolongation of the emperor's stay at munich had only served to increase the impatience of the parisians and had well prepared the stage for his return the bank of france to celebrate the occasion resumed specie payments on the fourth february there was a gala performance at the opera when napoleon entered with josephine during the second act the performance was interrupted while the whole audience arose and cheered soon after his return to paris the emperor carried out the second part of his scheme for alliances with the royal families of europe on the eighth of april eighteen hundred six in the chapel of the tuileries was celebrated with great pomp the marriage of charles of baden and stephanie de beauharnais prince charles then twenty-three years of age without being exactly ugly had a very plain face his pink and white complexion and his chubby figure gave him the appearance of a dutch doll and his extreme timidity contributed an air of awkwardness but these apparent defects were only superficial on better acquaintance one could appreciate the rare and excellent qualities of his heart the refinement of his feelings he had that true spirit of kindness which inspires more affection than qualities more brilliant stephanie who was born in paris on the twenty eighth of august seventeen eighty nine was a distant cousin of josephine's first husband alexandre de beauharnais abandoned by her father comte claude de beauharnais when he emigrated at the beginning of the revolution the child had owed her existence to the charity of friends at the end of eighteen hundred four she was brought to paris and placed in the school of madame campan by the express orders of the emperor who was indignant at josephine's treatment of her niece à la mode de bretagne on his return to paris after the austerlitz campaign napoleon installed the young girl in the tuileries and soon became very much interested in her with her golden hair her blue eyes her slight form her free ways this girl of sixteen greatly attracted the emperor and especially so because she showed not the slightest timidity in his presence the first week in march she was formally adopted by the emperor who gave her a dot of a million and a half on the day of her marriage besides a magnificent collection of jewels and a trousseau selected by josephine which was in excellent taste and of rare elegance this marriage made under such auspicious circumstances seemed to promise a happy future but these hopes were disappointed at least at first charles on account of his timidity failed to win the love of his wife who was too young and too frivolous to appreciate his really fine qualities but as the old french proverb says tu viens à point à qui sait attendre everything comes to him who waits the eyes of stephanie were finally opened and she came to love her husband very dearly so this union ended as so many others begin in perfect happiness their greatest trial was the loss of their two sons who died soon after birth both of them still young charles and his wife had every reason to hope for another son but it was not to be in december eighteen eighteen charles died suddenly at the age of thirty-five this made a great change in the position of stephanie the previous year charles had issued a pragmatic sanction ensuring the succession to the crown to the counts of hochberg the issue of a morganatic marriage between his grandfather the grand duke charles frederick and the countess hochberg stephanie won the warm affections of the grand ducal family and of her subjects her death in eighteen sixty during the second empire was deeply regretted in baden as well as at paris where she was a frequent visitor her eldest daughter louise married prince gustave de vaza and became the mother of the queen of saxony the second josephine married prince charles of hohenzollern and was the mother of the first king of roumania as well as that of that prince who in eighteen seventy was the indirect cause of the franco-german war prince louis napoleon wanted to marry the youngest daughter but stephanie thought that her visionary cousin was not a good match for her child so marie became duchess of hamilton instead of empress of the french End of chapter 19chapter twenty of napoleon and josephine the rise of the empire by walter gear this librivox recording is in the public domain 
twenty, eighteen hundred six, Queen Hortense. On Thursday, the fifth of June, eighteen hundred six, at the Tuileries, Louis Bonaparte was proclaimed King of Holland. He seems to have accepted his new dignity with much reluctance, not that he felt unequal to the position, for he believed himself superior to any task, but because he feared the dominating force of his brother that the emperor in sending louis to holland intended to make that country in fact a part of the grand empire clearly appears in his formal address in effect he said to louis you are first of all a frenchman you are constable of the empire you are the guardian of my strong places the interest of france commands you must obey louis in substance replied i am a hollander the people who acclaim me look to me for their happiness if louis was not fully satisfied for her part hortense was in despair she felt that it was almost an act of suicide for her to leave paris to go to this distant country so cold and damp to be shut up with a husband she detested after their marriage in january eighteen hundred two louis and hortense had resided in the little hotel loaned them by napoleon in the rue de la victoire almost from the first day they quarrelled over josephine whom louis disliked and whom he wished as far as possible to keep separated from her daughter he soon left paris and was absent for many months practically abandoned by her husband the second month of her marriage hortense spent most of the spring and summer with napoleon and josephine at the tuileries and malmaison during the three weeks that her mother went to plombieres hortense did the honours of the chateau the situation was rather equivocal and naturally gave rise to scandal it was at this time that rumours were first circulated regarding the relations of napoleon and hortense that there was no foundation for these reports may be stated most positively even bourrienne who cannot be accused of any great good will towards napoleon declares i am happy to be able to give the most formal and positive denial to the infamous supposition that bonaparte ever had for hortense any other feelings than those of a stepfather for a stepdaughter authors without belief have attested without proofs not only the criminal liaison which they have imagined but they have even gone so far as to say that bonaparte was the father of the eldest son of hortense it is a lie an infamous lie these reports first put in circulation by the royalists were repeated by members of the emperor's own family and soon reached his ears under the circumstances napoleon thought it advisable for hortense to have a permanent home of her own the last of july accordingly he purchased in the name of louis and hortense and presented to them a fine mansion near their temporary residence here on the tenth october eighteen hundred two was born their first child napoleon charles in response to a formal order from his brother louis returned to paris just in time to be present on the interesting occasion the birth of this child brought about a temporary reconciliation between hortense and her husband but louis soon became uneasy again and left paris for another absence which lasted until september eighteen hundred three then for a short time they lived together at compiegne where his brigade was stationed in the spring of eighteen hundred four louis bought a large hotel in rue Ceruti, now rue lafitte a most pretentious but very gloomy house without a ray of sunlight at the same time he acquired at st leu about twelve miles from paris a very beautiful country estate for these two properties he paid approximately a million francs hortense spent the summer at st leu which is very near malmaison on the tenth of october eighteen hundred four she returned to her paris house where on the following day was born her second son napoleon louis this was the child who was baptized with so much pomp by the pope himself at st cloud just a week before his return to rome during the campaign of austerlitz louis was governor of paris and displayed so much zeal and activity in his new post that he won the enthusiastic approval of the emperor who always showed for him a strong partiality after his great victory of the second december eighteen hundred five napoleon began to carry out his projects for family alliances and for the formation of a ring of buffer states surrounding the french empire pursuant to this policy he arranged the two marriages spoken of above and now he appointed louis king of holland under the orders of the emperor louis should have set out for holland at once but upon one pretext or another he deferred his departure for a week on the eighteenth of june the new king and queen of holland arrived at the hague 
where they passed the night in the old royal villa known as the house in the wood house ten Bosch, about a mile and a half from the city five days later they made their solemn entry into the capital escorted only by native troops on the first day of july louis wrote the emperor that as soon as his affairs were in good order he should leave the hague for a month or six weeks to visit the baths exactly a month after his arrival therefore he set out for wiesbaden accompanied by hortense not satisfied with this course of baths a month later he proceeded to aix-la-chapelle while prussia was arming and russia preparing for war the new king of holland continued conscientiously to take his cure at first hortense seemed quite contented at the hague her vanity was flattered and her imagination carried away by the glamour of royalty in departing for wiesbaden she took with her the little crown prince who was her favourite child but left the younger boy in holland she was on better terms with her husband than at any period since their marriage she was also looking forward to going to paris for the fate of the emperor when she expected to meet eugene only to think of it was happiness at daybreak on thursday the twenty fifth september eighteen hundred six accompanied by josephine the emperor left st cloud to put himself at the head of his army they dined at chalon and continued their route during the night at two o'clock the next afternoon they reached metz where the emperor passed six hours in inspecting the fortifications at ten o'clock they resumed their journey and arrived at mayence on the morning of the twenty eighth september it is not easy to explain why josephine wanted to accompany napoleon to mayence and to take up her residence there during the campaign the emperor certainly wished her to remain at the capital and fulfil her obligations there her thought seems to have been to keep as near as possible to napoleon in the hope that he would send for her as at strasbourg as soon as his affairs would permit napoleon remained only four days at mayence leaving on the evening of the first of october when the hour for departure came he embraced josephine who was in tears and did not seem able to tear himself away from her with one arm around his wife he drew talleyrand to him with the other and cried it is very hard to leave the two persons that you love the most then after once more embracing josephine very tenderly he departed hortense and stephanie both came to mayence to keep josephine company the two cousins were not sorry to be separated for a time from their uncongenial husbands as at strasbourg the previous year josephine held a miniature court and received the homage of the princes of the confederation of the rhine the sadness of napoleon was not of long duration once more in his element at the head of his troops he regained his habitual composure as usual his correspondence kept josephine fully informed of his movements to the empress at mayence bamberg seven october eighteen hundred six i leave to-night for kronach my whole army is on the march all goes well my health is perfect i have not yet received any letter from you but have heard from eugene and hortense stephanie must be with you her husband who wishes to take part in the campaign is with me adieu a thousand kisses and good health napoleon gera two a m thirteen october eighteen hundred six my affairs are going well and everything as i would wish with god's help in a few days i think that matters will take a very bad turn for the poor king of prussia whom i pity personally because he is good the queen is at effort with him if she desires to see a battle she will have that cruel pleasure i am in splendid health i have put on flesh since my departure nevertheless i personally cover twenty to twenty-five leagues a day on horseback in carriage in every way i retire at eight and get up at midnight i often think that you are not yet in bed ever thine napoleon Vienna, three a m fifteen october eighteen hundred six i have conducted some fine manoeuvres against the prussians i gained a great victory yesterday they had one hundred fifty thousand men i have taken twenty thousand prisoners one hundred cannon and some flags i was near to the king of prussia and just failed to capture him and the queen i have been at my bivouac for two hours i am very well adieu mon ami take care of yourself and love me if hortense is at mayence kiss her for me also napoleon and the little one napoleon weimar five p m sixteen october eighteen hundred six 
Monsieur Talleyrand will have shown you the bulletin. In it you will have perceived my success. Everything has turned out as I planned. Never was an army defeated worse, nor more completely destroyed. It only remains for me to say that I am well, and that the fatigue, the bivouac, the night watches have fattened me. Adieu, ma bonne amie. A thousand best wishes to Hortense and to the big Monsieur Napoleon. Tout à toi. Napoleon. Potsdam, 24th October, 1806. I am here since yesterday, and remain here today. I continue to be satisfied with my affairs. My health is good, the weather very fine. I find Sans Souci very agreeable. Adieu, mon ami. Napoleon. At Sans Souci, the Emperor found the chamber of the great Frederick in the same condition that he left it at the time of his death, and still cared for by one of his old servants. On Sunday he visited the garrison church, where in a vault under the severely plain Lutheran pulpit is the marble sarcophagus which contains the ashes of the king. He ordered sent to the Hôtel des Invalides at Paris the sword and hat and sash of the great warrior which lay upon his tomb. Departing now for the first time from his usual practice, on Monday the 27th October, Napoleon entered Berlin in triumph and took up his residence in the royal palace. Meanwhile at Mayence, Josephine was sad and uneasy because the emperor still failed to send for her. Napoleon writes, To the Empress at Mayence, Berlin, 1st November, 1806. Talleyrand has arrived, mon ami, and tells me that you do nothing but cry. What then do you wish? You have your daughter, your grandchildren, and good news. These certainly should be reasons enough to feel contented and happy. The weather here is superb. During the whole campaign not a single drop of rain has fallen. I am in excellent health and all goes well. Napoleon Napoleon, who rightly held Queen Louisa largely responsible for the war, and for the disasters which had overwhelmed her people, in his bulletins had referred to the unfortunate woman in terms which were hardly chivalrous. Josephine was struck by his lack of delicacy, and ventured to reproach him for his references to the Queen. This called forth the following reply. To the Empress at Mayence, Berlin, 6 November, 1806. I have received your letter in which you seem to be displeased because I have spoken disparagingly of women. It is true that I detest meddlesome women above everything. I am accustomed to women who are kind, sweet, and winning. Those are the ones I like. If they have spoiled me, it is not my fault but your own. Besides, you will see that I have been very good for one who proved herself sweet and reasonable. When I showed Madame Hatzfeld her husband's letter, she said to me with sobs and great simplicity, It is indeed his handwriting. When she was reading it, her accent went to my heart. She troubled me. I said to her, Very well, madame, throw the letter into the fire. I shall no longer have it in my power to punish your husband. She burned the letter and seemed very happy. Since then her husband is entirely tranquil. Two hours later he would have been lost. You see, then, that I like women who are good, sweet, and naive, for they are the only ones who resemble you. Adieu, mon ami. I am well. Napoleon. To explain this episode, it should be stated that Prince de Hatzfeld, the Prussian governor of Berlin, had been allowed to retain his position upon his promise under oath that he would attend solely to the safety and welfare of the capital. A letter from him had been seized in which he gave information of the positions of the French army around Berlin. This, by the laws of war, was military treason, and the penalty was death if found guilty by a military commission. This short campaign is without parallel even in Napoleon's marvellous career. The pursuit of the defeated army by Murat was the most remarkable on record. With his cavalry, in three weeks he literally galloped from the Zal to the Baltic, sweeping up the remnants of the Prussian army and capturing the fortresses as he passed. To the Empress at Mayence, Berlin, 9 November, 1806. Ma bonne amie, I have good news to tell thee. Magdebourg has surrendered, and the 7 November I captured at Lübeck 20,000 men who escaped a week ago. Thus the whole army is taken. Prussia has left only 20,000 men beyond the Vistula. Several of my army corps are in Poland. I still remain at Berlin. I am quite well. 
du tatois napoleon berlin sixteen november eighteen hundred six i have thy letter of the eleventh november i see with satisfaction that my sentiments give thee pleasure thou art wrong to think that they are flattering i have spoken of thee as i see thee i am sorry to learn that thou art bored at mayence if the journey were not so long it would be possible for thee to come here for there is no longer any enemy he is beyond the vistula one hundred twenty leagues from here i will wait to hear what you think of it i should also be very glad to see monsieur napoleon adieu ma bonne amie tout à toi my affairs will not yet permit me to return to paris napoleon in his final letter from berlin on the twenty second of november napoleon wrote josephine that he would make up his mind in a few days either to send for her or to have her return to paris four days later from Kustrin, he told her to be ready to start and that he would let her know in two days if she should come to the empress at mayence meseritz twenty seven november eighteen hundred six i am going to make a tour in poland this is the first city this evening i shall be at posen after which i will call you to berlin in order that you may arrive the same day as myself my health is good the weather rather bad it has rained for three days my affairs go well the russians are in flight napoleon posen twenty nine november eighteen hundred six i am at posen the capital of great poland cold weather has set in my health is good i am going to make a little trip in poland my troops are at the gates of warsaw napoleon posen two december eighteen hundred six today is the anniversary of austerlitz i attended a ball in the city it is raining i am well i love and long for thee my troops are at warsaw it is not yet cold all these polish women are like french women but there is only one woman for me dost thou know her i could easily paint her portrait but i should make it so flattering that you would hardly recognize it nevertheless to tell the truth my heart would only have kind things to say the nights are long all alone tout à toi napoleon the following day from the same place napoleon wrote two long letters one at noon and the other at six o'clock to the empress at mayence posen three december eighteen hundred six i am in receipt of your letter of the twenty sixth november in which i note two things you say that i do not read your letters you are entirely wrong i am vexed with you for having such a wrong idea you tell me that it may have come from some dream and you add that you are not jealous i have observed for a long time that persons who lose their temper always claim that they are not mad that those who are afraid often say that they have no fear you are therefore convicted of jealousy i am delighted nevertheless you are wrong nothing could be further from my thoughts in the wastes of poland one thinks little of the fair sex yesterday i gave a ball for the provincial nobility the women are quite pretty quite luxurious quite well dressed even in parisian style tout à toi napoleon posen third december eighteen hundred six i have your letter of the twenty seventh november from which i see that your little head is turned i thought of the verse désir de femme est un feu qui dévore you must calm yourself i have written you that i was in poland that as soon as winter quarters are settled you can come you must therefore wait several days the greater one is the less volition he has he is the slave of events and circumstances you can go to frankfurt in darmstadt in a few days i expect to send for you but it is necessary for events to be favourable the warmth of your letter shows me that you pretty women have no limitations what you wish must be but i am forced to admit that i am the greatest of slaves my master has no bowels of pity and this master is the course of events adieu mon ami keep well tout à toi napoleon the emperor remained at posen two weeks longer and during that period he wrote josephine again four times her jealousy was far from being calmed by his letters but to show her affection and her thought of him alone during the long nights she sent him a rug as a present to the empress at mayence 
posen nine december eighteen hundred six i have your letter of the first and am glad to see that you are happier also that the queen of holland wants to come with you i am late in giving the order but you must still wait several days everything goes well adieu mon ami i love thee and wish to see thee happy napoleon posen ten december eighteen hundred six an officer has brought me a rug from thee it is a little short and narrow but i thank thee none the less i am quite well the weather is very changeable my affairs are going quite well i love thee and much desire thee adieu mon ami i shall be as happy to send for thee as thou to come tout à toi a kiss for hortense stephanie and napoleon napoleon posen twelve december eighteen hundred six i have received no letters from you but i know that you are well my health is good the weather very mild the winter season has not yet begun but the roads are bad in a country where there are no paved highways hortense will then come with napoleon i am delighted i am only waiting for matters to be in shape for me to have you come i have made peace with saxony the elector becomes king and joins the confederation adieu my beloved josephine tout à toi napoleon posen fifteen december eighteen hundred six i am leaving for warsaw but shall be back in a fortnight i hope then to be able to send for you however if my stay is prolonged i should be glad to have you return to paris where your presence is much desired you know well that i am governed by circumstances my health is very good never better tout à toi napoleon the emperor left posen before daybreak on the sixteenth of december and arrived at warsaw at one o'clock on the morning of the third day having made two stops en route learning that the russian army was at poltusk about thirty miles to the north he at once headed his corps in that direction and started for the front the battle fought on the twenty sixth december proved indecisive the french under the command of lannes were inferior in numbers and could make little progress against the stubborn resistance of the russians the weather was frightful and the roads almost impassable the short day was made even shorter by the premature darkness due to the stormy cloudy weather the emperor with his guard lost the way and arrived on the field of battle long after the affair was over in three letters to josephine napoleon tells of his arrival at warsaw and the events which followed to the empress at mayence warsaw twentieth of december eighteen hundred six i have no news of you i am well i have been here two days my affairs go well the weather is very mild and even a little moist as yet we have had no frost the season is like october adieu ma bonne amie i am very anxious to see thee in five or six days i hope to send for thee to tatoua napoleon golimine twenty nine december eighteen hundred six i send you only a line i am in a miserable barn i have defeated the russians i have taken thirty cannon their baggage and six thousand prisoners the weather is horrible it rains and we are in mud up to our knees in two days i shall be back at warsaw and will write thee to tatoua napoleon poltusk thirty first december eighteen hundred six i had a good laugh over your last letters you have formed an idea of the fair ones of poland which they little deserve i received your last letter in a wretched barn where there was nothing but mud and wind with straw for a bed to-morrow i shall be at warsaw i think that all is over for this year the army is going into winter quarters tout à toi napoleon End of chapter twenty Chapters twenty one and twenty two of Napoleon and Josephine, The Rise of the Empire by Walter Gere. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Twenty one, eighteen hundred seven. Madame Valeska. On the first day of the new year, when the emperor was returning from Poltusk to Warsaw, he stopped to change horses at the gate of the little city of Bronya. 
at that time napoleon was the idol of the poles who hoped through him to secure their independence and an enthusiastic crowd had gathered to welcome the liberator duroc descended from the carriage and with difficulty pushed his way through the throng some one touched his arm and he turned to look into the large innocent blue eyes of a young girl who seemed almost a child her beautiful face fresh as a rose was flushed with excitement her figure was small but perfectly proportioned she was very simply dressed and wore a black hat with a heavy veil which almost concealed her blonde hair as duroc at a glance took in these details a sweet voice said to him in a perfect french monsieur can you not arrange for me to speak a moment to the emperor duroc conducted her to the door of the carriage and said to the emperor sire here is a lady who has braved all of the dangers of the crowd for you napoleon bowed and started to address her but she did not allow him to finish carried away by her enthusiasm she wished him a thousand welcomes to her native land and expressed her gratitude for what he had done to free it from the yoke of russia napoleon was so struck with her beauty that he ordered duroc to find out the name of the belle inconnue after many inquiries the marshal learned that her name was marie valeska of an old but ruined polish family two years before at the age of sixteen she had married the chief of one of the most illustrious houses of poland a man seventy years of age with a grandchild nine years older than herself count valeski who was as intensely patriotic as his young wife was then staying at his town house in warsaw the emperor requested prince poniatowski in whose palace he was residing to give a ball and invite the count and his wife to be present the prince called in person to extend this invitation marie was frightened at this special mark of attention and at first refused to accept but finally yielded to the entreaties of her husband at the ball the emperor paid her many compliments and the following day wrote her in terms of warm but respectful admiration he also sent her very handsome presents but she refused to answer his letters or accept his gifts her coldness only increased the ardor of the emperor who never yet had met such opposition to his desires yielding finally to the importunities of all around her the chief magistrates of poland her family even her husband marie accepted a rendezvous she was made to believe that the fate of her country was in her hands that heaven had chosen her to be the instrument of re-establishing the ancient glory of poland up to this time napoleon's affaire d'amour had been of short duration but this attachment was to end only with his departure for st helena with the exception of josephine marie valeska was the only great love of his life during the winter napoleon continued to write josephine as frequently as before but a change will be noted in the tone of his letters which must have been perceived at once by a woman as jealous and suspicious as josephine to the empress at mayence warsaw three january eighteen hundred seven i have received your letter mon ami your grief has moved me but we must submit to circumstances there are too many lands to traverse between mayence and warsaw before writing you to come you must wait until i am able to return to berlin although the defeated army is withdrawing there are many matters for me to settle here i am strongly of the opinion that you ought to return to paris where you are needed i am well but the weather is bad i dearly love thee napoleon warsaw seven january eighteen hundred seven mon ami i am touched by all that you say to me but the season is cold the roads are very bad and hardly safe i cannot consent therefore to expose you to so much fatigue and danger return to paris for the winter go to the tuileries give receptions and lead the same life that you usually do when i am there this is my wish perhaps i shall soon rejoin you there but you must certainly give up the idea of travelling three hundred leagues at this season across a hostile country upon the rear of the army believe that it costs me more than you to delay by several weeks the happiness of seeing you but such is the demand of circumstances and the advantage of affairs adieu ma bonne amie be happy and display character napoleon in eight letters which napoleon wrote during the following three weeks there is only a repetition of the same words the weather is too bad the distance is too great and the roads too dangerous for me to consent to your making the journey paris demands your return to give a little life to the capital i forbid you to cry or be sad and uneasy 
i wish you to be amiable gay and happy you are very unjust to doubt my love and devotion the winter was unusually mild for poland but the emperor whose troops were in winter quarters did not expect the campaign to reopen before spring in this he was doomed to disappointment at the end of january the russians began a forward movement and napoleon was forced to leave warsaw to put himself at the head of his army to the empress at paris wittemberg noon one february eighteen hundred seven your letter of the eleven january from mayence made me laugh i am to-day forty leagues from warsaw the weather is cold but fine adieu mon ami be happy show character napoleon Hello, three a m nine february eighteen hundred seven we had a great battle yesterday the victory remained with me but my losses are very heavy the losses of the enemy which are still greater do not console me nevertheless i am writing these few lines myself although i am very tired to tell you that i am well and that i love thee napoleon in another letter written at six o'clock on the night of the same day and in four other letters sent during the following week napoleon gives further details of the battle both in his correspondence and in his bulletins he tries to minimize his losses which had been enormous he states that he took forty cannon ten flags twelve thousand prisoners and only lost sixteen hundred killed three to four thousand wounded he says nothing of the vicissitudes of this terrible day of this victory which was so nearly a defeat of the terrible suffering of his army from cold and hunger of regiments and even entire army corps wiped out of the great personal danger which he had run in the cemetery when he was almost captured by the russian grenadiers and only saved by the valour of his guard he does not speak of the words wrung from his pale lips as the night fell on this field covered with dead and dying this sight is enough to inspire in princes the love of peace and the horror of war well would it have been for napoleon if he had taken these words to heart after the battle the emperor was too weak to follow up the retiring russians and was glad to put his troops again in winter quarters he selected osteroda for his headquarters and here for weeks he shared all the privations of his men during all this time his only residence was a miserable barn and it was not until he moved to the castle of finkenstein the first of april that his quarters became more comfortable napoleon's letters to josephine from osteroda were cold brief commonplace almost insignificant he spoke of his health the weather and ended always with the injunction to be gay a letter to his brother joseph under date of the first of march gives a better idea of the horrors of this terrible winter campaign to joseph at paris the officers of the general staff have not had their clothes off in two months some in four i myself have gone a fortnight without removing my boots we are surrounded with snow and mud without wine or eau de vie with no bread eating only meat and potatoes making long marches and counter marches fighting usually with the bayonet and obliged to drag the wounded in sleighs without cover over a space of fifty leagues napoleon in the eleven letters he sent to josephine from osteroda napoleon says in substance endeavour to pass your time agreeably do not worry i am in a wretched village where i shall still pass considerable time i have never been in better health i have ordered what you want for malmaison be gay and happy it is my wish i am looking for the spring which ought to come soon i love thee and wish to see thee gay and happy they say many foolish things about the battle of elo the bulletins tell all the losses are exaggerated rather than understated i learn that the gossip of your salon in mayence has been renewed make them stop talking you should not go to a small box in a little theatre that does not accord with your rank attend only the four large theatres and always use the large box to be agreeable to me you must live in all respects exactly as you do when i am in paris grandeurs have their inconveniences an empress cannot go to the same places as a private individual your letter grieves me you must not die you are in excellent health and you have no reasonable ground of chagrin you should go to st cloud for the month of may but remain in paris during april you must not think of travelling this summer 
i know how to do other things than make war but duty is the first consideration all my life i have sacrificed everything tranquillity self-interest happiness to my destiny these fine phrases were far from satisfying josephine who knew that her napoleon in spite of his pretended spartan simplicity sometimes gave himself distractions for nearly four months at mayence josephine had waited in vain for the permission of the emperor to rejoin him finally on the third of january he had expressed his wish that she should return to paris this desire he reiterates in four other letters and in more positive form it was his letter of the eighteenth which decided her if you continue to cry i shall believe you devoid of courage and character i do not like cowards an empress should have heart nothing remained but to start the brilliant winter of eighteen hundred five after the coronation had been followed by the two dead seasons of eighteen hundred six and eighteen hundred seven and a paris without a court without balls fete or receptions was very hard on the merchants who complained bitterly by order of the emperor the princes of the empire had opened their houses but this did not make up for the absence of the sovereigns leaving mayence on the twenty sixth of january the empress spent the following night at strasbourg where a small fete had been improvised in her honour the hall of the hotel of the prefecture was brilliantly decorated after a contredanse and a valse the empress made the round of the room addressing with her usual grace and affability a pleasant word to each one of the ladies present at an early hour on the following morning josephine resumed her route and arrived at the tuileries at eight o'clock on the night of the thirty first of january her return to the capital was announced the next day at noon by a salvo of artillery fired by the guns of the invalides a little fatigued by her journey the empress did not hold a reception until the fifth when all the high officials of state called to render their homage by monge president of the senate by fontaine president of the corps législatif by the president of the tribunal the vicar-general of notre dame and the prefet de la seine she was welcomed in speeches almost as flattering as those usually addressed to the emperor in spite of all this adulation more or less sincere josephine was far from happy she regretted the absence of her children and of her husband she was worried over the dangers which napoleon was running in this distant campaign and the reports of his liaison with the belle polonaise a few days after her return she wrote hortense my journey has been happy if i may so call it when it has separated me so far from the emperor i have received five letters from him since my departure i want you to write me especially as you are not now near to console me let me know how you are also your husband and children although i indeed receive more people here than at mayence my heart is nevertheless very lonely and in writing you will still keep me company adieu my dear daughter i love and embrace you tenderly during the following month the heart of josephine was rejoiced by the news of the birth at milan on the seventeenth of march of a daughter to augusta and eugene who was named josephine by order of the emperor this was the princess who twenty years later married the son of bernadotte oscar crown prince and later king of sweden josephine longed to go to italy to see her first granddaughter in her cradle but feared to leave paris without the permission of the emperor she wrote hortense that eugene was delighted at the birth of his daughter but complained that he could hardly see her as she slept all the time the first of april the emperor changed his residence to finkenstein where he occupied a fine chateau built by the governor of frederick the great at this time it was the property of comte de dona grand master of the household of the king of prussia it is still owned by the same family and at a recent date the room occupied by napoleon was carefully preserved in the same condition here napoleon was very comfortably installed with his staff and his military family an apartment adjoining his own was fitted up for madame valeska she left at warsaw her aged husband whom she was never to see again and spent three weeks with the emperor they took all their meals alone and were served by constant the valet de chambre of napoleon when the emperor was not with her marie passed her time in reading or in watching from the windows the parades in the court of the chateau which were often commanded by the emperor in person she had a very sweet even disposition was always gay and full of life and napoleon became more attached to her every day 
during the two months that he lived at finkenstein napoleon as usual wrote josephine two or three times a week to the empress at paris finkenstein second of april eighteen hundred seven i have just moved my headquarters to a fine chateau much like that of bessieres where there are many fireplaces this is very pleasant for me as i often rise during the night and enjoy seeing the fire my health is perfect the weather is fine but still cold the thermometer is at four to five degrees adieu mon ami tout à toi napoleon during the visit of marie the letters of napoleon were even shorter and more commonplace in them there were only a few lines about the weather the temperature the state of his health and his desire to know that she was gay and contented alas poor josephine her days of happiness were about over after the departure of his inamorata napoleon's correspondence once more becomes interesting to the empress at paris finkenstein second of may eighteen hundred seven mon ami i have your letter of the twenty third april and am glad to see that you are well also that you still love malmaison they say that the arch-chancellor cambacerès is in love is that a joke or is it true it amuses me but you have not said a word i am very well and the weather is fine at last springtime appears and the leaves begin to push adieu mon ami a thousand loving thoughts to tatoua napoleon finkenstein tenth of may eighteen hundred seven i have your letter i do not know what you mean by ladies in correspondence with me i love only my little josephine good boudeuse and capricious who knows how to quarrel gracefully as she does everything else for she is always amiable except when she is jealous then she becomes a regular little devil but let us return to these ladies if i must occupy myself with some one among them i assure you that i should wish them to be pretty rosebuds are those of whom you speak in this class i wish you never to dine except with persons who have dined with me that your list should be the same for your assemblies that you never admit at malmaison in your inner life ambassadors and strangers if you act otherwise you will displease me finally do not allow yourself to be surrounded by people whom i do not know and who would not come to your house if i were there adieu mon ami tout à toi napoleon twenty two eighteen hundred seven death of napoleon charles on the fifth of may a date to be ominous in the annals of napoleon the little crown prince of holland died at the age of four years and seven months only a few months before in her hotel in the rue de la victoire at paris a certain mademoiselle eleonard de Nuel had given birth to a male child who received the name of leon he was the fruit of a short liaison between the emperor and a reader of his sister caroline leon who bore a striking resemblance to his father but inherited none of his talents was destined to live through four governments of france and die in poverty at paris in april eighteen eighty one under the third republic these two events apparently without any connection were to change the destiny of napoleon and to have a decisive influence upon the fate of josephine the heir presumptive to the imperial throne was dead and for the first time the emperor was convinced that it was possible for him to have a direct heir of his own blood although the denouement was to be postponed for two years and a half from that time the divorce was absolutely certain napoleon charles the eldest son of louis and hortense was a child of unusual beauty and intelligence the emperor who loved children was particularly fond of this little nephew whom he fully intended to adopt as his heir he had played with the child as a baby and had seen him develop with great interest the little napoleon was sweet loving full of life and spirits adored by his mother and also by his gloomy father in her unhappy married life this boy was the joy and the consolation of hortense her hope and her pride during the night of the fourth fifth of may eighteen hundred seven the little prince was suddenly attacked by the croup a disease little understood at that time in the morning he was better and the physicians were hopeful of his recovery but the trouble returned again during the evening and at ten o'clock the child passed away no words can describe the despair of the unfortunate mother hortense seemed petrified with grief and they were afraid that she would lose her reason josephine also was overwhelmed with sorrow 
she did not dare to leave the empire to go to the hague but proceeded at once to the chateau of laken near brussels where she wrote hortense to hortense at the hague laken ten p m fourteen may eighteen hundred seven my dear child i have just arrived at the chateau of laken where i await you come and give me life your presence is necessary and you also must need to see me and to weep with your mother i would have liked to go further but my strength failed me and besides i have not had time to notify the emperor i have found the courage to come thus far and i hope that you too will be brave enough to come to your mother adieu my dear daughter i am overcome with fatigue but above all with grief josephine the following night hortense and louis arrived with their only remaining child napoleon louis who was then two years and a half old hortense was like a statue of despair she did not shed any tears and her cold calm her absolute silence were more alarming than the most violent manifestations of grief when she spoke which was rarely it was only to talk of him when ten o'clock struck she turned to one of her ladies and remarked it was at this hour that he died a special courier had been sent to announce the fatal news to the emperor he immediately wrote josephine to the empress at st cloud finkenstein fourteen may eighteen hundred seven i can conceive all the grief that the death of poor napoleon has caused you you can understand the pain that i feel i should like to be near you in order that you might be moderate and reasonable in your grief you have been fortunate enough never to lose a child but it is one of the conditions and penalties attached to our human misery let me hear that you have been reasonable and that you are well do you wish to increase my pain adieu mon ami napoleon finkenstein sixteen may eighteen hundred seven i have your letter of the sixth of may i see by it already the pain that you feel i fear that you are not responsible and that you are too much afflicted by the misfortune which has come to us adieu mon ami tout à toi napoleon to the empress at laken finkenstein twenty may eighteen hundred seven i am in receipt of your letter of the tenth of may i see that you have gone to laken i think that you can remain there a fortnight that will please the belgians and will serve as a distraction for you i have noticed with regret that you are not sensible grief has its limits which should not be passed take care of yourself for your friend and believe me most sincerely yours napoleon it will be interesting to read here the letter written the same day by the emperor to his stepdaughter to the queen of holland finkenstein twentieth of may eighteen hundred seven my daughter all the news that i receive from the hague tells me that you are not reasonable no matter how legitimate your grief may be it should have its limits do not let it affect your health look for distractions know that life is full of such trials and may be the source of so many misfortunes that death is not the greatest of all your affectionate father napoleon in two other letters to josephine at laken the emperor writes in much the same vein to the empress at laken finkenstein twenty fourth may eighteen hundred seven i have your letter from laken i see with regret that you are still full of grief and that hortense has not yet arrived she is not reasonable and does not deserve to be loved because she loved only her children endeavour to calm yourself and do not cause me grief for every evil without remedy we must find some consolation adieu mon ami tout à toi napoleon finkenstein twenty sixth of may eighteen hundred seven i am in receipt of your letter of the sixteenth i see with pleasure that hortense has arrived at laken i am annoyed at your report of the kind of stupor which she still shows she should have more courage and control herself i cannot conceive why they want her to go to the baths she would be much more diverted at paris and find more consolation control yourself be gay and take care of yourself my health is very good adieu mon ami i suffer much on account of your grief and regret that i am not with you napoleon 
during a brief visit which he made to danzig the first of june the emperor wrote josephine and also hortense at the same time to the empress at ma maison danzig second of june eighteen hundred seven mon ami i have just learned of your arrival at malmaison i have no letters from you i am angry with hortense she has not written me a word i am grieved with all you tell me of her how does it happen that you have not been able to divert her a little you cry i hope that you will get yourself under control in order that i may not find you entirely sad i have been at danzig for two days the weather is very fine and i am very well i think more of you than you think of the absent one adieu mon ami a thousand loving thoughts send this letter to hortense napoleon to the queen of holland second of june eighteen hundred seven my daughter you have not written me a word in your just and great grief you have forgotten everything as if you were never in the future to endure other losses they tell me that you no longer care for anything that you are wholly indifferent i perceive it from your silence it is not well hortense it is not what you promised us your son was all in all to you your mother and i are then of no account if i had been at malmaison i should have shared your grief but i should also have wished to have you turn to your best friends adieu my child be gay be resigned take care of yourself in order to fulfil all your duties my wife is very sad over your condition do not cause her more grief your affectionate father napoleon two days after the battle of friedland napoleon again wrote to hortense to the queen of holland friedland sixteenth of june eighteen hundred seven my daughter i have received your letter dated at orleans your griefs touch me but i would like to know that you had more courage to live is to suffer and the worthy man strives always to remain master of himself i do not like to see you unjust to the little napoleon louis and to all your friends your mother and i had hoped that we were of more account than we seemed to be in your heart i gained a great victory the fourteenth of june i am well and love you dearly adieu my daughter i embrace you with all my heart napoleon it must be admitted that napoleon does not appear to advantage in these letters to a mother stupefied with grief and to a grandmother almost equally overwhelmed he has nothing more consoling to say than the injunction to be gay and to seek diversions yet napoleon dearly loved the little prince and had fully expected to make him his heir the loss of the child must have been a severe blow both to his affections and his family pride the emperor had in his composition much of the stoicism of the american indian and under this appearance of nonchalance he may have concealed his own deep sorrow he really had a very profound sensibility and was not so callous as his remarks on many occasions would lead one to think to quote his own words man often appears more cold and selfish than he really is at one moment he exclaims friendship is but a name at another he says we only feel how much we love when we meet again or during absence and again love for one's children and one's wife are those sweet affections which subdue the soul by the heart and the feelings by tenderness in his letters to fouché and monge the emperor displayed more feeling to fouché on the eighteenth of may he wrote i have been much afflicted by the misfortune which has befallen me i had hoped for a more brilliant destiny for this poor child to monge i thank you for all that you say regarding the death of the poor little napoleon it was his destiny again to fouché the loss of the little napoleon has caused me much grief i wish that his father and mother had received from nature as much courage as myself to know how to endure the evils of life but they are younger and have reflected less upon the fragility of earthly ties such is his philosophy he is too much of a fatalist to feel any revolt against death he is always ready for every day at every moment he faces it and the unexpected does not disconcert him manifestations of grief are forbidden by his calling by his duty as a commander he had faced death on too many bloody fields to be appalled by the everlasting night 
when deep sleep falleth on men after a short stay at Lachen, hortense went with josephine to malmaison and a few days later proceeded to cauteret in the pyrenees to take the baths her mother wrote her from st cloud on the twenty seventh may i have often cried since your departure my dear hortense this separation has been very painful to me i have received news of your son he is at the chateau of Lachen in good health and awaiting the arrival of the king the emperor has written me again he participates deeply in our grief i needed this consolation for i have none since your departure adieu my dear daughter take care of yourself for a mother who tenderly loves you on the fourth of june josephine again wrote from st cloud your letter has comforted me very much my dear hortense the emperor has been strongly affected in all his letters he tries to give me courage but i know that he has been much moved by this unfortunate occurrence the king reached st leu last night he has let me know that he is coming to see me to-day he must leave the little one with me during his absence you know how much i love this child and the care that i will take of him it is my wish that the king follow you it will be a consolation for you both to see each other all the letters that i have received from him since you left are full of his attachment for you your heart is too sensitive not to be touched by it adieu my dear girl take care of your health i embrace you tenderly this letter displays all the goodness and kindness of josephine's nature she endeavours to soften the reproaches of napoleon and to bring hortense and her husband together a week later she wrote your son is in splendid health he greatly amuses me he is so sweet i think that he has all the ways of the dear child whom we mourn josephine knew how to console better than the emperor while hortense was in the depths of despair and her mother was trying to assuage her grief the emperor brought to an end this terrible campaign of poland by the brilliant victory of friedland he tells the story to josephine in his usual concise graphic style to the empress at st cloud friedland fifteenth of june eighteen hundred seven mon ami i write you only a word for i am very tired my children have worthily celebrated the anniversary of marengo the battle of friedland will also be celebrated and equally glorious for my people the whole russian army put to rout eighty cannon thirty thousand men killed or prisoners twenty-five generals killed wounded or taken the russian guard crushed it is a worthy sister of marengo austerlitz jena the bulletin will tell you the rest my loss is not considerable i manoeuvred the enemy with success be reassured and content adieu mon ami napoleon friedland four p m sixteenth of june eighteen hundred seven mon ami i sent you a courier yesterday with the news of the battle of friedland since then i have continued the pursuit of the enemy konigsberg a city of eighty thousand souls is in my power i have found there many cannon large magazines and more than sixty thousand guns brought from england adieu mon ami my health is perfect although i have a slight cold from the rain and the coolness of the bivouac be content and gay to tatoua napoleon from tilsit on the nineteenth of june the emperor sent josephine the welcome news that the victory had been decisive and that the campaign was over a few days later he wrote that he had met the czar alexander and was very much pleased with him he is a very handsome good and young emperor and has more intelligence than most people think he is coming to-morrow to take up his residence in tilsit at tilsit the czar and the king of prussia dined every day with the emperor as he tells josephine in his correspondence an hour after her arrival napoleon paid a visit to the queen of prussia who was one of the most beautiful and most attractive women of her day when she came to dine with him that evening the emperor received her with great respect at the door of his mansion but he was firm in his refusal to mitigate at her request any of the hard conditions of the peace which he imposed on prussia at dinner that night the queen offered a beautiful rose to napoleon saying with a gracious smile take it sire but in exchange for magdebourg this episode is alluded to by the emperor in the following letter to the empress at st cloud tilsit seventh of july eighteen hundred seven mon ami the queen of prussia dined with me yesterday 
i had to refuse to make some concessions to her husband which she endeavoured to obtain from me but i have been gallant while adhering to my policy she is very amiable later i will give you the details which it would take too long to tell now when you read this letter peace with prussia and russia will be concluded and jerome recognized as king of westphalia with three millions of population this news for you only adieu mon ami i love thee and wish to know that thou art gay and contented napoleon after a last interview with the czar at the end of which the two sovereigns embraced each other affectionately the emperor went for a short visit to Königsberg. leaving there at six o'clock on the night of the thirteenth of july he travelled directly to dresden where he arrived at five o'clock on the seventeenth he spent ninety-two hours in his carriage stopping to rest only twice en route and then only for very brief intervals from dresden he wrote josephine the last of his letters during this campaign to the empress at st cloud dresden noon eighteenth july eighteen hundred seven mon ami i arrived at dresden at five o'clock last evening feeling very well although i remained a hundred hours in my carriage without getting out i am staying here with the king of saxony with whom i am well pleased i have therefore covered half the distance to thee it may happen that one of these fine nights i shall fall upon thee at st cloud like a jealous husband i give thee fair warning adieu mon ami it will give me great pleasure to see thee tout à toi napoleon at six o'clock on the morning of the twenty seventh of july the emperor was back at st cloud after an absence of over ten months End of chapters twenty one and twenty two chapters twenty three and twenty four of napoleon and josephine the rise of the empire by walter gear this librivox recording is in the public domain twenty three eighteen hundred seven the court at fontainebleau the credit of talleyrand had never stood so high as at this time he had been of great use to the emperor in poland and had ably carried out the negotiations for the treaty of tilsit by way of recompense on the ninth of august the emperor made him vice-grand elector this great dignity of the empire gave talleyrand the right to replace joseph on all occasions of ceremony but at the same time he was forced to give up the portfolio of foreign affairs as being beneath the dignity of his new rank the emoluments of his new office added to his salary as grand chamberlain and the revenues of his principality of benevento gave him an income of half a million francs at the same time his personal fortune was estimated at fully six millions every treaty that he had concluded had brought him enormous gratifications on the fifteenth of august the fete of the emperor was celebrated with great magnificence in the morning a te deum was chanted at notre dame in the evening there was a banquet at the tuileries followed by a concert and a ballet the salons of the chateau were filled with all the dignitaries of the empire in full evening dress the emperor appeared on the balcony holding the hand of josephine and was cheered by an immense crowd in the illuminated gardens below a week later was celebrated the marriage of jerome with the young princess catherine of wurtemberg the pope had firmly refused to grant the emperor's petition for an annulment of the patterson marriage but the french ecclesiastical authorities proved more amenable and in october eighteen hundred six the marriage was declared null and void jerome who was the youngest and also the most worthless of the bonapartes had just received from his brother the crown of westphalia the princess who was nearly two years older than her husband was a woman of much charm she was tall and beautiful affable in her manners and of superior intelligence after a marriage by procuration at stuttgart catherine came to paris she arrived at the tuileries on the twenty first of august the contract was signed the next day in the galerie de diane and was followed on the twenty third of august by the religious ceremony which was performed in the chapel by the archbishop of ratisbon the prince primate of the confederation of the rhine thus was carried out the third part of the emperor's plan for alliances with the royal families of europe this marriage also proved quite a happy one catherine was devoted to jerome notwithstanding his many notorious infidelities and refused to abandon him after the fall of the empire at the end of this month 
the king and queen of holland returned from their visit to the baths and the pyrenees hortense had been joined by louis at cotray in june and they had once more resumed their life in common at the time of their arrival at st cloud they seemed to be on very good terms with each other but still sad over their loss hortense was very thin and already suffering from the beginning of her grossesse at the baths she had met the secretary of madame mere m de cazes who had just lost his wife and the fact that they were both in mourning had been a bond of sympathy between them reports of their intimacy had reached paris and caroline did not hesitate to retail the scandal to her brother on his return even going so far as to insinuate that the interesting condition of hortense was due to the handsome young secretary it did not take much to revive the suspicions of the jealous louis and discord once more reigned in the royal household louis naturally wished to take his wife and son with him on his return to holland but the empress alarmed at her daughter's appearance called a consultation of physicians who unanimously decided that it would be dangerous for hortense in her condition to return for the winter to the cold damp climate of the low countries the emperor therefore ordered that hortense and her son should remain in paris louis submitted with apparent reluctance to his brother's command and departed alone for the hague hortense who had previously endured without complaint the unjust suspicions of louis was this time mortally offended and conceived a profound hatred for her husband when she found that he had believed her capable of an intrigue galante at a moment when she was thinking only of death in the depths of her despair over the loss of her favourite child she resolved never to live with him again for the first time in his life the emperor now decided to take a real vacation of eight weeks and the court was ordered to assemble on the twenty first september at fontainebleau this historic chateau was always a favorite place of residence for napoleon and now that the tuileries and st cloud have disappeared it is the only royal palace with which his name is identified in the autumn of eighteen hundred seven napoleon was at the zenith of his glory he never yet had known defeat at austerlitz jena and friedland he had conquered the three greatest nations of the continent to the democratic days of the earlier period of the empire had succeeded an aristocratic regime the emperor posed as a new charlemagne the chief of a family of sovereigns to him the kings of bavaria Württemberg, holland saxony naples and westphalia owed their royal crowns the reigning princes of the confederation of the rhine were his vassals from the baltic to the pyrenees from the channel to the adriatic his will was law accordingly the command had gone forth that the court was to amuse itself at fontainebleau pleasure was the order of the day never before had europe witnessed such a gathering of kings and princes the emperor and empress arrived on the twenty first of september and within a few days there appeared the queen of holland the queen of naples the king and queen of westphalia the grand duke of berg murat and his wife madame mer the princess pauline prince charles of baden and his wife the prince primate the duke of Würzburg, and too many others to mention the emperor had also commanded the presence of talleyrand berthier champagny and marais all of the grand officers of the imperial household the ministers of the kingdom of italy and several of the marshals this visit of the court to fontainebleau is one of the most interesting episodes of life under the empire and well deserves a chapter to itself the emperor never again consecrated so long a period of time solely to pleasure and his court was never more brilliant here for the first and last time there was a renewal of the life of the ancien regime as it was in the days of the grand monarque here came to the surface the same interests passions intrigues weaknesses treacheries in a word it was a real court it would require the pen of a saint simon faithfully to depict the scene with all its changing lights and shadows to seize its full spirit and make it live again it furnishes the theme of one of the most interesting stories in the memoirs of madame de Rimusat. at this time napoleon oblivious of the past certain of the future was proceeding with a firm step anticipating no obstacle or at least certain that he could easily overcome any found in his path it seemed to him it seemed to every one that he could not fall except by an event so unlooked for so strange and so catastrophic that a mass of interests in favour of order and repose were solemnly engaged in his conservation 
in fact master or friend of all the kings of the continent ally of many by treaties or foreign marriages sure of europe by the new partitions he had made having upon the most remote frontiers important garrisons which ensured the execution of his will absolute depository of all the resources of france rich with an immense treasury in the flower of his age admired feared and above all scrupulously obeyed it seemed as though he had overcome all obstacles such is the picture which madame de remusat draws of the emperor at the age of thirty-eight in this autumn of eighteen hundred seven and she remarks let us suppose that some one ignorant of the past had suddenly been thrown into fontainebleau at this time it is certain that blinded by the magnificence displayed in this royal habitation struck by the air of authority of the master and the obsequious reverence of the great personages who surrounded him this stranger would have seen or thought that he saw a sovereign peaceably seated upon the greatest throne in the world with all the united rights of power and legitimacy as soon as the invited guests arrived at the chateau they were informed of the programme drawn up by the emperor for their entertainment the different evenings of the week were to be passed in the apartments of the various great personages one evening the emperor would receive and there would be music followed by games twice a week there was to be a theatrical performance on other nights balls to be given by the princesses pauline and caroline and finally an assembly and play in the rooms of the empress the princes and ministers in turn were to give dinners and invite all of the guests in rotation the grand marshal and the lady of honour were to do the same each having a table for twenty-five persons every day and finally there was to be another table for all who were not invited elsewhere even the kings and princes could not dine with the emperor except by special invitation on certain days there was a hunt which the guests followed on horseback or in very elegant caleches which were provided the emperor liked the chase more for the exercise it gave him than for the thing itself he often abandoned the pursuit of the stag and wandered through the forest lost in reverie he was a good but very reckless horseman and always rode small arabians specially trained for his service the emperor employed his vacation in working as usual he rose at seven o'clock breakfasted alone and the days that he did not hunt remained in his cabinet until five or six the ministers and secretaries came from paris with their dispatch boxes exactly the same as though they were at st cloud he never took account of time or distance either for himself or any one else while the emperor was occupied in his cabinet josephine always elegantly dressed breakfasted with her daughter and her ladies and later received in her salon the visits of the guests at the palace she never liked to be alone and had no taste for any kind of work at four o'clock the empress dismissed her callers and went to her room for the rites of the evening toilette always with her an important function quite frequently during the week the emperor came for his wife between five and six and they went for a drive together before dinner they dined at six and afterwards went to the entertainment arranged for that evening the great officials who had the privilege of the entree could present themselves at the apartment of the empress they knocked at the door were announced by the chamberlain on duty and admitted by command of the emperor if it were a woman she took her seat in silence if a man he remained standing at the side of the room the emperor promenaded back and forth his hands behind his back his head bent forward generally absorbed in his thoughts occasionally he asked a question and received a brief reply of real conversation there was none every one stood in such awe of the emperor that he feared to make any remarks at the assemblies it was the same everybody around the emperor was bored and he was equally bored himself one day he said to talleyrand it is a singular thing i have brought together a crowd of people at fontainebleau i have wanted them to be amused i have arranged all the entertainments yet their faces are all long and every one has the air of being tired and depressed the trouble is replied talleyrand that you cannot regulate pleasure by the beat of the drum here as in the army you have always the air of saying to each one of us allons messieurs et mesdames en avant marche the emperor wished two plays given each week which must always be different in addition to these performances by the comédie française there were representations of italian opera the plays were always tragedies often corneille sometimes racine 
but rarely voltaire whom napoleon did not like the whole court was bored to death by these interminable tragedies and yawned or dozed there was never any applause and the play was received in cold silence the emperor himself either slept or was buried in thought for the opera the best italian singers had been engaged at large salaries but they were listened to without a sign of interest the fete and spectacle were nominally in charge of m de talleyrand the grand chamberlain but the real work was done by the first chamberlain m de rimusat to whom talleyrand said one day i am sorry for you for you must amuse the unamusable the dreamy discontented disposition which the emperor displayed on all occasions cast a sombre veil over all the assemblies and balls at fontainebleau about eight o'clock the court in gala costume assembled in the apartment where the entertainment was to be given that evening while awaiting the arrival of their majesties there was no conversation the empress came first gracefully traversed the salon took her place and then like the others awaited in silence the entry of the emperor finally he came and took his seat beside her he watched the dancing with a bored look which was not conducive to pleasure and naturally no one enjoyed the evening he soon took his departure and almost immediately the assembly broke up while the court was at fontainebleau the emperor had an affaire with a beautiful young woman named gazani talleyrand had found her in italy and had persuaded the emperor to give her a place in his household as reader for the empress while her husband was made a receiver-general she was tall beautifully formed with magnificent dark eyes and a very attractive face in a court where there were many lovely women she was generally considered the most beautiful of all she had a very sweet submissive disposition and yielded to the desires of the emperor from a kind of conviction that it was her duty not to resist him at the same time she displayed the greatest devotion for the empress who closed her eyes to this little episode as a result this liaison was of brief duration and attracted very little attention another love affair which caused much talk but was also very brief was the sudden passion which the new king of westphalia conceived for the charming young duchesse of baden jerome had not even waited until his honeymoon was over before beginning a violent flirtation and catherine was very jealous stephanie who had not yet learned to appreciate her husband was gay and frivolous and naturally coquette jerome danced with her at all the balls while catherine who had inherited from her father a tendency to corpulence and did not dance was forced to look sadly on finally one evening when jerome had been more than usually attentive to stephanie catherine suddenly burst into tears and fell from her chair in a dead faint the ball was interrupted and she was carried into an adjoining salon the emperor addressed a few sharp words to his brother jerome rushed after his wife threw himself on his knees by her side and with a thousand caresses endeavoured to restore her to consciousness a few minutes later the young couple retired to their apartment the following day napoleon commanded josephine to have a plain talk with her lively cousin and bring her to reason stephanie took the reproof in good part and both of the young people were too much afraid of the emperor to renew what had been after all an innocent flirtation at this time the emperor no longer showed his partiality for stephanie he seemed to have forgotten entirely the rules prescribed for her as his adopted daughter before her marriage and only accorded her the rank and precedence of a princess of the confederation of the rhine which placed her below the queens and the imperial princesses from that time on stephanie was a model of decorum in her conduct she showed no regret on leaving for baden with her husband and this seems to have been the beginning of the perfect accord which afterwards united them in the meantime hortense was living in the greatest possible seclusion her health was very delicate and the memory of her lost child was always with her the emperor displayed for her much affection and esteem at the bottom of his heart he undoubtedly had more love for her than for his brother but the family spirit was too strong for him to take any active part in their quarrels he had consented to her remaining in paris until after her confinement but he continued to speak of her return to holland for her part hortense was equally firm in her determination never to return to this bleak country where she had experienced so much trouble and sorrow she said to the emperor my reputation is tarnished my health is lost i look for no more happiness in life 
banish me from your court if you wish shut me up in a convent i desire neither throne nor fortune give peace to my mother distinction to a jeanne who deserves it but let me live tranquil and alone twenty four eighteen hundred seven projects of divorce during the two months that the court was at fontainebleau the question of divorce was broached seriously for the first time talleyrand who was more familiar than any one else with the projects of the emperor was very quietly working to bring the matter about but he wished at the same time to have the emperor make a great alliance and above all to be himself the one to negotiate it caroline and murat were also laying their plans to overcome the lingering affection which still bound napoleon to josephine and which alone kept her on the throne allied with them were josephine's former friend fouché and the secretary of state marais who was secretly jealous of the great and well-deserved european reputation of talleyrand whom he hoped to supplant in the councils of the emperor as stated above the death of the little crown prince had made a change in the plans of the emperor his victories in increasing his power had extended his ideas of grandeur and both his vanity and his policy dictated an alliance with one of the european royal families at the time of his return from tilsit there was some talk of the daughter of the king of saxony in this connection but this princess was at least thirty years old and far from beautiful her father only reigned by the grace of napoleon and such an alliance would not have increased the prestige of the emperor the conferences at tilsit had justly increased the pride of napoleon the fascination he had exercised over the young czar the ready assent given to all his projects had produced in his mind the thought of a still more intimate alliance but on his return to josephine after a separation of ten months the old ties which so firmly bound him to her had been again renewed in speaking one day to the empress of the quarrels of louis and hortense and the delicate health of their only remaining child napoleon said that some day he might perhaps be constrained by the demands of public policy to take a wife who could give him an heir in broaching the subject he displayed much emotion if such a thing comes about josephine he said you must aid me to make such a sacrifice i shall count upon all your affection for me to take the responsibility for this forced separation you will assume the initiative will you not and realizing my position have the courage to decide yourself upon this rupture the empress understood too well the character of her husband to fall into this trap and precipitate by an imprudent word the catastrophe which she so much dreaded therefore so far from giving him the hope that by her action she would assume the odium of such a rupture she assured him that while she was always ready to obey his orders she never would take the initiative she made this reply in the calm and dignified manner which she knew how to assume with napoleon and which was always effective with him even in her private intercourse with the emperor josephine for some time past had abandoned the old familiar tutoiement and she now said sire you are the master and you will decide upon my fate when you command me to leave the tuileries i shall instantly obey but at least you must order it in a positive manner i am your wife i have been crowned by you in the presence of the pope such honours impose the obligation of not resigning them voluntarily if you divorce me all france will know that it is you who drives me away and will be ignorant neither of my obedience nor my profound grief this form of reply which was always the same did not offend the emperor and often moved him to tears in fact he was torn by many conflicting emotions on the one hand he sincerely felt that state policy demanded an heir to the throne on the other he knew that josephine was loved by the people and he hesitated to brave public opinion by repudiating her when josephine confided her doubts and fears to hortense she was far from finding a sympathetic listener her daughter's only reply was how can one regret a throne two or three weeks before the end of the visit of the court to fontainebleau fouché arrived one morning from paris after a long private interview with the emperor in his cabinet he was invited to dinner a most unusual honour towards midnight when all the guests in the chateau had gone to their rooms m de rimusat was summoned to the apartment of the empress he found her half undressed her hair down and her face discomposed 
she dismissed her attendants and crying that she was lost shoved into the hands of the chamberlain a long letter signed by fouché in this communication he began by protesting his former devotion for her and assured her that it was on account of this feeling that he ventured to face her situation and that of the emperor he pictured the emperor as at the zenith of his power sovereign master of france but responsible to that same france for the present and for the future which she had confided to him it is useless to try to dissimulate the fact madame he continued that the political future of france is compromised by the lack of an heir to the emperor as minister of police i am in a position to know public opinion and i know that there is much disquietude over the matter of the succession to such an empire figure to yourself madame the stability which the throne of his majesty would possess to-day if it were founded upon the existence of a son this advantage was ably developed at length as indeed it might well be then he spoke of the conflict between the conjugal tenderness of the emperor and his public policy he foresaw that the emperor would never make up his mind to dictate so grievous a sacrifice he therefore ventured to advise her majesty to make herself a courageous effort and to immolate herself for france he drew a most pathetic picture of the glory that such an action would give her now and in the future the letter ended with the assurance that the emperor was ignorant of this step that the writer feared it would displease him and the empress was solicited to keep the matter a profound secret it was obvious that fouché would never have ventured to write such a letter without the knowledge of the emperor what shall i do cried josephine how shall i meet this storm rimusat advised her to see the emperor either that night or the first thing in the morning ask him to read the letter and observe his face while he did so also to express her indignation at this uncalled-for advice and to reiterate her determination never to accept anything but a positive command from the emperor himself josephine adopted this advice and as the hour was late deferred her interview with the emperor until morning when she showed napoleon the letter he pretended to be very angry he assured her that he was entirely ignorant of this step that fouché had displayed a zeal most uncalled for that if the minister had not already left for paris he would have taken him sharply to task that he would punish fouché if she so desired and even dismiss him from his position in the ministry he was very affectionate with josephine but she was far from being reassured by his explanation and promises Talleyrand, when informed of this matter, expressed the opinion that the letter of Fouché was ridiculous and improper, and advised that the Empress should reply in a very dignified tone to the effect that she did not require his services as an intermediary between herself and the Emperor. She wrote such a letter, which was read and approved by Talleyrand, and then submitted to the Emperor, who did not venture to censure it. When Fouché returned a few days later, the emperor treated him very coldly, but he did not appear to notice her manner. Napoleon said to Josephine, He acted from an excess of zeal. You must not treasure it up against him. It is enough that we are determined to reject his advice, and that you know well that I cannot live without you. On the 5th of November the emperor wrote Fouché, For a fortnight past you have made foolish blunders, it is time that they came to an end and that you ceased to meddle directly or indirectly with a matter which does not in any way concern you such is my wish the outcome of the whole affair was a temporary renewal of the former close relations between napoleon and josephine he displayed for her all of his old affection and little by little her fears were dissipated during all this period the empress was guided by the advice of talleyrand when madame de rimusat expressed her surprise at his course he replied there is no one here in the palace who should not wish to have this woman remain by the side of the emperor she is kind and good she has the art of calming him she takes an interest in the affairs of everybody if we see a princess arrive here you will see the emperor break with the entire court and we shall all be crushed these were wise words and true and almost convince one that Talleyrand at the moment was sincere. It is not difficult to understand the motives which actuated Fouché and Talleyrand in this somewhat involved affair. Fouché had sufficient perspicacity to realize that with the emperor the question of policy would in the end outweigh all other considerations. 
he had therefore joined the party of caroline who detested all the beauharnais and for personal reasons also wished to see her brother enter the family of some european sovereign once committed to this undertaking fouché used without scruples his position as minister of police to work up public opinion he instructed his secret agents to discuss in the cafés and other public places the necessity of an heir to the emperor these suggestions were reported by other agents to the minister and by him to the emperor who easily became convinced that the people were more interested in the question than was probably the case with his usual shrewdness talleyrand took advantage of the sentiment thus worked up by his rival to turn it to his own personal benefit at the bottom of his heart talleyrand may not have been in favour of the divorce but if it must be he wished to bring it about in his own time and in his own way and above all to get the credit the murat coterie favoured strengthening the alliance already concluded with russia by a matrimonial connection but talleyrand better informed regarding foreign relations knew that the mother of the czar would never consent to give the hand of one of her daughters to the murderer of the duc d'anguin besides the affair of spain was about to come to the front and the time was not opportune to bring forward the question of divorce moved therefore both by sentiment and by policy talleyrand for the time being opposed and checkmated the efforts of fouché finally the fete at fontainebleau came to an end much to the delight of every one when the emperor called for a statement of the expenditures he was surprised to learn that the total did not exceed one hundred fifty thousand francs the last visit of louis the sixteenth had cost about two millions the imperial household under duroc the grand marshal of the palace was run with military discipline and economy the servants were always at their posts and scrupulous in the performance of their duties everything moved like clockwork no detail was overlooked by the marshal and he reported directly to the emperor who personally supervised and directed the work of the household while the court was still at fontainebleau josephine received the news of the death of her mother who passed away on the second of june eighteen hundred seven at the age of seventy at her residence in martinique josephine who dearly loved her mother had done everything possible to persuade her to come to live in france where she would have received a warm welcome but this venerable lady preferred her modest and quiet home to all the splendours of the imperial palaces on the sixteenth of november the emperor left fontainebleau for italy and josephine returned to paris she would have liked to make the trip with him to see her son eugene and the little granddaughter who bore her name but this time napoleon absolutely refused his consent he said that he would only be gone two or three weeks that the weather would be very cold and that she had better await his return at the tuileries on the twentieth of november the emperor crossed mont -Senis in a raging snowstorm and reached turin the same evening the following day he proceeded to milan where he was welcomed by eugene during the five days that he passed in the city there were religious ceremonies at the cathedral reviews and a gala performance at the scala on the twenty eighth of november he arrived at venice where he had with him his brother joseph king of naples his sister elisa princess de luc prince eugène viceroy of italy the king and queen of bavaria murat and berthier after spending ten days at venice the emperor went to mantua where on the thirteenth of december he had a long interview with his brother lucien it will be remembered that lucien in opposition to the wishes of the first consul had married his mistress madame joubertou napoleon desired him to get a divorce and marry marie louise daughter of king charles of spain and widow of the king of etruria but lucien spurned this brilliant alliance in the spring of eighteen hundred four he went into voluntary exile at rome where he was followed by his mother who refused to return to paris even for the coronation during the evening the emperor sent his secretary Meneval, to find lucien at the inn where he was staying and conduct him to the palace lucien greeted his brother very coldly and with much dignity after once more reproaching lucien for his marriage and indulging in some threats as to what he would do if his brother still refused to meet his wishes the emperor made this proposition he would recognize as members of the imperial family the daughters of lucien by both his marriages he would consider his second marriage as legal but would not recognize his wife as an imperial princess or consider as legitimate the son born before their marriage if lucien would divorce his wife 
the emperor would place him in the same position as his brothers in the imperial family and would give him a throne probably that of portugal he would continue to live quietly with madame joubertou if he wished but she could never participate in the honours of royalty lucien refused absolutely to divorce his wife and declined to be separated from his children that was his last word during this long interview which lasted more than six hours napoleon exhausted all of his resources both in the way of threats and promises in the effort to frighten or persuade his brother to comply with his wishes but all in vain at the end of the interview the brothers parted with much emotion and lucien returned to rome the next day the emperor left for milan where on the seventeenth of december he issued the famous decree declaring the british isles in a state of blockade both by land and by sea on the twentieth of december in the grand hall of the royal palace napoleon adopted eugene as his son and as his presumptive successor to the crown of italy at the same time he gave to eugene the title of prince of venice and to his daughter that of princess de bologna on the twenty fourth of december the emperor left milan for paris where he arrived on the night of the first day of january eighteen hundred eight during this long absence of nearly seven weeks napoleon only wrote josephine three short letters to the empress at paris milan twenty fifth november eighteen hundred seven i have been here mon ami for two days i am very glad that i did not bring you you would have suffered terribly in the passage of mont where a storm detained me twenty-four hours i found eugene very well i am well satisfied with him the princess is ill i have been to see her at monza she has had a fausse couche but is better adieu mon ami napoleon venice thirtieth of november eighteen hundred seven i am in receipt your letter of the twenty second november i have been at venice for two days the weather is very bad which however has not prevented me from traversing the lagoons to see the different forts i am glad to hear that you are enjoying yourself at paris the king of bavaria with his family also the princess elisa are here after the second december anniversary of the coronation which i shall pass here i shall be on my way home and very glad to see you adieu mon ami napoleon Udine, eleven december eighteen hundred seven i have received mon ami your letter of the third december from which i see that you were much pleased with the jardin des plantes i am now at the most distant point of my trip it is possible that i shall soon be at paris where i shall be very glad to see you again the weather here has not yet been very cold but it is very rainy i have taken advantage of the last moment of the season for i suppose that by christmas the winter will have set in adieu mon ami tout à toi napoleon end of chapters twenty three and twenty four chapters twenty five and twenty six of napoleon and josephine the rise of the empire by walter gear this librivox recording is in the public domain twenty five eighteen hundred eight the empress at bayonne when napoleon arrived at the tuileries at nine o'clock on the evening of the first day of january eighteen hundred eight josephine threw herself into his arms and tenderly wished him a happy new year since the visit to fontainebleau the empress had known little peace of mind she lived in the constant apprehension of a renewal of the projects for a divorce she no longer treated napoleon with the familiarity of other days but addressed him as a sovereign rather than as a husband the winter season at paris was never more brilliant every evening there were concerts balls formal dinners the court of the empress was as well attended as formerly in outward appearances nothing had changed josephine who did the honours of the tuileries with her usual grace was as much admired as ever the emperor still undecided vacillated between the voice of his heart and the demands of state policy he said to talleyrand if i separate from my wife i shall renounce at once all the charm she brings to my private life i must study the tastes and habits of a new and young wife this one adapts herself in every way and knows me perfectly finally i shall repay with ingratitude all that she has done for me for me she is a tie with many people 
one evening when there was a reception at the chateau the emperor failed to appear and it was announced that he was indisposed after dining with the emperor as usual at six o'clock josephine had gone to her room to change her dress for the evening when she was ready for the reception a chamberlain came to tell her that the emperor was ill and she rushed to his side she found napoleon in a state of great nervous excitement he wept and pressed her in his arms without any regard for her elegant toilette crying no my poor josephine i can never leave thee instead of joining her guests josephine was compelled to pass the night with her husband and it was not until morning that he recovered his equanimity what a devil of a man said talleyrand in disgust when the astonished assembly was curtly dismissed what a devil of a man to give way continually to his first impulse and never know what he wants to do on the first of february at the hotel of queen hortense rue ceruti was celebrated the marriage of prince d'arenberg and mademoiselle stephanie de taché josephine's cousin and goddaughter who had been celebrated an imperial princess by the emperor on the occasion of the signing of the contract during the consulate her hand had been asked in marriage by general rapp one of the favorite aides-de-camp of napoleon but josephine who retained many of the prejudices of the ancien regime refused her consent this arenberg marriage was not a success the princess could not endure her husband and refused to live with him at a later date the marriage was annulled and she espoused comte de guitry in the midst of his domestic preoccupations the emperor had not ceased to follow closely the course of events in spain the spanish bourbons were descended from a grandson of louis the fourteenth philip of anjou who became king of spain in seventeen hundred under the title of philip v at the beginning of eighteen hundred eight the royal family of spain comprised the king charles the fourth a man of sixty his wife marie louise who was three years younger and their son ferdinand prince of the asturias a boy of twenty to this interesting group must be added the queen's lover godois prince of the peace ferdinand had formed a plan of seizing the government but the plot was betrayed to the king and he was put under arrest portugal had refused to accept the berlin decree of napoleon prohibiting the importation of english goods and napoleon had arranged with the czar at tilsit for the occupation and dismemberment of that country while the above events were happening at madrid junot at the head of a french army of twenty five thousand men had advanced to the gates of lisbon before his arrival the royal family embarked on the fleet and sailed for brazil on the twentieth of february eighteen hundred eight the emperor appointed murat his lieutenant to command the french troops in spain and a week later he announced to the court of madrid his intention to annex to the french empire all of spain north of the ebro giving the spanish crown by way of compensation all of portugal alarmed at this proposition charles made preparations to flee the country but the news became known there was a popular uprising and he abdicated the throne in favor of his son in the meantime the french army under murat was advancing on madrid and on the twenty third march it entered the city charles now wrote to the emperor that his abdication had been forced upon him and asked to be reinstated upon his throne ferdinand also presented his claims at the same time and napoleon invited all of the interested parties to meet him at bayonne for a conference on the second day of april the emperor quietly left st cloud ostensibly for a visit to the south of france he was not accompanied by josephine but it was arranged that she was to follow him a few days later napoleon reached bordeaux on the fourth and josephine on the tenth on the thirteenth of april the emperor proceeded to bayonne two days after his arrival he inspected the chateau of marac located about a league from the city which he arranged to purchase for his residence it was only an ordinary country mansion and altogether too small to lodge comfortably the emperor and his suite during his sojourn at bayonne the emperor held frequent reviews of his troops passing through on their way to spain as many as a hundred thousand men defiling under his eyes he went out daily and loved the promenades upon the adour towards boucault he never announced in advance either the hour or the course of these excursions often changing the direction and returning to the chateau from the point where he was least expected often he directed his steps towards a dovecote in the form of a small tower which was located on the extremity of the outer wall of the park 
from there he descended to the banks of the neva and went nearly every day sometimes on foot and sometimes in a boat to visit his sister caroline who was living at loga on the twentieth of april the emperor received prince ferdinand who arrived that day and entertained him at dinner six days later the prince de la paix appeared and had a long conference with napoleon on the twenty seventh of april josephine came from bordeaux during this fortnight the emperor sent josephine four letters to the empress at bordeaux bayonne sixteen april eighteen hundred eight i arrived here very well but somewhat fatigued by the route which is dismal and very poor i am very glad that you remained for the houses here are very small and very bad i am going to-day to a little house in the country half a league from the city adieu mon ami good health napoleon seventeen april eighteen hundred eight i have your letter of the fifteenth of april what you tell me of the country landowner gives me pleasure go sometimes and pass the day there i have given orders to add twenty thousand francs a month to your allowance during the trip to date from the first of april i am horribly lodged in a half hour i am going to change and take up my residence in a small country house at a distance of half a league the infante don carlos and five or six spanish grandees are here the prince of the asturias is twenty leagues away king charles and the queen are arriving i do not know where i shall lodge all these people everything is still at the inn my troops in spain are well it took me a moment to understand your gentillesse i laughed over your souvenirs you women certainly have a memory my health is quite good and i love you very dearly it is my desire that you be very friendly with everybody at bordeaux my affairs did not permit me to do so personally napoleon twenty one april eighteen hundred eight i have your letter of the nineteenth of april yesterday i had the prince of the asturias and his suite to dinner that gave me much trouble i await charles the fourth and the queen my health is good i am now quite well established in the country adieu mon ami i always receive news of you with the greatest pleasure napoleon bayonne twenty third april eighteen hundred eight mon ami hortense has a son this has greatly rejoiced me i am not surprised that you do not speak of it for your letter is dated the twenty first and she was confined during the night of the twentieth you can set out on the twenty sixth pass the night at mont de marsan and arrive here the twenty seventh i am arranging for you here a small country house beside the one which i occupy my health is good i am looking for charles the fourth and his wife adieu mon ami napoleon the child referred to in the emperor's last letter was louis napoleon the future napoleon the third emperor of the french he was born in paris on the twentieth of april eighteen hundred eight at the town-house of queen hortense in rue cerruti and not at the tuileries as erroneously stated by many historians by the express orders of the emperor who sent hortense a letter of congratulations he was called charles louis napoleon in honour of his grandfather bonaparte his father and his uncle josephine's first letter to her daughter written on the twenty third april begins in a jubilant tone i am at the summit of joy my dear hortense i know napoleon is consoled at not having a sister and that he already loves his brother very much kiss them both for me two days later she wrote again i am just in receipt my dear hortense of a letter from the emperor he is perfectly delighted at the same time he summons me to rejoin him at bayonne you can imagine my dear daughter that it is a great pleasure for me not to be away from the emperor so i set out early to-morrow morning i am pleased at the news i receive of your health i beg you always to take good care of yourself and above all not to receive company these first few days i cannot write you again for two or three days but i shall think of you every moment i embrace you adieu my dear hortense josephine had the great satisfaction of finding napoleon in a most loving mood toward her he spent all of his spare time with her and displayed unusual signs of good humour one day on the beach undeterred by the presence of the escort he chased her over the sands and pushed her into the water another time he picked up a shoe which fell off her foot as she got into a carriage and flung it away in great glee over the idea that she would have to go home without one 
on the last day of april the spanish sovereigns arrived at the government palace at bayonne the emperor immediately called on them and that evening entertained them at dinner at marac on the fifth of may when the emperor after dejeuner was riding with savary he received the news of the uprising at madrid three days before he immediately galloped to bayonne where he had a spirited interview with charles and his son to ferdinand he said prince up to this moment i have taken no stand in the controversy which has brought you here but the bloodshed at madrid ends my irresolution i shall never recognize as king of spain the person who by ordering the murder of french soldiers has been the first to break the alliance which has so long united our two countries i have no ties except with your father i recognize him as king and will escort him to madrid if he so desires the prince made no reply but charles with the visions of charles i and louis the sixteenth ever troubling his thoughts had no desire to remount his precarious throne that same evening by a treaty signed for the emperor by duroc and for the king by the prince de la paix charles ceded to napoleon the crown of spain and of the indies in exchange for the use of the chateau and forest of compiegne the title in perpetuity to the chateau of chambord and a civil list of seven millions and a half to be paid by the french government by another convention signed on the tenth of may ferdinand also ceded his rights to the crown he was accorded the title in france of royal highness received for himself and his descendants the chateau of navarre and was given an allowance of a million francs such was the price of the magnificent heritage of charles quint on the fourth of june by an official act napoleon ceded to his brother joseph all of the rights acquired under the above treaties three days later the new king of spain arrived at bayonne and that evening attended a grand dinner given by the emperor at marac at which were also present the members of the grand junta of spain who had been summoned by napoleon two weeks before napoleon had reached the turning point of his career with easy confidence and a light heart he embarked on an enterprise which was to baffle him at every stage to drain his resources to cost him three hundred thousand valuable lives and to end in absolute failure at st helena he said it was the spanish ulcer which ruined me the first week in july the junta accepted the new constitution drawn up for joseph under napoleon's orders and a few days later the new king left for madrid napoleon started homeward again in company with josephine it was arranged that they should travel together as far as toulouse whence the emperor was to go to bordeaux and josephine to take the waters at Pareges. the emperor reached bordeaux on the thirty first of july and there he learned two days later of the capitulation of dupont at Bailen with an army of twenty thousand men and the flight of king joseph from madrid it was the first serious disaster to the imperial arms and napoleon was wild with rage at this blow to his prestige the emperor at once realized the necessity of his own presence in the peninsula but before going there he wished to organize a well-equipped army and also to assure himself of the solidarity of his alliance with the czar this meant a return to paris and josephine received orders to abandon her trip to barege and rejoin the emperor on his way home the emperor visited rochefort and la rochelle and then in company with josephine who had rejoined him he proceeded by way of tours and blois to st cloud where he arrived on the eve of his fete twenty six eighteen hundred eight to eighteen hundred nine a year of anxiety the last year that josephine was destined to wear the imperial crown was for her a period of constant anxiety she knew that the divorce was inevitable and that her days upon the throne were numbered before the fatal decree was passed however she had yet many trials to endure from the date that the emperor left for erfurt to that eventful evening in december eighteen hundred nine she saw but little of her husband who was absent from france the greater part of the time returning from bayonne on the fourteenth of august the emperor immediately began preparations on a large scale to put down the revolt in spain and restore his brother to the throne for the sake of his own prestige also it was necessary as soon as possible to repair the damage done by the capitulation of general dupont he had therefore decided to enter spain himself at the head of the grand army the invincible veterans of austerlitz jena and friedland 
Before leaving for the peninsula, however, he wished to feel certain that there would be no change in the political situation during his absence. Above all, he wanted the assurance that his new ally, the Tsar, was still as favorably disposed towards him as when they parted at Tilsit the previous year. He therefore suggested an interview, and Alexander accepted. The meeting took place at the little German city of Erfurt, and lasted from the 27th September to the 14th of October. All of the allies of the emperor were present, the kings of Bavaria, Württemberg, Saxony, and Westphalia, the prince primate and all the princes of the confederation of the Rhine. The actors of the Comédie Française, summoned from Paris, played before a parterre of kings. To her great regret, Josephine was not allowed to accompany the emperor, and she divined that her divorce would be one of the subjects of discussion. In this, she was not mistaken. The Tsar had two sisters of a marriageable age, the Grand Duchesses Catherine and Anne, and Napoleon had thought of the elder as a possible wife. At one of their conferences the Emperor broached the subject by saying to Alexander, This life of agitation wearies me. I need rest, and look forward to nothing so much as the moment when without anxiety I can seek the joys of domestic life, which appeals to all my tastes. But this happiness is not for me. What domesticity is there without children? And can I have any? My wife is ten years older than myself. I must ask your pardon. It is perhaps ridiculous of me to tell you all this, but I am yielding to the impulse of my heart which finds pleasure in opening itself out to you. It is perhaps unnecessary to state that Napoleon was not yielding to the impulse of his heart, but to the calculations of his ambition or the demands of his policy. He was broaching the subject, which he proposed to have followed up by Talleyrand, whom he had brought to Erfurt for that very purpose. He was about to commit these delicate negotiations to that wily diplomat who had already made up his mind to betray him. The evening of that same day the emperor had a long conversation with Talleyrand regarding the divorce. As reported by Talleyrand in his memoir, he said, My destiny requires it, and the tranquillity of France demands it. I have no successor. Joseph amounts to nothing, and he has only daughters. It is I who must found the dynasty, and I cannot do so without allying myself to a princess who belongs to one of the great ruling houses of Europe. The Emperor Alexander has sisters. One of them is of suitable age. Take the matter up with Romantzoff. Tell him that as soon as this Spanish affair is settled, I will enter into all the Tsar's plans for the partition of Turkey. You will not lack for other arguments, for I know that you are a partisan of the divorce. The Empress Josephine is also aware of the fact, I can inform you. Talleyrand said in reply that he thought it would be better for him to take the matter up directly with the Tsar instead of his minister, and Napoleon acquiesced. Talleyrand, who well knew the feelings of the mother of Alexander, instead of loyally furthering the plans of his master, suggested to the Tsar a dilatory policy, which would thwart the plans of Napoleon without arousing his resentment. The unprincipled minister embraced this opportunity to begin to weave the plot, which was finally to bring about the fall of the man he had always secretly detested. During his absence the emperor sent Josephine only three letters, all of them brief and insignificant. In the first, written two days after his arrival, he expressed his satisfaction with the Tsar. In the second, ten days later, he says, I have just hunted on the battlefield of Jena. We took breakfast on the spot where I passed the night at my bivouac. I attended a ball at Weimar. The Emperor Alexander dances. But I, no, forty years are forty years. In his last letter, which bears no date, he again speaks of his satisfaction with Alexander and says, If the Tsar were a woman, I should be in love with him. In spite of his great genius, Napoleon was the dupe of this young emperor who he thought was his friend. From this interview he gained nothing except a breathing spell during which he could proceed without danger of immediate interruption to regulate his affairs in Spain. Between his return from Erfurt and his departure for Spain, Napoleon spent only ten days with Josephine at St. Cloud. During this time their relations were somewhat strained. The emperor appeared embarrassed in the presence of his wife, as though he feared that through some indiscretion a report of his matrimonial projects might have reached her ears. 
and Josephine, who both desired and feared to know the truth, did not venture to ask any questions. As usual, she wished to accompany the emperor to the frontier, and it was almost by main force that he prevented her from entering the carriage which bore him away. Leaving St. Cloud on the twenty ninth of October, the emperor reached Bayonne on the third of November. A month later, he was at the gates of Madrid, and the city capitulated the following day. During the three weeks which he spent at the capital, Napoleon resided at a small country mansion, Chamartin, a few miles north of the city. He was constantly occupied with plans for the upbuilding of the country. He had reinstated his brother on the throne, and if there had been time for the new institutions to take root, Spain today would be a far more progressive country. In the meantime, an English army under Sir John Moore had advanced on Burgos to cut the French line of communications, and on the 22nd December, the Emperor left Madrid with his guard to meet this new offensive. Moore learned of his danger in time and beat a hasty retreat. When he was at Astorga on the first day of January, 1809, Napoleon received a dispatch from his old friend and aide-de-camp La Valette, telling him of the intrigues of Talleyrand and Fouché with Murat and Caroline and the armament of Austria. He turned over the pursuit of the English to Ney and Soult and started for Valladolid. On the 17th of January he set out for Paris, covering the distance of thirty leagues from Valladolid to Burgos in the remarkable time of six hours, upon his own horses arranged in six relays. The following day he left this country which he alone could have conquered, which he never was to see again, and which was destined to ruin his empire. At eight o'clock on the morning of the 23rd of January he was back in the Tuileries. During his absence of twelve weeks, Napoleon sent Josephine fourteen letters, some of them brief and insignificant. The first five, from Marac, Tolosa, Vittoria, Burgos, and Aranda, tell only of his progress and the state of his health. After this, his letters are longer and more interesting. To the Empress at Paris, Chamartin, 7 December, 1808. I am in receipt your letter of the 28th November. I am glad to hear that you are well. My health is good. The weather here is like the last half of May at Paris. It is warm and we have no fire unless the night is cool. Madrid is tranquil. All my affairs are going well. Adieu, mon ami. Tout à toi. Napoleon. Chamartin, 10 December, 1808. Mon ami, I have your letter. You tell me that the weather is bad at Paris. Here we are having the finest in the world. Tell me, I pray you, what Hortense means by her reforms. They say she is discharging her servants. Has anyone refused her what she needs? Send me a word on the subject. The reforms are not in good taste. Adieu, mon ami. All here goes very well, and I pray you take good care of yourself. Napoleon Chamartin, 21 December, 1808 you should have returned to the Tuileries the 12th December. I hope that you have been satisfied with your apartments. Adieu, mon ami. I am well. The weather is rainy and a little cold. Napoleon. Chamartin, 22nd December, 1808. I leave immediately to maneuver the English, who appear to have received their reinforcements and to desire to make their swagger, faire les crânes. The weather is fine, my health perfect. Have no anxiety. Napoleon. Benevente, 31 December, 1808. Mon ami, I have been in pursuit of the English for several days, but they flee in terror. In order not to retard their retreat for a half day, they have basely abandoned the wreck of the Romana army. More than one hundred baggage wagons have already been taken. The weather is very bad. Adieu, mon ami. Bessières with ten thousand cavalry is at Astorga. Happy New Year to everybody. Napoleon. Benevente, 5 January, 1809. Mon ami, I am writing only a line. The English are completely routed. I have ordered the Duc de Dalmasy, Soult, to pursue them vigorously, l'épée dans les reins. I am well. The weather is bad. Adieu, mon ami. Napoleon. Valladolid, 8 January, 1809. I have your letters of the 23 and 26 December. I am sorry to hear that you are suffering from your teeth. I have been here for two days. The weather is seasonable. 
the english are embarking i am well adieu mon ami i am writing to hortense eugene has a daughter to tetois napoleon valladolid nine january eighteen hundred nine moustache a courier has brought me your letter of the thirty one december i see my friend that you are sad and that you are very anxious austria will not go to war with me if she does i have one hundred fifty thousand men in germany as many on the rhine and four hundred thousand germans to meet her russia will not abandon me they are mad in paris all goes well i shall be in paris as soon as i think it necessary i warn you to beware of apparitions one of these fine days at two o'clock in the morning but adieu mon ami i am well and ever yours napoleon on the afternoon of the twenty third january the day of his return to paris all of the ministers and grand officers of the state called at the tuileries to pay their homage to the emperor in the presence of this distinguished assembly napoleon severely rebuked talleyrand and fouché for the disgraceful intrigue which they had carried on during his absence this reproof was not the cause of their hostility to the emperor as often stated but it was the signal for the secret war which they levied against him from that time on during the campaign of poland in eighteen hundred seven and again during the absence of the emperor in spain the following year the possibility of his death and its effect on the dynasty were seriously discussed at paris there were well-founded rumours of a project to place murat on the throne in case anything happened to napoleon fouché and talleyrand were in the plot and the warmest advocate if not the real instigator of the plan was napoleon's ambitious sister caroline in this connection there is a record in the journal of stanislas gerardin of a conversation which he had with josephine on the last day of february eighteen hundred nine after his return from spain the empress said to him while you were in spain there were some curious rapprochements irreconcilable enemies fouché and talleyrand have suddenly become reconciled men who never saw each other have been seen together frequently this clique is powerful and braves us fouché is its soul when murat was given the throne of naples all the journals under the control of the police sang his praises fouché said openly that murat was the only successor of the emperor the only one who could inspire europe with fear and the only one who enjoyed the confidence of the army he wrote a letter to the emperor in which he stated positively that france did not want any of his brothers as a successor fortunately the eyes of bonaparte are opened since his return the letter of which i speak is in existence it is in the hands of minerval the emperor's secretary in spite of the assertions of lanfray and other historians there is little doubt of the existence of this plot but the austrian menace probably had more weight in determining the emperor to return from spain austria thought that the moment was opportune to attempt to recover her lost possessions the archduke charles who was in command of the army had made a supreme effort to raise a force capable of meeting napoleon and he had done his work well late on the twelfth of april napoleon was informed by a semaphore message that the austrian army had crossed the inn and invaded the territory of his ally the king of bavaria at daybreak the next morning accompanied by josephine he started for strasbourg where he arrived in forty-eight hours he left the empress there and immediately crossed the rhine during the following week in one of the most brilliant operations of his career the emperor won two decisive victories and completely crushed the austrian offensive eighteen days later he was once more quartered in the palace of schoenbrunn at vienna on the twenty third of april before ratisbon napoleon was slightly wounded by a spent bullet which struck him in the right heel this is the only wound he is ever known to have received except a bayonet thrust in the thigh at the siege of toulon but at the time of the autopsy after his death at st helena several scars were found on his body this seems to prove that he was hit on other occasions but was successful in concealing the fact josephine remained for several weeks at strasbourg where she was visited by hortense and her sons by the queen of westphalia and the grand duchess of baden the story of the campaign is told in several brief letters from the emperor to the empress at strasbourg donover eighteen april eighteen hundred nine i reached here at four o'clock this morning and am leaving everything is in motion 
there is great activity in the military operations up to this moment there is no news ends noon six may eighteen hundred nine i have received your letter the ball which touched me did not wound me it hardly grazed the tendon of achilles my health is very good you have no need for anxiety st polton nine may eighteen hundred nine to-morrow i shall be before vienna just a month from the day that the austrians crossed the inn and broke the peace my health is good the weather superb and the soldiers very gay vienna twelve may eighteen hundred nine i am sending the brother of the duchesse de montebello to tell you that i am master of vienna and that all here is well my health is very good vienna twenty seven may eighteen hundred nine i am sending a page to inform you that eugene has joined me with his entire army that he has performed perfectly the task that i assigned him that he has almost entirely destroyed the force of the enemy which opposed him ebersdorf twenty nine may eighteen hundred nine i have been here since yesterday i am stopped by the river the bridge has been burned i shall cross at midnight everything goes as i would desire that is to say very well the austrians have been struck by a thunderbolt it would be impossible for any one reading the last two letters to imagine that they were written a week after the terrible two days battle of aspernesling in which napoleon received one of the worst reverses in his career in his next letter he alludes to a visit of hortense and her sons without his permission to the baths of baden and also to the death of his old companion in arms lann who was mortally wounded just at the end of the battle of essling to the empress at strasbourg ebersdorf thirty one may eighteen hundred nine i have your letter of the twenty sixth i have written you that you may go to plombieres i do not care to have you go to baden you must not leave france i have ordered the two princes to return to france i have been much afflicted by the loss of the duc de montebello who died this morning thus all comes to an end if you can help to console his poor wife do so vienna nine june eighteen hundred nine i am glad to learn that you are going to the waters of plombieres they will do you good i am well and the weather is very fine i note with pleasure that hortense and her son are in france schonbrunn sixteen june eighteen hundred nine i am sending a page to announce that the fourteenth anniversary of marengo eugene gained a battle against the archduke john at rab in hungary that he has taken three thousand men several cannon four flags and has pursued them very far on the road to buda early in june hortense left her mother to go to the baths in the pyrenees and josephine went to plombieres here she received the news of the great victory of wagram and of the armistice of znaim on the thirteenth of july the emperor was again back at vienna where he remained until the final peace was signed on the fourteenth of october it is rather remarkable to note that although he had madame valeska with him his brief letters are more tender than for several years in one he says good-bye mon ami you know my feelings for josephine they are unchangeable two letters written from vienna in august and one in september are even more notable at this time josephine had gone from plombieres to malmaison i have heard he writes on the twenty sixth of august that you are fat fresh and looking very well i assure you that vienna is not an amusing town i should much like to be back again in paris five days later he says i have received no letters from you for several days the pleasures of malmaison the beautiful hot-houses the fine gardens cause the absent to be forgotten that is the way with you all they say finally on the twenty fifth of september i have your letter do not be too sure i warn you to look after yourself well at night for one of these early ones you will hear a great noise from munich on the twenty first and twenty second october eighteen hundred nine the emperor sent josephine the last letters he wrote during the campaign of wagram the last also which she was to receive from him before the divorce to the empress at malmaison nymphenburg near munich twenty first october eighteen hundred nine i have been here since yesterday in good health i do not expect to start to-morrow 
i shall stop a day at stuttgart you will be notified twenty-four hours in advance of my arrival at fontainebleau it will be a treat for me to see you again and i await the moment with impatience i embrace you ever yours napoleon munich twenty two october eighteen hundred nine mon ami i start in an hour i shall arrive at fontainebleau the twenty-sixth or twenty-seventh you can go there with some ladies napoleon End of chapters 25 and 26